Uh, we should have put the music on. Um, it's been quite a journey and we will wrap up today with more of an extra galactic focus. And I can't see because I don't have my glasses on. Um, we'll go from stellar populations and star formation in the nearby universe um, back out to a more distant focus on black holes, AGNs, and quasars. And then even further out, let's see. Yeah. With the AGN in the second session, it's really closer by AGN. And then galaxy evolution and galaxy clusters with some cosmology sprinkled in. So just a few announcements. Reminder that for speakers, come up during the Q&A to get mic'd up. We will have an addition to the end of the morning session. We'll have additional poster flash talks then. And the posters will be up until the end of the day. Um, for those online, I think there's also a message in the Slack. We will have the virtual conference photo then. So um, please be around to unmute your video so we can take some screenshots there. Um, and two other announcements. There have been questions about getting to the airport, sharing rides. Please go on the Slack on the general channel if you are looking to share a ride on a taxi and in exchange information about how long it's going to take to get back to the airport from here. And then finally, our panel discussion. You don't want to miss that. That's at the end. And um, the folks who will be involved in the panel discussion will be representing all parts of the partnership. We will be getting together at lunch um, to prepare for the final discussion. And I think with that, I'm going to look around to see if there are any other announcements from the LOC. Anything? Anything? I know you're not, but. Okay, shall we get going? Okay. So, thank you, Janice. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second session on stellar populations and star formation. My name is Thiago Gonçalves. I'm a professor at the Valongo Observatory at the Federal University in Rio, Brazil. Um, I'll be chairing the session along with Clara Martinez Vasquez, who's uh, who's the virtual chair for the for the session here. And we'll start with Fabio Pfeiffer from Universidad Nacional de La Plata. He will, he will talk about, he has an invited talk on the globular clusters in early type galaxies. So Fabio, thank you very much. And you have 20 minutes for your talk. Okay, hello, um, I'm Fabio Feinberg. <laughs> and uh, these people listed here in the slide are the people who work in our, our group in the Instituto de Astrofisica de la Plata in Argentina. Okay, this talk is about massive early type galaxies. Um, the, that galaxy is located in the left hand of this uh, diagram. And here I list just some few of the most basic property of these uh, galaxies in contraposition with the low type galaxies, uh, which locate on this side. So this uh, figure show in a very schematic way the difference between the stellar population of this uh, kind of uh, galaxies. Early time galaxies form their stars um, very quickly and early in time. Okay, since the work of uh, Tumbra and Tumbra in 1972, we know that the interactions and the fusion between galaxies can transform the morphology of the of this uh, object. However, we know that the idealized uh, view of most of the uh, massive early type galaxies uh, forming, uh, uh, forming by the the binary merger of two of these galaxies is not always covered. This is a more uh, realistic view of the process of ensemble of this kind of galaxies where the, the stars in the movie are the minor marshes. 
So since the work of Osser, we think that the massive early type of galaxy form in a process of two phases. The first phase is uh, an in situ phase, uh, which consists of an early collapse of gas and a giant burst of uh, stellar uh, formation. Uh, after that, we have another phase, the accretion phase, uh, which consists of the later accretion of material that build up the uh, stellar and dark matter uh, halo. We think that the global cluster systems of this galaxy form in the same way. In the, in the fifth phase, the red global clusters, the metal rich global clusters are forming and some uh, blue or metal poor uh, global cluster too. And in the second phase, most of the blue global clusters are accreted uh, along with the uh, low mass satellites. Okay, we started the program to study uh, several examples of uh, early type galaxies in the nearby universe, which show uh, strong uh, evidence of uh, fusions of uh, interaction. I will tell you about, uh, about these uh, three objects. The first example is NGC 4382, which is a galaxy, uh, uh, an early type galaxies uh, in the outskirts of the Virgo clusters. It is at uh, the distance of around 18 uh, megaparsecs, and it shows several uh, structures that show that this object is, uh, is a Mercer remanent. Okay, regarding the global clusters of this galaxy, there are several previous studies. For example, Peng et al propose that this galaxy is a good example of a possible three, three model color distribution, uh, for, sorry, three model, yes, uh, color distribution. Um, Chia Santos proposed that this, this object have a, a blue, a young uh, clusters. And more recently, uh, Trancho uh, obtained near photometry for a small sample in the center of this galaxy, and they estimate an age is about 1.8 uh, giga years. And finally, Co uh, obtained a GMOS mask for a small sample in this uh, galaxy, and they found a, a group of global clusters with ages between 2 uh, to 2 4 giga years. And they estimate a total population of 1,200 global clusters, which means uh, a specific frequency of around 1.4, which is very low for a massive elliptical galaxy. You can see here the color distribution of this galaxy in black, and I will plot the color distribution for uh, over two early type galaxies uh, from Virgo, and you can see that the color distribution are really different. In this case, we don't see the, the typical bimodality, and it's clear here the presence of uh, an intermediate color global clusters. In order to check if this is a correct interpretation, we run the two dimensional, two -dimensional Gaussian mixture modeling uh, of NEDIN, and we obtain that this global cluster system is, uh, the, uh, is composed by four subpopulations the classic blue. Global cluster, the red, the, the classic red uh, global clusters, an intermediate color group of global clusters, and another um, uh, group, uh, the red object that we usually found in S0 galaxy. Uh, the name uh, the, of this cluster is find uh, fuzzy cluster. Okay, we uh, obtain one GMOS mask for this galaxy. And we add the, 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 the sample of course, so we have now 47 global clusters in this uh, galaxy. And we, we use um, the ULI scope to obtain age and metallicity for these global clusters. And we can see which could be the, the, the old red global clusters he, here and the old blue global cluster here, and a lot of young global cluster here. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to note that the, the uh, youngest uh, global cluster are the most uh, metal-rich one. 
this is another plot when I show you the alpha to iron values. We can see that the young globular cluster heat uh, show values uh, from supra-solar to solar. So that uh, means uh, that the, the global cluster were formed uh, from uh, progressively uh, enriched uh, material. Okay, we study a long, a long slit spectra of this galaxy, and you can see here the presence of the, the kinematically the coupled core of the galaxy, and here the, 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 the stellar population parameters or the, the center of the galaxy is a, is a region with, uh, which is metal rich, and the center of the galaxy is dominated for a young stellar population. We recently started to study the same spectra with other thermic, the PPXF. PPXF is uh, nice because it uh, allows us to obtain the star formation history of the galaxy. And uh, you can see here that the galaxy form a star uh, early in, uh, in time, like uh, most early type galaxy. But then uh, uh, this galaxy form a star during the last four years. Okay, if you want to see more details about this work, please see uh, the Victoria Reinaldi's poster. Okay, the other galaxy is NGC 1700, is a galaxy in a loose group which contains four galaxies. It is at the distance of around uh, 50 uh, megaparsec and it shows uh, several uh, things of uh, violent past. You can see that in the the outer isophote of this of this galaxy. Okay, this galaxy have a, 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 a kinematical decoupled core too. Uh, you can see the presence of this uh, here, and here is the result uh, by Kleinenberg, where they present the result about the stellar population in the central part of the galaxy. And they found that the, 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 the nucleus of this galaxy is young. Okay, regarding the globular clusters in this galaxy, Brown et al. studied this system. They found a, a bimodal color distribution here. And they say that the, the low sulfur brightness in this galaxy are symmetrical and then this is the this galaxy is a, a result of a binary merger. So if that is true, then they say that the blue global cluster should be very metal poor and older. But the red global cluster should be young or very metal rich. Okay, we obtain a deep field uh, with GMOS in this galaxy and a comparison field. We did the photometry, we we'll, uh, select the, 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 the global clusters. Uh, here I'll show you the, the, the result. This is the, the color magnitude for the uh, uh, science field and the comparison field. We, you can see that we detect clearly the presence of the global clusters in the galaxy. Here is the color color diagram. And we uh, analyze the luminosity function of the global cluster, the black line. We fit the Gaussian uh, function and we obtain the, the turnover magnitude. With that, we obtain the, 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 the distance of the galaxy, uh, 50 megaparsec, which is a nice agreement with the previously reported uh, value of Jensen. With this information, we can estimate the total population of the global clusters in this galaxy. The number is uh, 600, it's a very low number for a massive early type galaxy. Then the uh, specific frequency for this galaxy is really low, 0.3. What about the color distribution of the global clusters in this galaxy? Okay, we are seeing one of the uh, histogram here and it uh, looks very strange. However, the things uh, becomes clear when uh, we consider just the directed object. In black, we have plotted here the histogram of object uh, which luminosity uh, uh, with, for object directed than minus uh, 8.5. And you can see there, the, 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 the system is clearly uh, by model, the classic blue are here and the classic red are here. And when compared with the previous histogram, uh, we can see that it seems possible that exists here another peak. 
So these galaxies seem to have two blue peaks in the global cluster color distribution. In order to check that, we run the two-dimensional GMM, and we obtain that this galaxy, this global cluster system, is composed of four uh, populations. The blue global cluster, the red global clusters, the red global cluster, the same in, that in the previous galaxy, uh, fine fancy uh, cluster, and the blue object are here. So we put this, uh, the position of these uh, peaks in this plot. This plot uh, shows the position of the peaks of the uh, global cluster color di distribution for galaxies in view. It, the, it's a work of 10. So when we put the, the, the blue global cluster, the blue global clusters is in perfect agreement with the relation for the blue global cluster. But the, the red global cluster looks somewhat blue. And if we put here, the, the blue peak here is an outsider. One interpretation of this is that we are seeing the global cluster system of uh, lower mass galaxies. Another interpretation is just very simple, is that these objects are younger. Okay, we uh, subtracted the, the light of the galaxies in our GMOS image, and we studied the, 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 the low surface brightness structure. We detect these shells and some other structure, like stellar thin. And we know that this structure here, it looks like an object being destroyed. So we use the unsharpening mask uh, technique, and we know that this object is the same. And in the center of this possible object, there is an a uh, marginal resolved object with properties uh, according to the nucleus of the of one early type galaxy. So we think that we are seeing uh, here the process of destruction of a low mass galaxy in the halo of uh, 1700. Okay, what about the stellar population of this uh, galaxy? I mentioned uh, the Kreinsberg value previously, but Francois et al. has studied several massive area type galaxies using X shooter spectra, and they obtain for this galaxy these values young population and very metal rich. But we know that these values are in disagreement with the previous one. Another interesting thing is that this two study use a comparison between uh, in the uh, Lix index uh, with a single stellar population. We obtain the spectra, the key shooter spectra, and we, and we use the PPXF. So uh, we obtain this, this, this result where the galaxy is very old and metal rich, like uh, another early type galaxy. So our result is in contradiction with the previous values. Okay, the last galaxy is this. 5018 is another galaxy in a loose group <clears throat> of five galaxies at a distance of around uh, 30 megaparsecs. We have in the, the stellar population in this galaxy, several authors found that the presence of young stellar population in the center of the galaxy and nearly solar metallicity. And they report weak magnesium 2 index. So that, that is very strange for a massive early type galaxy. Regarding the globular clusters, the only previous study is the Hilke and, and Kisler Patik, who found a, sorry, a, a poor globular cluster system, and they estimate this number of the total population. And they suggest that the, they suggest that the globular clusters in these galaxies are very young. We obtain a GMOS field on this galaxy and a comparison one. The comparison field is here, the science field is here. And you can see that we detect the global cluster systems of this galaxy and it, it looks very, very poor. Uh, we have just 150 global cluster candidates in this, in, in this galaxy. And we know that the previous study of these global clusters was strongly affected by the contamination and probably that uh, the photometry was not uh, deep enough to study this galaxy. Okay, the color distribution of the, of the global clusters uh, show that we have the, the clear peak of the blue global cluster, but uh, we 
not detect the right global cluster. So these galaxies look very defi deficient in global cluster, but especially defi deficient in red global clusters. The number are low. Uh, we can not say that nothing more for the moment. We try to anal analyze the global cluster luminosity function. Uh, obviously, here there is no Gaussian, so we can obtain the, the turnover. But if we assume that this galaxy is located at 30 megaparsec, and if there are some a classic uh, global cluster there, we can estimate a number of possible uh, uh, classical uh, global clusters. The number is 300. That is a very, very low for a massive galaxy. So the, 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 the specific frequency is 0.5. Okay, the uh, uh, last question is, you know that most of the massive early time uh, galaxies have uh, hot halos detected in X5. So this galaxy has hot halos. We analyzed the Chandra data, and this is the plot for NGC uh, 7700. 70, and you can see that uh, the, in the spectrum, we obtain the, the component of the hot halo. Yes, and the parameter for the best fit. The other galaxy, 5018, is the same. <clears throat> we detect the, the, the hot halo here. So the three galaxies are detected in, in X5. Uh, the dimmer is the, the fifth one, 4382, but uh, all have uh, some uh, hot halo. And interestingly, uh, Smith et al. recently found that these two galaxies have this value very low, uh, very high, sorry, and uh, is typical for uh, red and dead galaxies. So these galaxies seem to uh, uh, red and dead in this aspect. Okay, this is a, a summary of our result. Is, is the most important are the two last one, and I discovered now that is, uh, there is problem with the gra grammatical cue, sorry. Uh, but the conclusion is, it is possible that uh, some of the progenitor of NGC uh, 1700 and NGC 4382 were formed in the two phases process. But it's not possible that the uh, 5018 were formed, uh, was formed, sorry, uh, through the two phases process. Thank you. Thank you, Fahud. Just, just in time, do we have any questions? Be honest, yes. Hello, Brian Miller from Germany. Very nice talk. Have you seen any differences in the kinematics between the different globular cluster populations? Uh, we have a spectra just for the first galaxy. And yes, there is a difference is for another talk. And I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that the result about these galaxies uh, was, were, uh, was published uh, recently. So yes. And, Hey, uh, great talk. Um, could you go back one slide, I think? Yeah, this will do. Um, so looking at these plots and similar plots that you've shown, uh, you have really good fits for, you know, two KV and less. Uh, what's going on after that? Um, you said, uh, uh, you talk about that. Yeah, because I mean, like, you yes, to... for me, not it's not important. I just want to take off that component. <laughs> but uh, Victoria, she's our specialist. <laughs> for global cluster, it's just important the first. <laughs> Right. That galaxy is very faint in harder X ray. Uh, if you decompose the emission in the softer band and in the harder band, you will see that the most of the emission comes from the soft band. So the broadband spectra shows that this is uh, a very noisy. Um, uh, I, I forgot the word. 
And the hard X-ray band has very poor signal to noise, very few photons de 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 detected, and you will see the error bars are huge. So the problem there is it just faint. Do you have any more questions from the audience? We have finished luck. Uh, hello, uh, I'm John Zerini from the University. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I just wonder, you assume that very blue and very red global cluster are very young. I understand that blue is very young, but do you think that for the red one, is there is no. an extinction or? No, uh, I talk about the red and the very blue. this one and this one because if the global cluster are younger they are bluer uh, you, you mean uh, and the same here uh, yeah but, uh, we we can't uh, say anything because we have the the, the uh, age and metallicity degeneration we need some spectra to to know what is happening here or very good uh, near infrared data so how about the very red one so you and the very red ones are uh, this one yes in several in several sorry uh, yeah i mean the, the do you have any opinion of what is very red one yes that cluster are usually found here yes and was studied in some uh, near uh, s0 galaxies and they are a uh, faint uh, cluster much more like to open a uh, cluster Okay. Not uh, exactly uh, global clusters. Okay, thank you. And we have one last question from one last question from Slack, I guess. Yeah. So Joel Rediger is asking: Have you looked at cosmological simulations to see how common are galaxies like the ones you have observed? Okay, this is the uh, next steps. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's thank Fabio again. Thank you. Gracias, Fabio. And now we're going to move on to Zoom. We have uh, some some virtual talks, starting with Ignacio Gargiulo, also from La Plata. He will discuss unveiling the origin of the bulge of M81 with spectroscopic observations and the TNG-50 simulation. Well, I'm in control now, right? Yes. Hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Ignacio Argiulo. Uh, I'm also based in the Institute of Astrophysics in La Plata, like Fabio. We are uh, collaborating with several members of the Argentinian Gemini office and also collaborating with the Galaxy Formation Group in the University of La Serena in Chile. And today I'm going to talk mainly about how the stellar halos of galaxies can help us uh, to understand the formation of inner regions of galaxies, combining observations uh, with what we predict from the high-resolution cosmological hydrodynamical simulations. And in particular, I show you an example of our approach and why we think that an archetypal classical and massive bulge like the one in M81 may not be the result of martial activity. This is ongoing work, so the conclusions will remain open, but I hope uh, you can get a good grasp on what we are trying to do. Uh, so, get started. I wanted to give a short background on what people call bulges. The nomenclature in the field can be very confusing sometimes, and maybe it has no sense to talk generally about bulges, because, uh, well, inner regions of galaxies can be of many different natures. And the main view is what uh, a bulge is, is, in very general sense, a structure that bulges out of the, of the disk in the central regions of, of a galaxy. And so uh, a subgroup of them uh, that morphologically show no features, uh, like M81, are in general more pressure supported or contain all stellar populations are called classical bulges. These are usually related to formation mechanisms like mergers or violent, violent gas instabilities or uh, at high redshift. And inner regions of galaxies are very diverse, so people start calling bulges to every light concentration in the central regions of the galaxies. And when studies of the structure of nearby galaxies started to reveal the, this complex nature, uh, they added the, the pseudo bulge classification, or this like bulge. Uh, they seem to be formed uh, out of the same disk or the bar. 
and uh, well, that, that's why they are so called pseudo badges. And this usually uh, present different types of, of features like nuclear disk, dust lanes, and everything. And these inner regions are usually connected to uh, secular formation mechanisms, right? And this pseudo badge classification also contains sometimes the, the boxy peanuts, like our old Milky Way, that are uh, a very different type of structure. Uh, resulting from vertical instabilization of bars. And obviously, uh, there are some of uh, galaxies that are considered bulgeless, like M101. So, uh, but irrespective of the morphology of, of a central mass concentration in a galaxy, all of them will produce uh, this bump in the central regions of, of the surface running profiles. And we can also define what is called usually a photometric bulge. And, now I will introduce you some very basic characteristics of the simulations, aerodynamical simulations that we use, and how we characterize the, these inner regions of galaxies or bulges. And for some years now, we have uh, used some of the state-of-the-art cosmological aerodynamical simulations to study bulge formation. Uh, this in the left, uh, in the, this diagram on the left, shows the simulations uh, of the literature with baryonic mass elements. Uh, in the y-axis, the baryonic mass element resolution, and the x uh, axis, the number of galaxies above a given threshold, uh, which is basically the size of the simulation in the, here in the, in the top axis. And in the top left part of, the, of this diagram, we can find what is called the, the resimulation regime with smaller samples of resimulated galaxies with large resolutions. While going to the right, uh, we can find the cosmological boxes with tens of megaparsec size for which uh, the resolution becomes much more expensive computationally, so they have less resolution. In 2019, we studied the bulges of 30 simulated Milky Way mass galaxies at the moment and of the, of the Aurica collaboration and found that their properties were more akin to pseudo bulges. And recently we used this TNG50 simulation, which is a, a cosmological box, but, uh, but, uh, and was run with the same code, that EPO, that Auriga simulations, and uh, only with a few changes in the physical mode. Model. So this allowed us to, to, to multiply the, the amount of, of galaxies in our sample by 10 and only resigning a factor of two in, in resolution. And I'll, I'll be showing mostly these results. So the sample, uh, we select this Milky Way M31-like uh, galaxies in the mass range indicated here in the, uh, in the, in the slide. The diskiness uh, is quantified by the minor to major axis radio of the stellar uh, moment of inertia tensor. And we got uh, 287 galaxies with the mass distribution shown in the, in the plot and in gray, where the, these arrows are the mass estimates for the Milky Way M M31 for, for different authors. And well, and this is a bunch of the, of the, of the whole sample, but uh, we can notice here the large diversity of, of galaxies with many detailed features due to the, to the resolution power of, of these simulations. So we have a great diversity with, with a high resolution. And one of the, way, the ways that we use to parameterize these bulges is by decomposing the surface brightness profile in the, in the visual band of, of, of all galaxies in our sample. When we talk about uh, uh, photometric bulges, uh, we assume that the radial surface brightness profile of a disk galaxy can be decomposed in different uh, structures, in a linear combination of different structures. And the bulge is usually represented by the CERSIC profile, and the disk is represented usually by an exponential, right? We assume only two components to do this, and we mask all the features in the surface reference profiles that, uh, like bars or, or strong spiral bars. Uh, well, this plot showcases all the, the diversity of super reference profile that we got, and around 17 of them have high CERSIC index, above two. And we also characterize the sample with the bulge to total ratio, the distribution we got is skewed toward lower values of batch to total, which is a pretty good result in, in aerodynamic simulations because overcooling usually produced uh, batches that were too large uh, in the past. So, but we also characterize batches in a second way, more oriented to simulations, because these simulations give us a, a wealth of information about the stellar particles. So we are also interested in the origin of, of kinematically defined bulges and, and, and how these relate with the, with the photometric bulges, right? And we define the kinematic bulge uh, with an usual definition among simulators, that is, we, first we separate stellar particles that are uh, have circular or near to circular orbits, which we consider part of the disk from the rest. 
uh, by means of this parameter, the circularity parameter. And for each particle, we divide the angular momentum uh, component perpendicular to the disk with the angular momentum of, of a particle with the same initial energy, but in circular orbit. So the, the maximum uh, angular momentum. And this is a typical distribution of, of circularities for a, a simulated disk galaxy. And we use a threshold of, of 0.7. And secondly, uh, we establish a, a spatial cut around the, the central region of, of, of the galaxy. So all the stellar particles inside uh, these two effective radii of the Cersei component with circularities below 0.7 uh, are, part of, are part of the kinematic bulge. But we always have to keep in mind that photometric bulges are very different from, from, from kinematic bulges. So when we plot the bulge to total radius from different definitions, we, they are not correlated as expected. The most important use of this definition is that it allows us to find uh, which of these bulge particles form uh, in situ and which form ex situ. Uh, and we can use this information to measure the impact of, of, of stellar rich mergers in the formation of bulges. So in this plot, we can see what in the galaxy formation uh, community we call the, the merger tree. Here in the left, you have the, 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 uh, the main branch progenitor. And, and in the in the right, you have all, all these all these points that are the satellite galaxies that at each redshift uh, merges merge with the with the main progenitor, and and we have all this information in the simulation, so we can we can find which particles form in these in these satellites, and we call them uh, ex situ particles. Um, so we found. In our work in 2019, that uh, with the Aurea simulations, uh, most galaxies uh, have a negligible or, or very low um, ex situ fractions in the in the kinematic bulge. And in the right panel, we see that in the Illustris TNG sample uh, this year, we confirmed this result. Uh, and the, the median value is, is very close to the one in the Auriga sample, but uh, well, mostly the, the in situ. Uh, formation of the the prevalence of the in situ formation of bulges is a, is a robust result between two slightly different simulations. Uh, but again, the importance of this of this quantity is to to measure the impact of a stellar rich merger in the in the formation of a, of a bulge, right? So we also is, uh, studied uh, the influence of of galactic bars on bulge formation. And well, we do this in a pre-conventional way. We compute the strength of bars uh, by means of Fourier mode analysis in a pre-conventional way. We define uh, radial annuli in the phase on projection of galaxies and, com and compute these complex uh, Fourier coefficients to quantify the azimuthal patterns in the mass distribution with, the, with these n-fold symmetries. And the, the second mode corresponds to a, to a bisymmetrical signal, such as a bar. So we use uh, the bar phase angle to determine when this bar ends and spiral structures uh, begins. So the bar strength finally is the mass weighted mean of, of the amplitude of the second Fourier mode within the bar region. And we looked into the cumulative fraction of, of galaxies with bars at different redshifts. We found that the uh, stronger than a given amplitude, right? So, um, we found that uh, at, at, at every redshift, the galaxies with low Cersic index have uh, a higher fraction of bars. But more uh, importantly for our discussion here is that in the lower panels, we see that across all redshifts, galaxies in beams with higher bars to total radius show a larger fraction of bars than galaxies with, with less luminous bars. So basically, bars are contributing to, to the build up of, of, of these inner regions. Uh, and we define a parameter that measures these measures the longevity of the bar <coughs> or the duration of the bar, because this is a, a cumulative process that we use to, to also to measure the, the importance of this, of this uh, mechanism of, of formation in the, in the formation of, of bulges. But the important question is if we can disentangle the bulge formation mechanisms only by observing bulges, because uh, a merger that, that forms stars in the, in the central region of the galaxy Basically, has uh, or, or may have the, the the same result as as as, as stars forming uh, due to a bar, depending the, the timing of of emergence and everything. 
So can we disentangle this? We think that we can. Uh, sorry. Uh, we think that it's possible using this uh, uh, diagram that we call the, the stellar halo Bulls mass diagram or Bulls mass stellar halo mass diagram. It was presented uh, uh, by Bell in Monachesi in 2017. And, and with this and the help of, our, of, of prediction from our simulations, we think that we can do this. Um, well, in black, these are uh, indicated the, the, the classical bulges in red, the, the pseudo bulges. And the stellar halo mass estimates are mostly from the, the GOST survey with the Hubble Space Telescope, where they do RGB star counts in the extended diffuse component at galactocentric distances from 10 to more than 40 kiloparsecs along the minor axis and, and, and further than 20 kiloparsecs along the major axis to avoid the disk. So the total stellar halo mass is then estimated as three times the aperture stellar halo mass. Uh, and this is based also in the profiles of exit to stars in simulations, this, this, this fact. And that is, and is commonly accepted and revealed by the study of stellar stream. For example, the stellar halos of galaxies like uh, our own or M81 are formed by the debris of satellite galaxies in falling to the host galaxy that are stripped from the satellites by tidal forces. So the main idea behind this, this diagram is that galaxies uh, that form their, their bulges due to merger activity uh, should show a correlation between the bulge mass and the stellar halo mass. So the gray band shows this one-to-one -one correlation for reference. And we see that there is a large dispersion. So bulge mass seems to be built up by other processes other than stellar rich mergers in many cases, at least. So uh, we studied the behavior of simulated galaxies in this uh, bulge mass stellar halo mass diagram with the Auriga sample in 2019. We found that the, there is a large dispersion in the, in the simulated galaxies using photometric bulge mass and kinematic bulge mass decompositions. And this year, we are working with the TNG50 sample. And you can see that there is also a large type dispersion, um, indicating that starfish mergers are not the only process uh, in the simulation that grew bulges. So color coded are the these ex situ fractions that I mentioned of stars in the kinematic bulge. And you can see that that close galaxies with bulges uh, with larger ex situ fractions lie close to this one to one line reference, while galaxies that hold bulges with lower ex situ fractions are more apart. So the first, the first mechanisms that we try to measure as a contributor of, of these galaxies uh, with low exit fractions uh, is the bulge formation through bars. And we use this parameter, the duration of the bar, the, the color coding here. And we, we, find, we show in the, in the left the kinematic bulge mass, in the left the photometric bulge mass. And we found a very, a very strong correlation when we use kinematic bulge mass with the duration of the bar, because basically, all the stars in, in bar orbits inside the, the, the bulge region are not circular. So we are getting a lot of, of bar stars and that, that obviously are more related to, to the formation by bars. But when we move to photometric bulge masses uh, in the simulation, this uh, correlation washes out. Uh, so we have to, to try more, uh, more processes. Now we are in, the, in, this, in this process. Uh, and we can see that in particular for simulated galaxies near the observational point of M81, uh, the bar evolution is not important in the, in the, in the bulge mass growth. So still other mechanisms are, uh, are needed. We are uh, now studying the radi radial migration due to, to spiral arms, considering that M81 has, is, a, is a grand spiral design galaxy and has uh, very strong arms, we may uh, these radial migration mechanisms may have something to do. We are also studying the compaction. And um, well, oh, it doesn't change the. Okay. Well, this is a this is another way to see Ignacio, how this. Yes. You, you should be finishing in a few moments. Okay. Okay. Uh, another way to to see that the the. The galaxy M81 has uh, still uh, infalling satellites that will form a massive bulge, but now the, the bulge is the, the stellar halo is is, uh, is very very low massive. Um, so what we are trying to do with with observations, basically, uh, clearly I'm more from the simulation side. So uh, questions about the observations, please do it uh, do them in the Slack channel, please. 
and some professionals from the Gemini uh, Observatory um, uh, office in Argentina will be answering. And well, we have this configuration for the for the observation for long slits in the central region of AMT1. And, and we want to, to take uh, these este, this, um, profiles of, 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 of kinematic quantities like uh, radial velocity, dispersion velocity, and everything, and, and try to compare them to, to our results in the, in the simulations, because obviously the simulations are very detailed and everything uh, have a lot of, of, of oversimplifications in the physical processes and, and resolution problems. So we wanted to combine this with the observation with uh, spectroscopic observations to, to find uh, uh, some connection between simulations and, and observations that can help us uh, understand how, how this patch uh, was formed. That according to our simulations, it was uh, probably not, not formed by, by mergers. Ignacio, can you go to the conclusions, please? So people can, can see yeah. it later, perhaps. Thank you. This is the summary and the future directions of, of our work. But thanks for the Okay, thank, thank you. you. Do you have questions on Slack? I have Not yet. We have time for one quick question if someone has. We have one there. Uh, hi, Ignacio. I'm Perry Menendez del Mestre from Rio de Janeiro. It was very mm -hmm. interesting work. I wanted to ask you, I'm trying to wrap my head around the fact that you say that uh, high, no, galaxies with strong bars do not have a high fraction of ex situ stars in their bulges. I'm trying to, mm -hmm. how, how do you think about this in, in terms of when we think about the creation of pseudo bulges, how bars will actually help transforming classical bulges into pseudo bulges? How do, I would expect that there would be more ex situ, ex -situ yeah, stars that are not born in the bulges uh, in, in strong bars. How do you, how how should we think about this? I think that uh, well, there is there, there are several works indicating that uh, there is like a twofold causality of that. In, in, for one side, uh, bars contribute to form uh, mass in the inner regions of galaxies by making the gas lose angular momentum. Uh, they can also near the core rotation they can drive stars to to inner regions, make them. Uh, loose angular momentum too. So um, this is one, one causality path. And the other one is that when you have a, already a, a, a strong uh, spherical concentration or, or a strong classical bulge, uh, the way you, you, you want to call it, from the beginnings, uh, you delay the, the formation of a bar. So, or, or, or even you can. Uh, uh, prevent the formation of a bar if you have a, a, a strong concentration of mass in the, from the early epoch. So uh, you have to, to, to see each, um, each case separately to, to know what happened, but that's why we found, I think, uh, a very, uh, well, not strong, but very markedly um, marked uh, modality in that sense. Okay. So Thanks. thank I you. Tell you. Uh, if you. We can continue the discussion on, on Slack if you want. Uh, we're out of time, so we have to move on. Thank you, Ignacio, very much. Thank you. And now we're gonna move on to Veno Calari from Gemini Nor Lab, who will talk about births, births and deaths of stars in the Magellanic Clouds with Sorro. Sorry, I can't push the slides. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, everyone. I'm Venu, and I'm an assistant scientist at Gemini SAR. Uh, I would be like to begin to thank the organizers for this opportunity and also to apologize in some small fashion because of the ambiguous nature of my title and abstract. Uh, in my defense, when we uh, submitted this abstract, it was because we had just received uh, zero data of R136, and we weren't sure we could process and reuse it in time for the talk, but we have. 
And I think the data looks spectacular, but I think the audience will be the real judge of how the data look. So our story begins on a summer night uh, around a year ago at Cerro Pachon. We used uh, Zorro, which is located inside the GCAL unit, the speckle imager that covers around a uh, two arc second field of view to image the large Magellanic cloud. Now the large Magellanic cloud is a dwarf galaxy around 50 kiloparsecs away uh, at around half a solar metallicity. Like many dwarf galaxies, it doesn't have a very active center of star formation, but there is a lot of star formation happening within it. And there is especially a lot of active star formation going on in the 30 Dryas region, which can be seen uh, at the top center of the, is this image. And that is where uh, our target lies. Now, 30 Doradus, and within it lies the star bus cluster R136, is the closest representative of more distant, high redshifted star bus clusters, or maybe in this, from since the last two weeks, we probably call this medium redshift distant galaxies, we see these similar star bus clusters. Now this whole region, this whole beautiful star forming region is powered by around 100 O stars uh, and a few dozen or so wolf red stars, which are ionizing the molecular clouds around them. So they can, pro uh, so this create these beautiful arcs that you see in the image, um, but they also uh, create an immense amount of feedback on the molecular cloud and into the general environment as we speak. Now, at the very heart of 30 Uralis lies the R136 Starburst cluster, which I was talking about. And so we zoomed in from a, a four meter telescope image into a Hubble image where you can see R136 to the right, very center. There's active star formation around it, but also in the very core as well. But that's not what we're really interested in. We're interested in R136 and the births and depths of stars within it. So R136, as I've pointed out, contains around 50 to 100 O stars, depending on the radius you use. And in the very central cluster, which, we, which is zoomed in here, there's around 50 O stars within a couple of arc seconds. So it's very incredibly dense and very incredibly luminous. So it has around something like 10 to the power of 51 um, photons per second, ionizing the, cl uh, the, the clouds around it. And because of this issue, because of the very high dense nature of this issue uh, of the cluster, because of this, you can't particularly resolve the central core. And this creates an issue because you can't resolve the very central stars that are creating this whole region because you can almost see with the naked eye. And I try to highlight this issue a bit more by showing you a two arc second field of view in this central cutout, which can be seen here, which hopefully is visible much better to the audience than to me. Um, and so to resolve the very central core, which contains around 50 O stars, you need a resolution of say, less than 40 milli arc seconds, which is probably the limit to which we can actually see. And the issue in particular is that if you can't resolve the central stars, you can't get their luminosity and if you can't get their luminosity, you can't uh, estimate their mass very accurately. And you need to know their mass because mass is the principal factor determining the evolution of the star. Uh, and also you need to know the mass to, to put into a whole host of other things. Uh, and also the feedback that is creating this whole region that we see. So the question is probably that if you can't resolve these stars with current instrumentation, do we have to wait for say a 30 meter telescope to come and resolve the issues. And um, as this talk might tell you, it's clearly not because you can with Zorro. It's stuck. So it's, you can't actually, oh, you can. So you can with Zorro. So this is the, this is two arc seconds zoomed in to the very first image I showed you. So these, these stars are responsible for creating that very beautiful, 
primarily responsible for creating the very beautiful star forming region you see. Um, so the resolution of this image is something better than between 30 to 40 million seconds. And these stars have a limiting magnitude of around 16. So they contain almost all the old stars because of the distance of the large magnitude. They contain almost all the, and the extinction, they contain almost all those stars known within this region. And you can see the scale bar here of, in the bottom right of 0 0.5 arc seconds. So if you had that resolution, the central core would completely be unresolved. And in marked in this image, you see the stars A1, A2, and A3. And these are very important stars to mankind because they are three of the some of the three of the most massive stars known to us. They are of the spectral type W and H. So they're basically Wolfred stars. But they are so massive and so young that they're still fusing hydrogen inside their core. Um, the N stands because for nitrogen, which you can see in the atmosphere, along with some helium. Uh, this is due to rotational mixing within the star, but also their mass loss. Um, and also the reason why they were called R136A is because when first speckle image, imaging was taken of this region, uh, the central core was visible as one object, which is shown as R136A. So you can see how much we've come in leaps and bounds. That's speckle imaging taken in the mid-1980s uh, at Lassia, and this is speckle imaging taken um, a year ago at Gemini. So we've come in leaps and bounds, and uh, we can really resolve the core. And you can really see this improvement in angular resolution in comparing with other telescopes. So there lies to the left uh, Hubble Space Telescope images in the UE and the optical, uh, but also infrared images using multi-conjugate adaptive optics in the top center, but also the sphere instrument at the VLT in K, both in K-band and also in the top left, there is a Muse AO image of the same region. And you can see that Zorro is probably comparable or better when you actually look at the resolution, at the measured resolution on the image of the central cutout of the cluster. And you can really resolve A1 from A2 and also A3 from its new companion, which we've just identified using the Zorro imaging, but also A1 from a close by star number nine. Um, so before I dive into why this is actually quite important and why I'm going on about it, uh, we'll go back a little bit to see how massive these stars are. And these stars are extremely massive. So conventionally, uh, based on statistical arguments and also uh, empirical measurements in the Archies cluster in the galactic center and also R136, people have suggested a 150 solar mass limit for the upper end of the initial stellar initial mass function. Now, uh, Crowther in 2010 using AO IFU spectra and also HST imaging found that these stars in the very center or claimed that these stars in the very center of R136 had masses of 300 for A1 and around 200 for A2 and A3. And they followed it up with um, Hubble SDIS spectroscopy in the UV, and they corroborated that result. And so the HRD of these stars looks something like this. So in the black are the results from bessel which and also in gray are the results from Crowther for A1, A2, and A3. So these stars are extremely massive, all about 150 solar masses. Uh, the stellar mass is written there is the stellar initial mass. Uh, and they are sort of go against conventional wisdom for how massive stars can go, at least in the nearby universe. But you might have thought of a flaw in the images because I told you that they used Hubble Space Telescope primarily in 2010, but also they used spare imaging in 2020 to measure the luminosities of the stars. But you can see that the imaging didn't particularly resolve the star nine from A1, but also A1 from A2 and A3 from its companion. So that meant that actually when we measured the luminosity of Zorro, the luminosity we measured was much lower, or a bit lower. Um, you can visualize that on the SED here. So there's, these are SEDs of A1, A2 and A3. And in red, we plot the Zorro magnitudes and in blue, we plot the HST and infrared magnitudes. And so this magnitude difference of a few tenths 
of magnitude actually creates quite a lot different, it feeds into a lot of difference in the actual luminosity of the star. And so it turns the HRD, which looks like this, into something like this. So here we have A1, A2, and A3, quite a bit lower than what was measured in the literature. And how lower? Well, A1 went from 300 to 250 solar masses from the literature to around slightly less than 200 solar masses. And A2 and A3 uh, sat around 150 solar masses. So we actually have just one star, which is about the canonical 150 solar mass limit. And so what does that actually mean? What are the big results? Firstly, the most massive star known, R136A1, is actually not that massive. And I say not that massive in italics because I mean it in a relative sense. It is still the most massive star known, and it is larger than the canonical stellar mass. Um, the other results, since I'm fast running out of time, we'll, we'll came through them. Uh, the first one is the initial mass function. So the IMF is a probability density function, and so you have a lower mass limit where which is determined by where the core stuff uh, can fuse hydrogen, uh, and also an upper mass limit, which was based on statistical arguments, but also empirical arguments in the nearby universe. The statistical arguments are based on the radiation pressure impairing a star growing any larger, which is around 1,000 solar masses, which is thought to be in the early universe. And in the nearby universe, it was canonically thought to be 150 solar masses. Um, so the result, that there was a 300 solar mass star in the nearby universe shifted the upper limit of the IMF considerably. And even though there's a small shift in mass, there's an extremely large shift in the amount of luminosity outputted because luminosity scales to the power three or higher at this mass end. Um, so there's a lot more luminosity and considerably a lot more mass that's being seen. Um, the most important thing, I think, is the fact that it sort of shows that maybe pair instability supernovae might exist. So pair instability supernovae are hypothesized to be the end product of 150 to 300 solar mass stars. And their importance can't be underestimated because a single 300 solar mass parent star exploding as a pair instability supernovae releases more metals into the ISM than the complete uh, IMF below it. So these stars are extremely important to understand the evolution of metals. And the hypothesis that these stars greater than 150 solar masses, even the local universe exist, meant that, okay, we will find parent W supernovae in the more distant universe. Uh, there were other results that do not match the explanation that they exist, but this is the, the fact that there were 300 solar mass stars suggested that they do, but lowering the, lowering the upper mass limit slowers the probability that they actually exist. And finally, feedback. Um, so as I discussed, a 300 solar mass star, and if you assume a certain IMF slope, say minus 1.95, which is considered okay for 30 radars, gives out more neutron stars gives out more neutron star mergers, more black holes than predicted using the canonical upper mass limit and the canonical IMF. So knowing this upper mass limit is extremely important to predict how many neutron star mergers you can see, how many black holes, all these exotic um, events um, that they, they need, they need a, a well-quantified IMF and also a well-quantified upper uh, stellar mass limit to predict. Um, finally, acknowledgements. Uh, I've not gone too in depth in the science here because I thought for the Gemini science meeting, it's much more uh, useful for the audience to see a lot more about the data. But if you want to talk about the science, please feel free to email me, message me in the Slack. Uh, at GSM, please talk to Ricardo if you're interested in using Zorro. Um, Elliot Horst contributed significantly to the data reduction and understanding of the data, and he's the chair of the SOC, so please feel free to talk to him about that. Uh, our paper is in press, it's on Astro Viet, so feel free to have a look at that. And finally, I will end with a review. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much.
there was some beautiful data that you showed. That was exciting. Do we have any questions? Sorry, any questions from the, yeah, we have one there. Hi, Venu. Thanks for uh, sharing this beautiful presentation. And I really appreciated those zooms from the big sky to the core of R136. Um, so in the work of Crowther, I think, the point there, well, the, the work is very uh, model dependent and assumption dependent. Um, the main conclusion was the masses are not 80 and they're not a thousand. So they came up with 300 saying, yeah, more or less. <laughs> then you come with those beautiful um, Zorro data. And um, so you seem to be playing in the same range of masses. So my question is, uh, from your appreciation of the, all the work you did, how much more accurately do you think you have those masses down? Also considering that we have no Keplerian motions because those are don't seem to be binaries, unfortunately. So all we have are luminosities and our very poor understanding of how this relates to the masses. Um, yeah, so I don't think we've quantified it in a better range than Crowther at all, that is true. But I think what we have done is resolve the stars in the core so I think our final result, the take home result is probably not the fact that these stars are say 100 solar months lower and that's, that's um, written in stone. But I think that we can resolve these individual stars. I'm sure JWST or a bigger telescope will come and resolve it even better, but um, the actual mass estimate, I mean, it, could, it couldn't be, we, we did some, um, back of the hand calculations based on the central density of the star, uh, central density of the cluster to see whether, what's the probability of being a binary. And it's not negligible, it's more than uh, 30 to 50% for yeah. both A1 and A3. So that also can't be ruled out, but obviously we can't do it with the current data. We can't check if it's actually a very wide orbit binary. Um, I mean, it's unlikely to be a wide orbit binary at these, these masses, but um, yeah. Um, yeah, to answer your question, not we haven't found a mass value that's written in stone. I think that's, yeah. Well, Stella, I'm, I would be happy to bet a bottle of your favorite thing uh, that it's already <laughs> merged and it's a single star. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Janice, do you have, do you have a question? Hi, Venu, this is Janice. Very, very nice result. And as a person who studies high mass star formation, I mean, this is a really impactful result that will be, uh, I'm sure, the topic of many conversations in our field. Uh, my question was actually related. And of course, understanding or constraining the actual masses is very model dependent. But as you said, um, really the result here is um, resolving multiple objects and then understanding, having a better constraint on the luminosity, just the observable parameters coming from Zaro. And so doubles in the details, even with that, there are systematics, zero point offsets to see what the difference is between your photometry is and the existing photometry. So I just wonder if you could comment on if, I mean, you had pretty large error bars on the model plot, but in just in terms of the observable parameters, um, if there are any issues there that, you know, could be the subject of debate. Um, yeah. I I think that's the kind of verbs because Zoro is not really built, well, a speckle imaging is not really built yeah. for doing this kind of um, um, analysis. So, so I think, I, I don't know if any paper, maybe Ricardo or Elliot can, convert, can, uh, can uh, correct me, but to measure the actual um, magnitudes, we did a very, uh, we measured at a, at the same air mass a couple of standards and based on that we got the magnitudes but that's why the error bars especially on the blue are higher mm. but um, this is this is as well a very unconventional technique to get mm. photometry so I would be looking forward to JWST imaging I guess to I mean it, it, it won't get magnitude in this uh, wavelengths, but it would be good to compare it to see the slope of the SED at least. Um, there are a lot of systematics. I think we've tried to answer them more in detail in our paper and to describe it more. But yeah, I think um, maybe this doesn't fully answer your question, but um, it's, 
yeah, we I can think continue there's talking about yeah. work done calibrating photometry from a speckle imager at this level to say more about the systematics. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, I thank think, you and congratulations again on a great I result. Think, I think we have to move on. We also have a question, I think it's by Joe Rodinger on, on Slack. So I encourage you to just to continue the discussion uh, online and and congratulations. That was that was some beautiful data that you showed there. So let's thank Venio again. And the next talk will be, I'm sorry, I lost myself here. Uh, we have our next talk by Kyunam Kim from University of Cincinnati on the phase space since Z of one, a kinematic view of environmental dependence of star formation from SPT clusters using the Gemini multi-object spectrograph. Okay. Hi, everyone. Oh, can you hear me? Uh oh. Yes. Yes, yeah. Oh, it's the slide, yeah, just moved away. So hi everyone, I'm Kuno Kim. I'm a postdoctoral uh, fellow at University of Cincinnati. I'm working with uh, Matt Bayliss, who might be present on site for the meeting. Today, I'm going to talk about how the galaxy star formation has changed in galaxy cluster environments since info at high redshifts and for which we update uh, the existing picture by using an advanced kinematic measure. And as I will show you later in this talk, um, this analysis uh, highly leveraged the, the efficient capacity of Gemini GMOS spectroscopic observations for a bunch of high redshift cluster galaxies. Oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, as a br brief background, it's been known that the level of star formation of galaxies is largely determined by two main parameters. One is galaxies' stellar mass, and the other one is galaxies environment, i.e. where the galaxies reside. And this figure demonstrates how the galaxy's stellar mass and the environment uh, is related to the fraction of red and dead quiescent galaxies, star formation quiescent galaxies. And in particular, at fixed, at given stellar mass, it's clearly shown that the fraction of quiescent galaxies increases with denser environment. So the, there, are, there is a higher fraction of quiescent galaxies in denser environment compared to the isolated field galaxies. This would suggest that the denser environment suppresses star formation of galaxies. And this, and this environmentally induced quenching effect is also seen with, even within galaxy clusters. As the, as the largest unit of gravitationally in, uh, bound systems in the universe, galaxy clusters are characterized by unique features such as uh, X-ray emitting hot intracluster medium. And by using the cluster centric uh, radius, the distance from the cluster center and to the galaxy, uh, it's, been, it's been shown that the fraction of star forming galaxies in and out in the, around the cluster environment uh, systematically decreases as we move from the outer, outer parts of the cluster towards the cluster center. 
we update this uh, environmental star formation or process, environmentally induced star formation or process by, by using not only the but cluster century uh, distance, but also the orbital motion of cluster galaxies. And also we update this uh, known environmental quenching effect by not just using the fraction of star forming and quiescent galaxies, but also, but you, but rather using a direct, uh, in, in direct uh, indicator of stellar age, as we will, um, as I'll show in the later slide, on another uh, spectroscopic parameter. And the idea uh, is shown here in this uh, cartoon, and the base. The idea is that we trace typically we uh, galaxies uh, uh, galaxies info in the uh, after from the initial info of galaxies galaxies can uh, can pass the pericenter and uh, backsplash and ultimately get get virialized in the cluster gravitational potentials. And by using the cluster rate centric radius and the peculiar uh, motion, we can trace the galaxy's motion in the in this diagram, which also known as the cluster phase phase uh, diagram. And if we observe these orbital trajectories of infalling galaxies through a telescope, we can um, obtain the two D version of projected uh, phase phase. Uh, where you, we are using the projected cluster centric radius and the line of sight peculiar velocity. So we can map the cluster galaxies in full time, like in full time in this uh, diagram, and then use how the level of star formation of cluster galaxies have changed since their infall into the cl host clusters. And this, and this phase space diagram is, has also been found effective in cluster simulations where individual info time step can be directly, uh, can be directly traced. And this P figure left figure shows the simulated cluster galaxies with different info redshift. And different color indicates different info redshift and clearly shown that the early, early accreted cluster galaxies tend to populate in this distinct region compared to those recently accreted uh, gal blue uh, dotted galaxies. Another simulation shows the consistent trend in that galaxies in the, the galaxy's location in the phase space can be uh, mapped with their time since info. Here, the red galaxies are red dotted, red dotted galaxies are the ancient early infallers, whereas the blue uh, dotted galaxies are the recently info of uh, uh, created uh, galaxy populations. And by further, uh, uh, using this trumpet sh trumpet shaped uh, uh, curves, we can largely uh, separate galaxies into different info time um, uh, uh, groups. And for and for for us to for us to use the phase space diagram, we've constructed a, a one of the largest uh, spectroscopically conformed galaxy cluster catalogs obtained from the SPT, South Pole Telescope, and ACT, Atacama te uh, Telescope cluster surveys over a wide range of redshift. The black dotted uh, data points are our cluster sample clusters we over a redshift range. And you, by using from the optical imaging follow-up, we 
obtain the ga individual galaxies I band luminosity for which we will use as a proxy for stellar mass. And from the spectroscopic follow-up, uh, we, we were able to measure the accurate cluster membership and the age sensitive 4,000 break spectral feature as shown with this vertical, red vertical lines. And this, and we were able to obtain many of cluster member galaxies spectroscopy of, from the Gemini GMOS of spectroscopic observations. And, and for that, this work is, was highly, uh, highly leveraged the Gemini GMOS spectroscopy. And this is the phase space diagram of our sample uh, clusters. White dots are the low redshift galaxy subsamples, whereas the gray clusters are the high redshift subsamples. And also using the same uh, trum trumpet shaped uh, region criteria, we classified um, galaxies into three different info groups. The galaxies that are accreted early being located in this uh, uh, pink uh, central re innermost region and the intermediate info galaxies being the orange and the outer, the recently accreted populations uh, in the blue colored region. And these regions are qualitatively uh, uh, tracing the likely info time as we've seen in the cartoon uh, figure in the slide. And this is our main result. We, from the phase space, we, use, we infer their likely, uh, their mean info time, and then relate this info time proxy parameter with the galaxy's age sensitive spectra 4,000 break. And what we found is a gradual increase of 4,000 break with this info time proxy. The, the different colored field diamonds are the mean 4,000 break strengths of different info region. And the black, the straight line is the linear fee for to the all individual data points. And what and we see that there is a gradual increase of 4,000 break of galaxies with this info time proxy. This would suggest that the galaxies that spend longer time in cluster environments tend to show a larger 4,000 break, which means the older stellar population age, which likely due to a longer exposure to environmental effects such as ram pressure, strip, gas stripping, and strangulation. And based on the stellar population of modeling, this increase from the, the 4,000 increase between the recent info groups and the early info groups correspond to about 0.7 gigahertz year older mean age. And this you know, in gradual for increase of 4,000 break with info time proxy is found at, even at, at low redshift subsamples as well as high redshift subsamples. And we checked this info time averaged environmental quenching trend, environmental quenching trend between for, for different uh, galaxy luminosity subsamples where, what, where we found that this environmental quenching trend is found regardless of galaxy's luminosity. As shown here, the orange are the bright, more massive galaxy subsamples, whereas the gray-blue is the faint, low-mass subsample galaxies. And we see that both luminosity beams show the gradual increase of 4,000 break with info time proxy. And this would mean that galaxies experience environmental quenching effects since info, regardless of their uh, luminosity and mass. And this figure further clearly shows that 
we see the environmental quenching effect uh, at any galaxy luminosity, where the x-axis is the galaxy luminosity and y-axis is the galaxy's uh, in-fault time proxy. And at fixed luminosity, it's clearly shown that the color, the mean 4,000 strength is increased uh, increasing with longer exposure, a longer time since infall, where we derive this environmental uh, effect by using a kinematically derived uh, parameter. And lastly, we checked that we we checked all we checked our environmental quenching trend is found at all redshift as well as all luminosity beams where the left panel shows the red two redshift bins for the same trend. The blue is the low redshift galaxies and the red is the high redshift galaxies. And we still see that their 4,000 4, break in, uh, strength increases with longer exposure, longer time since infall. And this middle panel is for the faint sub L star galaxies and consistent with the left panel, we see that galaxy's 4,000 uh, strength uh, is increasing with info time. And the right panel is, is the bright super L star subsamples. And these, these three panels all indicate then uh, the, that galaxies experience uh, environmentally uh, quenching effect since info at all redshift and at all luminosity beams. And this is the, our summary. And uh, one key takeaway is that galaxies, we found that galaxies experience a gradual decline of star formation after they fall into cluster environments, which would indicate that longer exposure to environment, uh, environmental effects such as RAM pressure, stripping, and gas strangula uh, and strangulation. And the results have been submitted to FJ and are also posted on uh, archive. So I'll stop here and happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Jenna. Mm, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Do we have one there? No. I. I actually have one question. Uh, this this was very interesting. I, I, I like the data, and I was wondering if you if there's any correlation between the variation in ages that you see from early infall to to recent infall. Mm -hmm. uh, does do those timescales in variation of age correlate somehow to the dynamical timescales of the clusters themselves? Yeah, that's a. Uh, uh, you mean the dynamical timescale of Clusters, you mean relaxation time scale, right? Or something like that, or crossing time scale, something like that. How how long the, the variation in ages of the of the galaxies correlate with how long they have been uh, orbiting the, the clusters or how long they have been interacting with the right. intercluster medium? Uh, I see. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good question. And we actually try to uh, kind of directly map the based on the cluster simulation results. But, and if we focus on the since the cluster simulation is only done in up down to red, uh, low redshift only, and if we map it, uh, this age increase is typically smaller than their actual time since infall. That. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that's interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up on that. I'll, I'll definitely check your, your paper. Do you have any more questions maybe on Slack? Is there anything? Thank you. Nothing. So if not, let's thank you now again. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And we're going to move on now to to flash talks. So this is not in the original. Uh, yeah. So uh, this uh, we would like to remind the virtual participants to stay for the virtual conference picture. After the poster flash talks, this is going to be, uh, we're going to have a series of six flash talks, if I can remember correctly, maybe. Uh, and after that, we're going to have the, the virtual 
the virtual picture for everyone who is online on Zoom. So please remain online that we can take your picture. So can we can we please get the the? I think there's one in one in person. Can can we? five minutes? Yeah. So can we get the the one presenter for the? Good morning. My name is Joshua Roberson. I'm a PhD student from the University of Cincinnati, and I have been working with highly lensed high redshift galaxies, and more specifically, the issue of is it actually possible to teleport a dim high redshift galaxy from a much closer but austere galaxy that is going to end up having a similar uh, brightness when viewed from our perspective. And so I've been working with five different galaxies taken with like multiple images across multiple filters, including some GMOS imaging. Like, and you can see here where in each case, we see the galaxies brightly in a few filters before they drop out. And for the high redshift case, we're suspecting that this is a case of them being like Lyman bright galaxies where all of the light past a certain wavelength is being absorbed. And if we can find where that wavelength actually is, that will give us a good indicator of what the redshift of those galaxies are. And so trying to we've been trying to piece that together from limited data points, and you can see up there the SED fits of the two high redshift galaxies and like where in each of the spectra that we were able to model, there was a sudden, like a very sharp drop off that we were able to use to isolate the redshift. And the end result is that we have, that we're able to actually pretty robustly like separate the low redshift example, like the dusty low redshift examples from the high redshift examples. And this would, yeah, and this would put us at the, some of the brightest high redshift galaxies discovered at this point. And there's more details about how I do that on the poster. So thank you very much. Hey, Joshua. And let's move on to the videos now, I think. Hi everyone, I am Winston Aero, an undergraduate student at the Universidad Católica del Norte in Chile. I present new high resolution near infrared spectroscopic information from the high resolution Higgins spectral for 11 members of BBB CL001, a very atypical stellar cluster buried in the inner galaxy harboring the most metal per population among the now Milky Way globular clusters. I will present preliminary results from our evidence analysis for BBB CL001, providing chemical and kinematical information from the age and K bands for the stars in the innermost region of BBB CL001. With this new observation, we confirm the extremely low metallicity nature of BBB CL001 and provide additional information for a wide gamut of chemical species accessible from the H and Kaban. We also provide enough information about the prevalence of the multipopulation phenomenon in BBB CL001. And I hope you have a good time at GSM. Bye bye. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Mina Botsi Yengeche and I studied the ISW effect in interacting dark matter dark energy models. Why do dark matter and dark energy contribute similar amounts to the universe's energy budget at this precise moment in cosmic history? This is an important question in cosmology. To address this problem in the interacting dark matter dark energy models, the densities of the dark matter and dark energy do not evolve independently. In this work, we calculate the ISW, auto and cross power spectrum for particular energy transfer term and compare it with the corresponding result obtained from the Lambda CDM model. For more details, please check our poster. 
instruments and stellar populations are your kind of thing, I invite you to come visit my virtual poster. The poster describes the status of a multi-year campaign with the GMOS instrument to obtain blue optical spectroscopy of dwarf galaxies in the Virgo cluster. The main question that we're trying to tackle in this campaign is whether the passive dwarfs we see in Virgo today are consistent with having been produced by simple ram pressure stripping of progenitor systems that were gas rich and had tepid star formation histories. The results that we've obtained so far indicate that such an explanation probably doesn't work for a significant minority of the population. Specifically, when we look at the ages and alpha abundances of our targets, we find that those that sit within the central regions of the cluster tend to have stars which are both old and alpha enhanced, which indicates to us that they likely formed their stars a long time ago and quite rapidly. If this work sounds of interest to you, please visit my poster. Afterwards, if you have questions or comments, by all means, send me an email at the address that's provided in the poster. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Bruno Bortoli. I'm working at the Universidad de La Plata in Argentina. I'm currently in the last year of my PhD. And in this meeting, I'm presenting a poster of a chemical analysis of the small myelinate cloud main body by means of spectroscopy of red giant stars belonging to stellar clusters. In this work, we use the instrument GMOS of Gemini. Uh, well, if you have any question or any comment, you can write me to the contact email. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, have a nice meeting. I'm Elisa, PhD student at Universidad Andrés Bello in Chile. In this work, I present you the first kinematic analysis of three globular clusters, BBB cell 160, Patrick 126, and Patrick 99. We observed member stars with the high resolution high green spectrograph. Reconstructing their orbits for the first time, we found that Patrick 126 is a real bulge globular cluster, which probably survived with prograde orbits. BBB cell 160 show very extreme kinematic. So is it a galactic or an accredited globular cluster? Particle 99 star sample can be split into different radial velocity groups, but we do not exclude its cluster nature because other nine uh, stars are being observed. We wish that many more clusters will be observed during the next programs, and I hope seeing you in person next year. Enjoy this meeting. Bye. And I think now we'll have the, the picture. Is that it? Can yeah. the virtual attendees please turn on their cameras so we can take a screenshot, please? And yes, and we Thank can have you. a coffee break as well and all the virtual. Uh, not yet. People is so turning cameras on. We're... Smile. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> oh, yeah, I am there too. Okay. Okay. Oh, we, okay, I think we have another one. Okay, can you take another picture? Yeah, I see. Okay, okay, another smile. <laughs> Hold it, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, over there. Cheese. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Thank you. 
Sorry, Janice, I didn't notice we were running out of time. I think I put the, the timer like later. Oh. Hi. No, this is your queen chair. <laughs> it's a little bit. So, oh, so, be careful. You, you need to survive. <laughs> At least one more month. <laughs> You need to stay here. Let me know how to do it. Yeah. Okay. Let, tell me. Yeah, it's a little bit warm, my chair. So. <laughs> Good. Of course. <laughs> Hello. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry. You are virtual chair. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, how does it work? I guess I could no, I was before. Hi, I'm uh, Clara. Um, oh, okay. So uh, what you need to do is like five minutes warning and like the last minute warning or like when they are finishing, you just start putting a start yeah, like this. The first speaker say may not uh, recognize. Yeah, you, yeah okay. <laughs> you only need to take care of the virtual speakers. He is uh, they're going to... to no. So here, yeah. So the first song is for sure. Yeah, the so second you, and third are. So they are, the yeah. Song. He's the one that is going to give the warning. So which one is the first and the first and, and first. first? Yeah. And second and third. So now, over here. So now what? Yes. 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 When did you start actually? The eleventh. Second, fifteenth, because it's like yeah, the time is. Sana, when did you start? Just on time, like ten fifty? Well, a little bit later. Ten fifty-five. So fifty-five. In ten minutes. Yeah. And yeah, just connect them, no? Okay. And you, what I am doing is I'm pinging in a Slack channel here. Yeah. So every, and I am doing like every time instead of doing everything together yeah, yeah, because yeah. I think it's better yeah. because people yeah. and then there is more star where ah the start so yeah and if you want to remove this. And you didn't know this, and that's going like this. Uh, what is going to happen? <laughs> you're still there, okay. you know. So you need to clear everything. And if you close this, you're, you can do things. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was doing this uh, like here and all this stuff. So the people is uh, okay. knowing we are there, but yeah. yeah. So... Yay, no problem. <laughs> Gracias. 
Hey, I've been virtual. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so it's time to start uh, the session. So welcome to um, Black Hole Asian Quasars 2 session. I'm Chong Hak Woo from Seoul National University. I'm going to be chairing this session uh, along with the uh, Hewon uh, as a virtual chair. So we have four talks in this session and two talks are invited, which are uh, the 20 minute talks. So uh, I encourage you to leave a question in uh, Slack. So uh, during the question session or even after you could interact with the speakers. So the first talk uh, will be given by Shin Liu. Uh, it's a virtual talk. And, uh, the title is a vodka. Biostometry for off nucleus and uh, dual subtropic AGN. Okay, so whenever you are ready, uh, ready, uh, you can start. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Great. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming uh, today. I'm very excited to tell you about our ongoing project uh, called Vodka. Uh, which stands for vastrometry for off nucleus and dual sub kiloparsec and kiloparsec Asian. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on the dual uh, population, but our technique is also uh, useful for uh, searching for off nuclear uh, targets. Um, I wanted to thank my collaborators um, and all, uh, in particular, those early career researchers being highlighted in yellow here. Um, so this uh, talk is gonna highlight uh, the work being enabled by uh, mainly by two Gemini instruments. So GMOS and GNERS. Um, and at the end, I'll also uh, briefly mention uh, the exciting prospect with uh, a low peak uh, the speckle imager. Um, and uh, so we uh, wanted to thank our um, the amazing scientists and our support astronomers at Gemini, 
will really help us, uh, uh, you know, make the observations possible. So I understand this is a really diverse audience. So I wanted to start my talk by uh, providing you with a bit of a background. So why do we want to study dual uh, binary AGN or uh, more generally supermassive black holes? Um, as a reminder, um, in our own backyard, our own Milky Way galaxy is in a direct collision course with our closest neighbor Andromeda. Uh, so we we are, you know, uh, personally relevant with this this kind of cosmic uh, interplay. And in fact, galaxy mergers have long been thought to uh, drive strong gas inflows, um, producing either one or maybe two active supermassive black holes, um, inducing um, perhaps also uh, feedback uh, to influence the host galaxy evolution. So the dual or binary population really uh, provides a direct tracer of the hierarchical uh, galaxy and supermassive black hole formation. In addition, if we focus on uh, small scales, meaning uh, kiloparsecs or subkiloparsec scale, uh, it actually provides us with an, uh, another indirect tool for understanding the particle nature of dark matter. And this is because um, the particle nature of dark matter directly influences the dynamical friction, uh, which will drive the uh, further evolution of a pair of supermassive black hole. So in some uh, models, alternative models to the cold dark matter, uh, instead of promoting dynamical friction, uh, they could actually prevent further uh, dynamical friction. So producing a lot of uh, stalled uh, supermassive black hole pairs on subkilo parsec scales. So in order to test this, we re really need to go down to this kiloparsec, subkiloparsec ish population and really understand their statistics. And last but not least, um, I don't perhaps need to tell you that they are of, also of interest to the uh, very exciting emerging new field of gravitational wave astronomy. Uh, but you may wonder, we already have LIGO sources, why uh, do we want to understand or study the supermassive cousins? And this is because um, unlike most, if not all, LIGO stellar mass black hole binaries, um, the most of the supermassive black hole binaries are expected to occur in gas-rich environment. And this offers a great opportunity for multi-messenger astronomy and not just post uh, the fact observation, but because of the longer uh, evolution time scale, uh, you can actually get a, a really early forewarning of the event happening, which means that you can get your favorite particle detector uh, EM observatories ready long before the, the final coalescence actually happens. So um, it provides a really exciting opportunity um, for a really comprehensive uh, multi-messenger uh, astrophysics. So um, thanks to um, most recently, uh, mostly due to the, the event of big surveys, there have, has been great progress being made in the observational searches of uh, dual and binary uh, AGNs, uh, which are taken as tracers of dual and binary supermassive black holes. Um, and uh, so here, on this uh, cartoon illustration, I'm showing you some example um, known um, uh, systems or candidates uh, in the parameter space of binary separation as a function of redshift. And the uh, if you notice the separation spans uh, several orders of magnitude uh, going from uh, milliparsec to subparsec to all the way to kiloparsec to 100 kiloparsec scales. And this is because we want to paint a really coherent picture of the full uh, evolution of a pair of supermassive black holes following a galaxy merger. And uh, you may notice that uh, there are glaring gaps 
in in these diagrams. And uh, uh, so, first, uh, firstly, the all, all the these um, uh, objects shown at the at the bottom right, they they are candidates. So they are um, basically sub parser candidates that are selected from indirect approaches. Um, you know, perhaps uh, not available for direct confirmation. Um, you know, before gravitational wave uh, detection. Um, and uh, what we would like to focus on are the population on the uh, upper left, which uh, really represent those that, that are uh, directly confirmed systems. Um, so uh, if I make a similar plot by showing you, uh, you know, uh, almost all the uh, known uh, so-called dual uh, agents uh, in the literature. So here is that plot uh, showing uh, on the right. Uh, you can see that uh, although there are many um, dual agents, which are the really low luminosity uh, counterpart of dual quasars, uh, there, there are really only a handful of cases um, you know, at uh, redshift one, two, three-ish uh, around redshift two, um, which is the cosmic noon uh, representing the peak of both quasar space density and cosmic star formation. So in order to really understand this peak uh, supermassive black hole um, and uh, star formation epoch in, in the universe, we really want to go to um, higher redshift. And uh, so, at the larger scales, which uh, means larger than 10 kiloparsec scales, there are many of these uh, uh, wide separation quasar pairs, uh, but we really don't know if they are uh, already in gravitational interaction with each other yet. So they may or may not be merging as of yet. So bottom line is that there is a glaring gap um, at high redshift and small separation, which we would like to fill with the Vodka project. And uh, finally, this, this last plot just uh, zoom in on the cosmic moon, showing you the, the really handful of candidates of dual quasars, which really represent the really highly accreting um, merging system that may more likely to be directly associated with mergers. And uh, uh, I, I'm going to return back to this, this uh, figure later. But um, in this talk, I'm going to be highlighting this new work, uh, which represents the first confirmed case of a kiloparsec scale dual quasar at cosmic noon with confirmed galaxy merger. OK, so um, but before telling you uh, the details, I just wanted to um, say a few words about the, the many methods that uh, are available to detect these systems across a whole different scales. And we, and we draw a lot of um, inspiration from the um, stellar binary and exoplanet community. And in particular, there is the astrometry technique, which proves not to be so useful for exoplanet but it turns out it's very useful for us. Um, I won't go through the details, but just to give you uh, a context of the techniques that are available. And uh, in particular, this new technique, which we call uh, vastrometry, uh, which stands for variability induced astrometry jitter. Uh, so it goes like very similar to uh, viewing a railroad crossing sign from the distance. So uh, notice that if you have two quasars on kiloparsec scales, so the quasars themselves are not moving, but because of the variability, perhaps due to thermal uh, instabilities in their equation disk, um, it produces this apparent shift in their uh, unresolved light center which we can use uh, actually as a detection uh, signal. Using this technique, uh, we use um, 
Gaia astrometry, which really offers you a uh, almost full sky survey of uh, bright quasars. Um, and uh, uh, here I'm showing you some examples of uh, ground based limited images of uh, some of the uh, vastrometry selected um, kiloparsec scale dual quasar candidates. Now, um, in order to really test whether they are due to uh, two or multiple sources, so we really need high resolution follow up. And uh, we obtained uh, dual band uh, Hubble images. Um, and the, uh, indeed, in uh, more than half of the sample, uh, you, you find uh, two or even multiple sources um, verifying that indeed this variability induced astrometry uh, jitter technique is, is working. And using the, the information, we can uh, by and large reject some obvious stellar interlopers, for instance. But this is not the end of the story. Uh, and this is because um, uh, in a lot of these candidates, so you uh, there, there's a long standing um, debate about the nature of these dual quasar candidates because you can uh, have uh, instead uh, just lens images of a single quasar by a foreground galaxy, for instance. So, what really uh, is crucial is deep, high resolution near infrared imaging. And uh, here I'm showing you an example of. A, uh, the first case of a confirmed dual quasar um, separated by uh, about four kiloparsecs uh, at cosmic noon, in which um, you can actually detect both uh, tidal tails indicative of uh, direct uh, gravitational interaction as well as extended host galaxies. Um, and this is really uh, uh, conclusive evidence uh, in favor of the merger hypothesis um, and uh, uh, ruling out the uh, lensing scenario. Um, on the bottom, uh, we also have CAC-AO imaging, which uh, is better in terms of the resolving power, but um, HST um, uh, infrared imaging is better for its more stable PSF, and the uh, uh, the uh, fainter, the, the the deeper the uh, surface brightness limit that it allows us to get. So that these two are really complementary um, uh, to each other. And uh, finally, to put this uh, discovery into context again, so in contrast, all of the handful of um, dual quasar candidates uh, below 10 kiloparsecs, they are either uh, the so-called near identical quasars, which are most likely still lensed quasars instead of merging quasar pairs, uh, or uh, there are also cases where you see some notable, uh, noticeable differences in their spectral uh, features, but uh, they're still controversial uh, as perhaps projected quasar pairs as large separations that are not uh, actually merged yet. So none of these previous candidates actually has this confirmed uh, uh, merger signature. Okay, so uh, finally going on to the, you know, the really highlight of uh, this system is uh, with uh, uh, Gemini spectroscopy, both in the optical and infra infrared, we are able to measure really key physical quantities for uh, both the host galaxy and the supermassive black hole. And it's a, a very massive system, almost equal mass merger hosted by um, a, a very, very massive galaxy merger. Cosmic moon. And uh, uh, we also have the uh, Hubble STIS spectrum, but Gemini is really better in terms of the signal to noise that, that it offers. Uh, whereas uh, Hubble obviously is better for uh, really conclusively resolving the, the close uh, double course. So again, these two are really complementary.
And uh, moving along, so this is uh, almost my fi final slide. We also have multivalent confirmation and um, both in the x-rays and in the radio to study their accretion properties. Um, and uh, we also have in future James Webb and Alma observations approved uh, to understand more, the more detailed host galaxy um, star and gas uh, contents and kinematics um, in future. So stay tuned for more results. Um, so this is my summary slide. I wanted to leave you with something to look forward to. So in summary, um, the Gemini spectroscopy is very, very useful for um, spatially resolved follow-up for uh, the larger sample of our Volga candidates. And this is, you know, only possible um, because of the uh, really high efficiency and uh, uh, fast turnaround and uh, to, for us to be able to build up a large enough sample uh, to understand the statistics in order to compare with um, theoretical models. And uh, finally, uh, I wanted to also mention that uh, with, uh, so this, this here is an example of a uh, do quasar candidates in our sample, uh, which uh, has a separation of 0.5 arc second. So it's not actually pushing the limit, but uh, it's very faint. It's a target uh, of only uh, R uh, of 19 magnitude. So it's the faintest uh, ever image targets for um, a low peak. So, um, and uh, it's very exciting. Um, prospect for, um, you know, perhaps uh, observing more of these uh, interesting candidates to um, really uh, find either do or uh, lens quasars. So I will stop here and take questions. Okay, thank you, Xin. Uh, so we have uh, just uh, time for just maybe one or two short, short questions. Is there any? Question from Slack? No, there's no question. I have a question. Sure. So I'm wondering about this obscuration properties of dual agents. So it seems like they do both show broad lines in their spectra. So do you think, but I thought that they are kind of obscured because they're merging. So do you have any idea about this obscuration properties for this dual agents? Yeah, wonderful question. Thank you. So indeed, um, in mergers and in particular gas-rich mergers at high redshift, you would expect a lot of obscuration perhaps, uh, not just near the nuclear region, but also in the host galaxy uh, of the merger. Uh, but in our case, be because of the sample selection, we are um, strongly uh, biased against ob the obscure population because we uh, require them to be unobscured uh, as a starting point so that we can have the uh, variability in their uh, continuum emission, which means that they are unobscured AGM by definition. So this is indeed one of the limitations of the technique. So in, or in order to get to the uh, the really intrinsic population of both obscured and um, unobscured population, you would need to, co to correct for that um, unobscured uh, AGM population fraction. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we need to move on. So uh, thanks to the speaker one more time. And the next talk is an invited talk. Uh, by Jonel Walsh from uh, Texas A&M. And uh, she will talk about the uh, Superman's black hole galaxy connection. And I will, I will give you five minute warning before. Perfect, thanks. No, it's okay. Great. 
Uh, thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, nearby galaxies and their central black holes um, and our efforts to try to understand how they co-evolve. Uh, in particular, I'll be discussing a large program using Gemini NIFS assisted by adaptive optics. So supermassive black holes reside at the centers of essentially every massive galaxy. And of course, we now have very strong evidence for the presence of supermassive black holes. Um, the best dynamical evidence we have comes from our own galaxy, where we can track the paths of individual stars as they orbit about the black hole. But beyond the Milky Way, black holes have been dynamically detected in about 100 galaxies to date. And from those detections, we've learned that the masses of black holes correlate with the large scale bulge properties of the galaxy. So two of the more well-studied relations are between the black hole mass and the stellar velocity dispersion, uh, that's M sigma, and the black hole mass and bulge luminosity, that's ML. So these relationships suggest that somehow black holes and galaxies grow in tandem. However, the local black hole mass census is highly incomplete. And that's particularly true for low mass black holes, below about a few times 10 to the seven solar masses, and for high mass black holes above about a few times 10 to the nine solar masses. So this leaves major questions regarding the distribution of black hole masses with host galaxy properties. With the present measurements, things like the slope, the intrinsic scatter, and even the shape of the correlations for low and high mass black holes are not well established. Also, as we begin to study a wider range of galaxies, we find surprises in the scaling relations. For example, recent progress detecting high mass black holes in brightest cluster galaxies hint that these objects could lie above M sigma, but there's still too few available measurements to firmly characterize the scaling relations at the high mass end. And the uncertainties are equally severe at the other end, where spiral galaxies with low mass black holes exhibit large scatter below both the M sigma and ML relationships. In addition, we still don't have a good understanding of the primary physical mechanisms that are driving these empirical correlations. And there's plenty of fundamental questions that remain unanswered. For example, do black holes and galaxies grow in lockstep with one another over time, or does the growth of one precede that of the other? So in order to answer those kind of questions, we really do need more black hole mass measurements, um, especially at the extremes of the black hole mass scale and over a wider range of galaxies that have undergone different evolutionary histories. So in order to obtain robust uh, black hole mass measurements, we need high angular resolution observations that probe the innermost regions of galaxies where the gravitational potential from the black hole dominates. So that region is the black hole's sphere of influence and its size is pretty small. So for a typical supermassive black hole with a mass of about 10 to the eight solar masses, the black hole's sphere of influence is roughly tens of parsecs. So therefore, we're really limited to studying only the nearby galaxies with the current observational facilities. Um, so in the past, HST with its angular resolution has played a fundamental role in detecting black holes over the past about 25 years. Uh, but more recently, uh, progress has been made using adaptive optics, AO on large ground-based telescopes. So uh, AO can deliver similar angular resolutions as HST, but it has the advantage of being used with a larger telescope and it operates in the near infrared. So galaxies that were previously pretty tough to observe with HST because they were a little too faint or a little too dusty can be studied in great detail with AO on large telescopes. So given the extensive observational efforts that are needed for just a single black hole mass determination, the approach that has been used for years is to measure one or a few black holes at a time. But what we also need to do and in order to advance the field is examine larger samples uh, with homogeneous data sets. And so we're carrying out a large black hole program uh, at Gemini North. Um, so we're going to be measuring black hole masses using stellar dynamical modeling methods in 31 galaxies uh, using AO-assisted NIFS. Um, so the goal of this program is to obtain a more complete census of local black holes in a wider range of galaxies. So here I'm showing a plot of the galaxy K-band luminosity and size, the effective radius. The green dots show the uh, published dynamical black hole mass measurements that have been made. 
And for comparison, the gray contours are showing the nearby galaxy population. So the point here is that those green points are not representative of the local galaxy population. So at a given luminosity, galaxies with smaller sizes have been preferentially targeted. They just happen to be the easiest to observe and model. But it's really important to sample this luminosity or equivalently mass size parameter space. So as you move away from these points in this direction, a whole bunch of different galaxy properties vary. Things like the stellar velocities versions, the mass to light ratios, the bulge fractions, the gas content, the stellar populations, and morphology. Also, galaxies that grow in different ways end up on different regions of this plot. So clearly, we need to do a better job of sampling this important parameter space if we want to get at what the true distribution of black hole masses are with host galaxy properties and try to really understand what role black holes play in galaxy evolution. So here in red are the galaxies in our sample. Um, the red numbers correspond to the images that are shown around the plot. The red crosses are also in our sample. There's just no image being shown. So our sample significantly increases coverage of this important parameter space without sampling that already well-populated region within the dotted oval. So our sample uh, spans a wide range of properties by design. For example, the stellar velocities versions range from 60 to 300 kilometers per second. Uh, we also have a number of spiral galaxies in our sample. We'll nearly double the number of black hole mass measurements that have been made in spiral galaxies, which is a regime that largely has not been tackled with stellar dynamical modeling techniques. So, so far we have completed observations with NIFS for 12 galaxies, and those 12 galaxies already enhance the diversity of black hole hosts. So we've observed the largest, most luminous galaxy in the sample, as well as lower luminosity galaxies at different effective radii. And so here I'm just showing some example spectra from NIFS for the most recent six galaxies that we finished observing. Uh, so this is at the nucleus and then about an arc second away. Um, and so the data quality really are excellent. So from those absorption features, we measure the velocity distribution of the stars along our line of sight. And we characterize that distribution by the center, the velocity, the spread, the velocity aspersion, and then asymmetric and symmetric deviations from a Gaussian, like H3 and H4, or even beyond. Um, and so that's what I'm showing here for two example galaxies. So these are maps of the velocity, and we see that both of these galaxies are rotating. Uh, these are maps of the velocity aspersion, and we see this nice sharp rise in the velocity aspersion as you move in toward the nucleus, uh, reaching values of about 375 and about 56 kilometers per second at the center. Uh, so again, you can see that we do have this wide range of galaxies. We also have some interesting cases. Uh, so in the case of this galaxy, the velocity aspersion drops at the center. Uh, so that could be an indication of a non-detection of a black hole, which would still be interesting because that would suggest that this galaxy lies well below both the current M-sigma and ML relationships. But this could also be the result of a distinct dynamically cold component of stars at the nucleus as well. And so our dynamical models will be able to distinguish between those two scenarios. Um, so in addition to the NIFS observations, we also have now completed HST observations for all 31 galaxies in three filters with WIF seat 3 and we've also finished obtaining um, large-scale data as well. So we have IFU data with LRS2 on the Hobby Eberle Telescope, and then even wider field IFUs, Virus P and Virus W, on the 2.7-meter telescope at McDonald. So what we're doing is constructing these orbit-based dynamical models. The main idea is that the galaxy's gravitational potential consists of contributions from the black hole, stars, and dark matter. The stellar potential is determined from, say, an HST image. We deproject it, assuming a viewing orientation and a mass to light ratio. And then we set up a representative orbital library and we integrate orbits in that potential. We assign weights to the orbits such that the superposition best reproduces the observed kinematics from the spectroscopy and then the brightness from the image. And then we just calculate a whole bunch of different models varying the parameters of interest, like the black hole mass, and we're looking to the model that most closely matches the data. 
So uh, here's an example for that first galaxy that I showed before, PGC12557. And this plot kind of summarizes the modeling results. So these are contours of chi squared as a function of black hole mass and H band mass to light ratio. So ultimately we're finding a black hole mass of 2.3 times 10 to the nine solar masses. And then this is a comparison between the observed NIFS observations and larger scale LS2 observations in black and then best fit model in green. Uh, so the model is doing an excellent job of matching the data. So here we actually ran four independent orbit-based modeling codes that our team has access to. So they all operate uh, you know, in that same general way that I described, but the details and the implementation are different. Um, and so the good news is that we are getting consistent black hole masses. And it's also a decent way to try to get an estimate of possible systematic uncertainties too. Okay, so for this galaxy, uh, it hosts a very massive black hole and it's consistent with M sigma, but is a positive outlier from ML. And that's even when conservatively using the galaxy's total luminosity. So this galaxy is actually similar to a few other galaxies in the literature that I'm showing here in red. Um, so all of these galaxies are nearby early type galaxies that are actually compact. Um, so they do have small sizes, effective radii of one to three kiloparsecs, but where their K-band luminosities of about 10 to the 11 solar luminosities. Um, so that corresponds to stellar masses of about 10 to the 11 solar masses, and they have high central stellar velocities versions. So all of these galaxies host very massive black holes, but they're very different from the kinds of galaxies you would actually expect to find at the upper end of the black hole galaxy relations. So for example, here I'm showing um, some of the galaxies in the Perseus cluster. Uh, so NGC 1275 is the brightest galaxy of the cluster, and it's exactly the kind of galaxy that you would expect to find at the upper end of the black hole galaxy relations. So galaxies like this are large in size, typically effective radii of 10 kiloparsecs or more. They're often dispersion supported galaxies showing little to no rotation. Um, so that's in sharp contrast to NGC 1277, uh, which is located nearby, and it's an example of one of those compact galaxies. So as you can see, it looks very different from this galaxy. It is small and flattened and rapidly rotating. And instead, it looks quite similar to the typical redshift to massive quiescent galaxies, uh, the so-called red nuggets. So um, these nearby compact galaxies look very similar to the redshift two red nuggets, and so they could be relics. So the redshift two red nuggets are thought to grow in size and mildly in mass through a series of mergers to produce the typical massive early type galaxy of today. So these local compact galaxies appear to have taken a different evolutionary pathway, one in which they didn't experience those same amount of mergers to build up the outskirts of their galaxies. If true, then these compact galaxies like NGC 1277 and PGC 12557 could reflect a previous time when the local ML relationship did not apply, galaxies contained overmassive black holes, and it was the growth of the host galaxy that had yet to catch up. So it could suggest that black hole growth precedes that of the host galaxy. Another possibility though, is that we simply don't have enough measurements at the upper end of the black hole scaling relations. So as I mentioned before, you know, the form, the intrinsic scatter, all of that stuff is not well established at the high mass end. So these compact galaxies could lie in a tails of a distribution between black hole masses and host galaxy properties that have yet to be fully flushed out. Okay, so that was an example of a stellar dynamical black hole mass measurement from the large program. And the large program was designed to do that kind of work. Um, but in some cases, we're also seeing um, very prominent near infrared emission lines. And so NGC 4111 is an example of that. Um, so this, I also mentioned earlier too. Um, so this is a nearby galaxy that's an early type galaxy and it's edge on, and it has this dusty polar ring here. Um, so this galaxy in the NIFS data has H2 emission lines, and this one molecular gas is embedded in that dusty polar ring. 
Now there's also previously published stellar and ionized, so oxygen-3 gas kinematics from Suran um, through the Atlas 3D survey. So the NIST data probe the innermost regions out to about 100 parsecs, and then the Suran data are larger scale that go out to about 1.5 kiloparsecs. Um, so I already showed you these small scale NIST stellar kinematics. Again, the galaxy is rotating and there's a velocity dispersion drop at the center. The larger scale Suran stellar kinematics shows similar features too. If we look at the H2 uh, kinematics from NIFS, so this is the velocity field, we see that it's counter rotating with respect to the stars. So this is a map of the flux distribution for uh, H2. Um, so this side of the distribution is the brightest to the Northwest. And we're taking that to be the near side of the gas distribution. So this near side is red shifted, whereas the far side is blue shifted, suggesting inflow. And then if we look at the uh, larger scale oxygen-3 kinematics, the velocity field just looks different. So there's a kinematic twist here. And even if you were to try to pull out a global position angle, it doesn't align with any of the principal axes for NGC 4111. Uh, it's not aligned with the photometric major axis or the major axis from the stars. So basically it's in this unstable configuration. So we examined uh, the CERN kinematics um, a little bit further, applying kinematry. Um, so this is, again, that observed uh, velocity map for oxygen-3. And so uh, we're finding that this is actually a result of the superposition of two components, uh, one that is rotating in the equatorial plane of the galaxy, and then one that's rotating in the dusty polar ring. And if we uh, add this up and compare it to our observations, these are the residuals. And so this is supposed to represent the um, non-circular motions that are present in the dusty polar ring. And we see this kind of hints of a spiral-like structure, also suggesting potential inflow and connecting to the smaller scale H2 kinematics from NIFS. So uh, with this analysis, we propose that this uh, dusty polar ring originates from the capture of a dwarf galaxy. Um, and again, that CERN ionized gas kinematics is the superposition of two components, one that's rotating in the main plane of the galaxy and one that is in the dusty polar ring. Um, we do see the residual non-circular motions in the polar ring has the spiral-like structure suggesting potential inflow. Um, that also potentially connects to the NIFS inflowing gas. So the H2 gas kinematics from NIFS, again, suggests inflow because the um, near side of the gas distribution is red shifted and then the uh, far side is blue shifted. But some of this inflowing gas um, may be settling into uh, the galaxy plane and forming new stars, which would result in that velocity dispersion drop at the center. Uh, but some of that gas does seem to be reaching the nucleus triggering a low luminosity AGN. So yeah, this is just an example of how, you know, the large program is focused on those stellar dynamical black hole mass measurements. But with the high quality NIST data, we can also examine any emission lines and try to learn about black hole feeding and feedback. Um, so very briefly, uh, I wanna end with um, kind of looking forward and giving an example of the potential impact with the James Webb Space Telescope. So uh, we have a JWST program to study the very famous black hole in M87. Uh, so M87 has been the subject of a number of black hole mass measurements using both stellar and gas dynamical modeling techniques. So over the years, you know, of course, the modeling methods and the data have improved dramatically, but the most recent stellar and gas dynamical black hole mass measurements continue to disagree by a factor or two. Of course, we also have this image from the Event Horizon Telescope, and that provides a third independent measurement of the black hole mass. So at face value, this agreement between the EHT results and the most recent stellar dynamical black hole mass measurements uh, you know, is reassuring. It's a good validation of the stellar dynamical modeling technique, uh, but it does deserve further scrutiny only because both of these methods relied on extensive numerical modeling and built-in simplifying assumptions. 
So the original, uh, not the original, but the most recent stellar dynamical black hole mass measurement was done by fitting axisymmetric orbit-based models to Gemini NIFS data assisted by adaptive optics. There is room for improvement. So for example, the AGN dominates the inner region within about 0.3 arc seconds. And so the stellar absorption lines um, are completely diluted as a result. And so you can't actually make reliable stellar kinematic, kinematic measurements uh, very close to the center. Um, so over here are the observations of the stellar velocity dispersion. Um, and then that solid line is that best fit model from the most recent stellar dynamical black hole mass measurement. And so again, no measurements could be made within about 0.3 arc seconds. And then the model is unconstrained in that region. So with JWST and its very stable diffraction limited PSF and enhanced sensitivity and the need to not worry about you know, residuals from skylines and telluric features, we can do a better job of measuring the stellar kinematics. Um, we are also going to combine this data with new but already in hand large scale IFU stellar kinematics, and we're going to apply a new triaxial orbit based modeling approach. Um, we're going to do a more comprehensive analysis of the error budget and include possible systematic effects like a potential mass to light ratio gradient. So yeah, JVST just provides this, you know, exciting, timely opportunity to obtain a precise and accurate black hole mass measurement for M87, which is a key anchor to the black hole scaling relations. And since it looks like I am out of time here, I will just leave up my summary slide. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe we have time for a couple of questions. Is there any question? The audience from the slide. No. So, please, during you think about the question, I uh, give you a question. So, uh, 20 years ago, we thought that the M sigma relation is very tight with the intrinsic scatter less than maybe 0.3 dex. Now, the sample size is substantially grossly increased, including your measurement, and now scatter mm -hmm. seems to be very large. So, I was wondering what do you think whether this is, uh, if the scatter is very large, then the Correlation may not guarantee causality. So I'm wondering what you think about this. Yeah, so um, I, I think at this point, you know, we can we can measure the intrinsic scatter based on what we have and the uncertainties that everyone is quoting on their black hole mass measurements. Um, but you know, I really think you know everyone's doing the best they can. Um, but I think there are a lot of systematics that are not being considered. Um, I think we're getting down to the point where we actually have really excellent data in a lot of cases, and the statistical uncertainties are actually quite small. Um, and I, so I think as a field, we need to do a better job of examining those potential systematic effects, including more realistic <laughs> uncertainties on our black hole mass measurements. Um, and, you know, that obviously ties into, you know, how you're going to measure your intrinsic scatter. And I think something else that's really important there is doing it both ways, like with M87, right? So, you know, we're seeing a factor of two difference, even though it's been measured many, many times in both ways. Um, so I think before you talk about which relation is more fundamental or which one is, is a causality, or I, I, I think those kind of questions, you know, you can try, but I think it all boils down actually to the uncertainties that we're quoting. Okay, thank you. I think we have a question. Joel has a question on the slide. Do you expect the new IFUs being commissioned on juniors? Will you provide any improvement for this kind of work? It's <laughs> a great, great question. I'm sure lots of people here uh, are wondering the same thing. Um, yeah, so no, I, I think uh, in our case, uh, we actually don't quite need uh, the really high R, the spectral resolution. Uh, you know, we're not trying to study like dwarf galaxies or anything like that. Um, so I think, I think there's room to use it and I, I definitely be interested in exploring that. Um, you know, I am actually very happy with NIFS. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it's worth taking a look at, um, but yeah, NIFS seems very well matched to what we want to do, uh, given its pixel size and, uh, you know, the larger space, the larger coverage, the larger field of view. Um, and we don't need that super high R for the high res mode of, of GMERS. Okay, one more short question. Uh, I was intrigued by the and amount of speaker. difficulty in 4111. Um, the amount of, sorry, what? Difficulty or complexity you ah. have 
velocity field. So if you would take the same care for your more regular galaxies where you maybe haven't even checked if they also have a complex structure, would that maybe contribute to the scatter in the relation? Uh, yeah, so um, I, you're, you're right. There's plenty of complexity in uh, the gas velocity fields for 4111. I would never try to measure a black hole mass using gas dynamics for that galaxy, given the reasons that you just said. It's very complex. Um, <laughs> No, but I was referring to, to other galaxies, whether even if you, you don't have necessarily a hint that it might be like that, but if you look at the larger scale, uh, indeed, that might be the galaxy might be more complex than what you think, and you actually could decompose, and then all of a sudden mass measurements are different. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that absolutely could happen. Often what people do for gas dynamics is actually focus on circumnuclear disks. So they really aren't studying gas on large spatial scales. Um, they're really focused in at the center because then maybe you do see circular rotation and it's easier to model instead of trying to do everything um, all the way out that definitely things can get messy with gas. Yeah, I think we have to move on. So let's thank the speaker one more time. The next talk will be given by Julia Kalvechter uh, from Gemini NOLA. Uh, she will be talking about the multi-phase view on agent feedback in the closed agent reference survey. Sorry, that was a few patients were bothering. Thank you, and thanks, Jonghai. Um, for those of you yeah, who haven't seen my talk yesterday, so I'm Julia Scharwichter, I'm based at Gemina North, and today I have the pleasure to talk about a research project I've been involved in for the last several years, which is the Close AGN Reference Survey, or CARS, um, for which we as also have also an ongoing project to obtain NIFS follow-up data. So the previous talk was a very nice introduction, of course, also to the NIFS capabilities and uh, the, some of the data I will show in this talk. So this talk is in collaboration with the CARS team, and I would just like to acknowledge um, the past PI, Bernd Husemann, who um, has been leading the project for many years while at the MPIA, and our current PI, Rebecca McElroy, who is based in Australia. So the, the um, primary objective of the CAR survey is to um, really look into the details of AGN uh, feedback by um, using a multi-wavelength uh, multi uh, approach and also a spatially resolved approach using IFU data. And since it's a bit more of a broader audience, I thought I'll spend a few very basic words on what actually AGN feedback is. It's basically the cycle um, you have in the galaxy um, driven by accretion from the galaxy onto the supermassive black hole, which could then trigger star formation, grow the black hole, but also ignite an AGN, for example, um, basically through the conversion of mass into energy. And this energy release in turn can have an effect back on the host galaxy. And the primary processes discussed here are photoionization and heating of the um, interstellar medium in the galaxy, um, feedback can also happen through um, radiation pressure driven winds and outbursts from the AGN or through um, mechanical feedback from jets launched by the AGN. And AGN feedback has become a very integral part of our nowadays understanding of um, galaxy evolution. However, the observational details of how such feedback works um, are still uh, somewhat are still controversial, especially on the observational side. And uh, there are some uh, open questions I'm listing here, which are also part of what the CAR survey tries to tackle, which include, for example, over which temporal and spatial scales do such feedback processes operate? Um, second question is, do AGN suppress star formation in the host galaxies, which has been um, suggested um, theoretically, but it's still observationally quite controversial. And the final question is also, how does AGN feedback actually couple to the multi-phase gas in these galaxies? And particularly, um, just looking at the single gas phase um, has been shown to not be sufficient to fully understand the impact of AGN feedback on, on the host galaxy. 
And there have been, of course, um, studies, for example, using multi-wavelength surveys to use multi-gas um, phases in the low redshift universe. The advantage of such studies, of course, is that there is um, a sufficiently good spatial resolution to study really in detail the physics that's going on. However, such surveys are often limited to um, more lower luminosity AGN because they are studying the low redshift universe, which may not be fully representative of the conditions in the higher redshift universe, and also sometimes um, limited to a more specific AGN parameter space. On the contrary, um, looking at um, surveys in the higher redshift universe, um, you can probe the AGN luminosities that are more representative of the high redshift conditions where we expect major feedback to happen. However, of course, at higher redshift, um, the spatial resolution is somewhat more limited to really this, the, the look into the physics in more detail. So CARS has been attempting to some extent to bridge this gap by looking into some of the most luminous unobscured AGN in the nearby universe. And specifically, um, the car sample has been selected from a parent sample of 99 unobscured AGNs, which are taken from the Hamburg ESO Bright Quasar Survey. And these data were selected by using a redshift cut of 0.06. So these are really relatively nearby objects, but still quite luminous. And also, we um, implied a selection based on uh, having already single dish CO data available for um, for these for these targets based on the paper from Datram et al. So the final cast sample itself is a selection of forty one sources that were randomly taken from this parent sample of ninety nine sources, and you can see um, a gallery of these targets on the right of the host galaxies uh, on the right. And these data are primarily reconstructed images from used data cubes, and a few of these images are also taken from pen stars. So I've already mentioned news um, has been at the core of the CARS survey, news at VLT. Um, specifically, the backbone of the CARS survey is the optical integral field spectroscopy, which was for most of these targets obtained with news at the VLT. And for four targets that were also added from observations with um, PMAS at Cala Alto and VMOS at the VLT. And of course, since I'm talking about the multi wavelength um, follow up, um, there has also been a larger campaign to follow up um, sources with the VLA, Alma, Sophia, Chandra, and MITS at Gemini, which is the part I will uh, talk uh, more about in a bit. And I should also mention that the um, spatial resolution, just for reference, of the optical IFU spectroscopy um, is somewhat variable by target. But um, in the very best cases, we achieved spatial resolutions of 0.4 arc seconds. And in the very worst cases, I think uh, that's one of the PMAS data sets, um, we achieved spatial resolution of 1.7 arc seconds. So most of the data are somewhere around um, 0.6 to 1.2 arc seconds. And these um, were obtained with the MUSE wide field mode. So, um, and before coming to NIFS data, I just want to briefly advertise also the CARS first data release, which happened recently. Um, you can access that under this link here. The first data release includes the optical IFU cubes um, plus some higher level data products, which were associated with three papers that were published with the data release. And I invite you to take a look at these, um, just showing a gallery of some of the plots um, included in the data release. Um, one other aspect I wanted to mention is that the, um, that the major goal of the CAR survey has been to employ an AGN host galaxy deblending technique on the optical IFU data. Uh, which is, of course, important to study in more detail the host galaxies' uh, properties against the bright AGN. And this is done based on a PSF that can be traced in the cubes themselves by using, because these are unobscured AGN, by using the broadline emission from the broadline region of the AGN, which is intrinsically unresolved in these data, to probe the PSF and then perform an iterative host galaxy AGN deblending on these data cubes. And this is uh, included in the data release. So now I will switch to the um, MIPS follow-up project and the primary goals. And again, thanks um, for the introduction in the primary in the previous talk. 
um, the primary goals were to study to add basically another um, multi-phase gas tracer, which is the warm hot molecular gas traced via the H2 lines in the near infrared K band. And this is gas, which is basically at a few thousand kelvins. And then to combine this with other gas tracers, for example, we were also interested in the um, in the iron two emission, which can be a tracer of fast shocks. And to combine this also with the um, larger multi wavelength data we have available through CARS, especially the MUSE and ALMA data, and also VLA, to study to look for outflows in the multi phase data. And finally, also, we can take advantage of the reduced dust extinction in the near infrared to combine, for example, what we know about star formation from the MUSE H alpha data with information we may get from um, the hydrogen recombination lines in the near infrared data, especially in this case, passion beta and bracket gamma for the wavelengths we have been covering. So, so far we have um, four sources that were fully observed in the two bands we had requested, plus two sources that were um, are partially complete in the K bands. And um, I should also mention that, of course, we wanted to um, achieve reasonably high resolution. So for the K band, almost, I think, except one data set were observed with adaptive optics through Altair. In the J-band, we had been relying on good natural seeing for the Gemini term. It's IQ20 in most of these cases. So um, that is complementary, but somewhat worse than the adaptive optics um, data we have obtained in the K-band. So one very interesting target um, from the CAR survey, which had been actually followed up with NIFS with an FT program, and really shows the power of combining um, the multi-phase data we have within CARS is this source HE1353, which um, in the news data revealed a very extended ionization cone, which you can see in the green um, data and the three color image from news on the left. The green, uh, the green color here traces the O3 emission. So this was, Anyway, an interesting source because it's an unobscured AGN, but still seen in a relatively edge-on galaxy from our point of view, which means that there is quite likely some major effect from the AGN onto the host galaxy. So this ionization cone, based on our interpretation, is um, not an AGN outflow, but it's probably gas that was uplifted from the disk through star formation processes and then illuminated by the AGN. However, interestingly, we also see um, now looking at, if you can see that the VLA contours in blue um, overlaid on the ALMA image, you can see that there is an extension in the VLA contours, which may suggest an AGN jet. And we have been focusing into that region with NIFS, which is the field of view shown in yellow here. And the NIFS data, interestingly, um, shows that all of the emission lines we have been detecting, R2 was a bit faint to detect, but uh, the bracket gamma version beta and H2 lines show like two off nuclear emission peaks, which are about 0.6 kiloparsecs from the nucleus. And interestingly, the southwestern peak, particularly over uh, uh, lines with where we see this elongation in the radio contours. So there might be some jet-driven interaction scenario, which is further supported by the kinematics, which can be seen in the lower left, um, which shows that there is a gradient in kinematics through the southern emission peak, which might indicate some driving of gas through a mechanical interaction with the radio jet. Now combining the NIFS data with the multi-phase gas tracers, you can now see velocity dispersion maps uh, for um, the ionized for the O3 ionized gas from MUSE on the left, and for the cold molecular gas and CO120 from ALMA on the right, compared to where we saw the emission peaks in the warm molecular gas from MIS. It's interesting to note that all of these, um, that these two other gas tracers show um, higher velocity dispersion in the same region, which really, and also not showing here, but they also have um, broader line wings in this area which really indicates that we see possibly a radio jet driving um, a fast outflow in the circum nuclear one kiloparsec region of this galaxy by interacting with the dense um, molecular gas in this host galaxy. 
So um, just for the last few minutes, I'll just take you through some of the work in progress with the other NIFS data, just to show you the NIFS data quality and what we are working on. Um, this is another galaxy from the CAR survey that was followed up with NIFS HE2302. And you can see this is a rather disk-dominated galaxy, which has a um, disk, disk rotation. So on the left, you see the H alpha surface density, O3 surface density, gas velocity, and gas dispersion from muse. Um, in the full muse field of view, which contains basically the whole galaxy in all of these cases. And now zooming into the center of the muse data, um, and I'm comparing this now again with the NIFS field of view, we can get in the black square. Um, you can see that NIFS now shows um, the center at a much better resolution. It's about a factor of three for the K-band data, which were obtained at a higher spatial resolution. And this shows that all of the lines um, we have been seeing here show some evidence of a nuclear spiral. And um, especially looking at the H2, um, the gas kinematics is somewhat matching what we see in MUSE. Um, the gas velocity dispersion is relatively small, so probably this galaxy um, shows more like an accretion tracer through the H2. And I should mention that all of these NIFS data are somewhat preliminary in the sense that we are still working on a similar AGN host decomposition for these data, which should much enhance the contrast um, versus the nuclear PSF on what we see in the more extended gas distribution. A very different source is this source, HE. Uh, 0232, which is a very interesting ring-shaped galaxy, um, which is known to be a merger candidate with a double nucleus. And you can actually see uh, the second nucleus next to the AGN in the news image. It's about three arc second from the, from the AGN center. And this galaxy has a very complex kinematics, especially if we zoom again into the center, can see that, of course, in the double nuclear region, both the gas velocity and gas dispersion are very complex. And then again, I show here the preliminary NIFS data, where we see also very extended gas emission with a similarly complex kinematics. And the um, analysis together with the MUSE and VLA data is now, especially with respect to the kinematics, is now ongoing. So I'll just conclude. Um, by saying that um, the rest frame near infrared IFU observations of nearby AGN play an important role in really tracing the multiphase gas in, in the vicinity of an AGN. And this is true for cars, but also there have been other many studies using, for example, also Symphony, NIFS, and OSIRIS. And um, we have already preempted a little bit this discussion in the previous talk. Um, I also wanted to mention that this will also be an important science case in the near term future, of course, for the genius high and low resolution IFUs, and also in the longer term, coming back to my talk yesterday, for the capabilities um, Gemini and will offer with the new AO system, GNAO, and GEARMOS, which is also a near infrared multi object IFU. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Okay. Are there any are there any questions from Slack? No. Uh, a minute. So I guess the car survey has a, a very good job on the PSF subtraction. And uh, can you comment on the high Z IFU studies where it's very much difficult, much more difficult to you know do PSF subtraction? Um, I think rather well, the advantage we have in the CAR survey, of course, is that, is that we have a very clear detection of the broad line region where we can really use this as a tracer of the point source through the cube itself. So I think this is, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a very good expert in the HIZ studies, but I think this is more of an issue for the HIZ studies, especially if you don't have a PSF tracer in the cubes themselves. So you may need an, an IF, uh, a PSF reference separately observed, which then complicates things compared to these pretty high signal to noise near, near data we have. So this is also, of course, an advantage again, that we can really use the higher spatial resolution and the better contrast after AGN host subtraction to study the host galaxy gas near the AGN. Thank you. Uh... Any other question? If not, then uh, let's thank the speaker one more time. Thanks. Thank you.
So the next talk uh, will be given by Chung Pei Ma, uh, which is going to be an online talk. Uh, she's from uh, UC Berkeley, and she will talk about the massive survey, the Genocide View study of the most mass most massive galaxies and uh, black holes in the local universe. Okay. So Hewan will give you a five minute warning with the stars. Great, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so um, I would like to give a quick update on the status of the massive survey uh, with an emphasis on supermassive black holes since uh, that's the theme of this section. And this survey was started really, um, was motivated by, let's see. okay, was motivated by uh, about 10 years ago when we used um, Gemini GMOS along with um, Y field IFU data to um, find a black hole that was three times more massive than M87 at the center of a very big galaxy, well-known galaxy, NGC 4089, which is the um, brightest cluster galaxy at the center of the Coma cluster. And, you know, this is the most massive by stellar mass uh, galaxy in the local volume. And Coma is the uh, spectacular mo most massive cluster in the northern sky out to a uh, 100 megaparsecs. So it was not, in some ways, not too surprising as we had heard that uh, big black holes live in big galaxies. So the environment uh, wasn't so surprising uh, for a detection of a, such a big black hole. But it was the uh, it was hard to get data with enough sensitivity and modeling to actually detect a black hole. So after this uh, discovery, a natural question was, you know, how many of these things are out there? What is the you know number density, and can we maybe get a mass function for black holes at a very massive end in the local universe? So that um, sort of motivated the start of the massive survey. I'm having some trouble advancing the slides. In the practice- Could you just help me? Yeah, in the yeah. practice you clicked and then you were able to move. Yeah, I tried, but okay. We'll see how far we get. Okay, so the massive survey is a um, detailed study of the 100 about most massive galaxies by stellar mass within uh, this volume out of coma. And very importantly, we targeted these galaxies uh, using a, a mass limited survey. So it's volume limited and we use uh, K band, two mass K band uh, magnitudes as a proxy for stellar masses. And so all the galaxies have st stellar masses above 10 to the 11.5 and we target only early type galaxies and the uh, deck cut was minus six degrees. So it's mostly a Northern sky survey. And we really want to study not just the supermassive black holes, but uh, all mass components within these early type galaxies, stars, of course, and cold, warm, hot gas, dark matter halos, and the black holes. And I, um, we've involved many graduate students along the way. And in particular, uh, we're very excited that we've trained more than 10 undergrads and high school students in um, getting their hands on um, uh, analyzing IFU data and doing analysis and, and so on. And there are a few offshoots of the massive survey with emphasis on, for example, uh, the HST phot photometry where we targeted 35 galaxies within uh, about 80 megaparsecs for which we can obtain surface brightness fluctuation distances. The black hole measurements are only as good as uh, the distances we can get because we can only measure things angularly on the sky. So we need precise distances to convert anything into a physical number such as the black hole mass. So uh, this project was led by John Blakesley and Joe Jensen. And so uh, along the way, we actually were able to actually get a new measurement, the most comprehensive measurement of the Hubble constant, H0 using SBF technique. And also we were curious about the molecular gas 
and x-rays, hot halo we heard about, and also the initial mass function possibility of a steepening near the center of these massive galaxies. And, and so these are all different components of the massive survey led by various people. Okay, so why study nearby massive galaxies? Just very quickly, we, we have heard a lot about these objects. So they are the most evolved galaxies and because they're most massive, they're at redshift zero practically. So they carry in some sense, the most amount of historical information of galaxy assembly. And they are obviously hosts of the most massive black holes. And we heard a lot about luminous quasars and some of those should have a descent into the quiescent counterparts today in massive galaxies. And these are sites of AGM feedbacks and IMF, as I mentioned, uh, variations in the IMF spatially. And also, um, as we also heard from Xin Lu, that if they're in binaries, they are the loudest sources of low frequency gravitational waves. So these, these are potential uh, hot spots on the sky. And why another galaxy survey? Haven't there been enough galaxy surveys? Well, you would think, right, these 100, these are the 100 most massive galaxies in our backyard, these 300 pound gorillas should have been studied very well by now. Well, interestingly, actually only about two thirds of the massive galaxies are in the SDSS footprint. Uh, our galaxies are chosen from the All-Sky Survey 2 mass. And spectroscopically, uh, spectroscopically only 20% actually have SDSS spectra and remember, SDSS is just a single fiber of three arc seconds, but we would like to have a really well spatially resolved IFU data um, for the, to study the interior of each galaxy from sub uh, arc seconds out to about 100 arc seconds. And we heard about Sauron Atlas 3D survey. So in that sense, uh, for that survey, we are very complementary. They were also volume uh, limited, but, um, and they were studying early types, but their volume was 42 megaparsecs. So our volume is more than 10 times larger. And hence we are, and since we are targeting the 100 most massive galaxies, we are very complementary. In fact, there are only six overlapping galaxies in our two samples. And those are mostly in Virgo because most of uh, their galaxy, many of their galaxies are in Virgo. And there are of course many uh, exciting IFU surveys ongoing, uh, but their samples are heterogeneous. Sometimes they impose size cuts and various uh, selection uh, cuts. Uh, we, we just don't, we, we only select based on uh, stellar mass. And also we are a very multi-wavelength and, and we uh, are one of our essential um, science goals is to study black holes and none of those surveys target black holes. Okay. And actually not all of the massive galaxies are BCGs and they in fact live in a diverse range, uh, range of environment. Okay, so uh, I want to just focus on black holes for the rest of the talk, but I would like to just highlight in case you're interested in other uh, pieces of science from the massive survey, uh, here are, uh, here's a list of the publications. Um, and uh, we have um, some, some of the ones I've mentioned and I will from this point on just focus on the, um, how we go about measuring black hole masses and our current results. And uh, Janelle had already mentioned that just as a cartoon version of the very messy data we've been um, collecting over the past three decades. So again, a uh, central question we're asking is, are there things beyond M87? And yes, um, NGC 4089 was the first one um, discovered in the local universe, and but the massive survey is meant to target this systematically. Okay, and indeed, um, NGC 1600 on the left was uh, or is a massive survey galaxy, but it's not a very well-known galaxy in comparison to NGC 4089, but its stellar mass is high enough to be in the massive survey. And we have, um, we got sufficient um, high signal to noise data from both GMOS and uh, Mitchell um, spectrograph on McDonnell telescope at um, the McDonald Observatory. And that allowed us to find this um, 17 billion solar mass black hole, but in a, a sort of like an event massive galaxy, which does not lift in 
a rich cluster. NGC 1600 is sort of a, you know, it's, it's a galaxy group, but the second rank, the second next brightest galaxy is three times fainter than NGC 1600. So it has sort of the characteristic of a fossil group. It doesn't quite satisfy that particular criteria, uh, th those criteria people laid out, but the gap is very large. So one interesting question, um, comparing these two very massive galaxy uh, black holes is that they have comparable masses, but they live in quite different environment. So this again motivates further studies to see, you know, is NGC 16, 1600 just the tip of an iceberg because the halo mass, you know, is, is much smaller than the coma cluster. So they should be more abundant, but so it could be a tip of an iceberg, or perhaps this is a very rare object because of maybe uh, galaxy mergers or something that 1600 overwhelm ate up its neighbors in its evolution history and hence grew to such a, a high mass black hole. We currently don't know the answer. More data are needed. Obviously, simulations are helpful for answering these answering these quest questions. Okay, so um, we have heard about the velocity of V, the velocity dispersion sigma, which are the uh, bread and butter kinematics everybody measures. But as Janelle mentioned, we for black hole measurements, it's critical to get the full shape of the velocity distributions of the line of size stellar uh, motions. And we really need the skewness. So, so we cannot assume Gaussian, but we would like to get a skewness, H3 shown here. Uh, cortosis, the boxiness, peakiness of the distribution for each spatial bin, H4. And in fact, here I'm showing you a GMOS um, data of the five by seven arc seconds on the sky of this uh, massive survey galaxy is a fast rotator, NGC 1453. In fact, the signal to noise is so high of a, about a hundred that we're able to measure out H8. Of course, when you get to the higher moments, it's the data, the numbers are consistent with being zero, but we think it's quite critical not to truncate these velocity moments, but rather include them and, and constrain the stellar orbit models using these moments to avoid spurious behavior in the stellar models. And we discuss a lot of these details in our papers. Okay, and here are some of the real crucial um, ingredients we need for the spectroscopy. Okay. And GMOS really is um, uh, incredible for uh, providing us with the central stellar kinematics that are inputted into the stellar models. Okay, so uh, before going further with the black holes, I would like to just showcase uh, concentrating on sigma, the velocity dispersion, the second moment of, of the stellar. Uh, again, these are all absorption line features. And here is a compilation of the 20 galaxies. And uh, right now we are just targeting 20 out of the 100 massive galaxy with GMOS and all necessary data as for black hole measurements. And here you are seeing uh, sigma profiles for 20 galaxies as a function of the radius from the center of each galaxy, but note that we have plotted the uh, radius in logarithmic scales because we have uh, our data encompasses 2.5 dex coverage. And the uh, magenta is again from GMOS and the green uh, points are from the very wide field um, McDonald Mitchell uh, uh, IFU. And I, well, I want to just showcase that um, we often like to assume like for example, in gravitational lensing studies, uh, sometimes right, we assume um, the sigma is an isothermal profile, i.e. flat, uh, as a function of radius. You can see when you have very detailed IFU studies, nothing is flat. In fact, 40A74, uh, this is the, um, the twin of 4089 in coma, has this very uh, interesting rise at the outer part in sigma. And this could be that uh, we're starting to feel the dark matter contributions there. Okay, so the, these are, um, there's a rich, rich amount of information here just in sigma profiles. And let's look at the uh, just the first moment velocities. Okay, that's also critical. And here again, I'm showing the GMOS velocity maps of 20 massive galaxies. Um, one key discovery we had or outcome of the uh, these 
20 galaxies um, is that we are able to measure, as you can see, the velocity kinematic axis, the rotation axis. And you can see that uh, the black indicates the photometric axis. So for some of them on top here, including NGC 1700 that we heard about, they are quite well aligned. On the other hand, at least half of them, um, the kinematic axis is not along the photometric major axis. That is to say, it's not rotating. The galaxy is not rotating about the minor axis of the photo, uh, photometry. And this is well known as a kinematic misalignment. And here we're showing the distribution of this misalignment angle. And you, uh, the, one of the Sauron Alice 3D's main dis, uh, results was that early type galaxies are fast rotators and they're quite well aligned. Now that's for lower stellar mass early types. For our mass range, early type galaxies, you can see there's a long tail of misalignment. In fact, all the way to 90 degree misalignment indicating that the galaxy is rotating uh, actually about the major axis, so-called polar rotations. So, uh, so this by itself is, is very interesting uh, for galaxy assembly people to study, but, um, uh, but one important implication for the of the uh, misalignment is that these galaxies are triaxial in shape. Okay, but before I go out, I just want to highlight NGC 1600, uh, 1700 that we heard about has a beautiful uh, um, counter rotating stellar core here in the GMOS V velocity map. You can see the outer part is blue red here, but the very center has a red and blue. Okay, so. Following up on um, my comment just now, because an absolute abs uh, axisymmetric galaxy cannot produce kinematic misalignment from the um, photometric axis. So necessarily they have to be triaxial in shape, meaning you know the three principal axes shouldn't be of the same length. So uh, the implication for the black hole modeling is quite, um, um, Quite, quite deep because most of the earlier stellar dynamical results uh, for the black hole measurements assume either spherical or axisymmetric gravitational potential. As Janelle mentioned, M87, the stellar dynamical measurement of six billion solar masses by Gebhardt et al. assume axisymmetry. But what we have learned so far is for galaxies as massive as M87 or those in, in the massive survey, they're very probably gonna be triaxial. So we have been spending probably the past two, three years really focusing on getting a, a more efficient short shawl stellar orbit code to work. And uh, we named this the TRIOS code and it's based on the Ramco Van den Bosch 2008 code. And here just for some details uh, for the implication uh, implementations we have uh, added to um, to revamp the code, and triaxial orbits are much more expensive to compute because of these additional stellar orbits uh, called boxed orbits we must in integrate. So it, it, the whole um, modeling part for dynamical black hole measurements is becoming more expensive. Um, another key part is the um, search strategy because now we are simultaneously modeling black hole mass, stellar mass to light ratio, dark matter parameters. And now we have three shape parameters, A, B, and C to simultaneously search for. So we are we can no longer use grid searches and we are doing Bayesian uh, machine learning uh, algorithms. We're uh, introducing those to speed up the search. So I just want to showcase um, our two recent measurements and we have targeted the two and only two very fast rotators in the massive survey among the 20 galaxies we have complete data sets for dynamical measurements. And NGC 1453, as you saw, it has a rotation of about 100 uh, kilometers per second. So V over sigma is still you know, small, about one third, but it's a fast rotator by comparison. Um, so, here we were able to search in these parameter spaces and you can see the, our final result of the corner plot. And so we are able to determine the black hole mass is about three billion solar masses. So it sits on the M sigma relation. 
And also we are able to measure simultaneously the intrinsic triaxiality of the galaxy through short show modeling. And here I want to just highlight, this is the P is the intermediate uh, to the major axis uh, ratio. Um, and this Q is the minor to a major axis ratio. So you can see it's 0.93, so slightly flattened, but the um, but the short to long axis ratio is, is flattened by quite a bit, okay? Uh, so just a, a second example, another fast rotator, as you can see in our velocity maps here, again, GMOS, uh, beautiful data from GMOS. It's rotating at more than 100 kilometers per second in the core of this galaxy, and we're combining, we combine this with the Mitchell data. And again, it's a, it's about 1.7 billion billion solar black hole, and we are able to measure the axis ratio. So I think um, there is very hard to determine the intrinsic shape of a galaxy, obviously. And this technique um, through rich sets of, of kinematic and photometric data and extensive dynamical orbit modeling enable the determination of the uh, intrinsic shapes in addition to these mass parameters. Okay, so I just want to um, just summarize our ongoing efforts here with the massive survey and beyond. So again, uh, the Triesco we are introducing, we have also put in a mass to light uh, gradient, spatial gradient. Um, I'm happy to talk more about this uh, privately. And these are various things we're working on the, on the modeling theory part. Observationally, we still have 18 of the GMOS uh, galaxies that are now slow rotators. And this is uh, made triaxiality even more important here. And we're uh, exploiting other high sensitivity IFUs and also um, comparing different dynamical tracers. And we're very excited about the M87 uh, JWST data uh, Janelle mentioned. So just a concluding thought, again, the sort of the takeaway messages here are that direct local dynamical black hole measurements. So I don't mean quasars or AGN, uh, the, the width of the emission lines, but here is really detailed modeling. As you've seen, they are very difficult. It comes in one by one, but they really are the low rung of the black hole mass ladders, right? All the reverberation mapping, AGM, quasar, black hole mass estimators rely on calibrations. The, the, the virial uh, coefficient have to be uh, coefficient has to be calibrated to local measurements. And the black hole world and the local universe have come a long way. Uh, the two well-known, best studied black holes have been known from since pretty much late 1970s. And as we heard, the 1990s were the glorious days of using HST slits to measure black holes. But now I think the, the past decade or so, we've moved to the large ground state uh, based telescopes because of the high, high sensitivity we need. But combined with IFU and AAO, um, we're making good progress. And But don't forget the modeling part needs to be um, to come to catch up with the fantastic data. And that's what we've been working on. And again, I just want to uh, mentioned excitingly, if these black holes are in binaries, they could be hotspots for low frequency gravitational waves. And if they have uh, some millimeter emissions, unfortunately NGC 1600 doesn't, they are um, much more, much larger than M87, some of them, right? But they're about equally more distant. So they could become uh, good candidates for the next generation uh, Event Horizon Telescope, which currently can only target Sagittarius A star and M87. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for the very interesting invited talk. So we have time for maybe uh, one or two questions. Do you have any um, slide? Joel has a question. What do you see in the Mitchell IFU kinematic maps for the galaxies that have no identifiable kinematic axis in the GMOS data? Right, so there are two of them at the bottom and really they just have no detectable coherent rotations. The V is so low, it's consistent with noise. If you don't have a <laughs> rotation, you can't determine the axis. So there are two of them at the bottom. 
Any other question? How much change in the black hole mass do you see if you apply triaxiality instead of the axisymmetric potential? Have you done any experiment? That's a, yeah, that's a very, very important question. And um, I think it's gonna depend on the galaxies. And um, so we have a big program going on comparing, for example, jams uh, measurement, uh, the uh, genes and isotropy modeling versus axisymmetric Schwarzschild modeling versus uh, tri triaxial modeling. So refer to, for example, the latest 2693 paper, we have comparison. Um, I mean, they can differ somewhat. We, I cannot, I don't think they systematically go one way or the other. We, I don't think we have enough galaxies right now, you know, to say, for example, triaxial always gives you higher or lower a black hole number compared to axisymmetric. And, um, but they can differ by, uh, you know, some tens of percent. And uh, I, uh, and we will, we're working on the M87 black hole measurement and we will uh, let you know. Okay, thank you. So I think that we need to end this session. Let's thank the speaker one more time. And uh, I will give my uh, mic hand. Okay, just a usual reminder, if you have a talk in the final session, just to please come up and test your slides before you leave for lunch. Um, and Suresh, if you're here, if you could come up. And then the folks who will be participating in the final panel discussion will be organizing outside. We'll go from there for lunch. And uh, Jen will be waiting out there and we'll organize people. Okay, have a great lunch. question about when to come back. Um, yeah, it would be 1.30, one hour. Very nice. Uh, I got a question for yeah. you about the collaboration. Yeah, Is yeah. anybody already claimed or starting to work on like, um, Clusters, you can compare like the total halo mass and the star clusters and get the models. And yeah, that'd be super absolutely. Yeah, and, and I mean, if you you know, like, yeah. you have to say you I would have to check. I was wondering okay. that myself. I need to go through my email. Yeah, I mean, we set up a Google Drive, and I thought everyone had access, but it's possible. Uh, but so I can just, 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 yeah, I think I was looking at what was shared. I, I didn't find it, but yeah, send it to me again or check if I'm there. Okay. I'll dig into it a bit. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, so besides the HST um, images, or we have wider field imaging. So we don't. So one of my colleagues uh, kind of went through and basically like uh, broke down and made a documentation of all the public wide field stuff. But we didn't have enough to do Yeah, so okay. You can, that might be something to look at, but it just see data is the place to start. Okay. Uh, excellent. Okay. Okay. If you want to come by, you may want to have a fine connection with this way by it's on uh, it's on uh, 
city jam service. Oh, guy. Already I think that if you want to I it's gonna be one by one. Okay, let me see if I can I can Are these by your They are our next Okay. 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 Um, yeah, so the uh, SP underscore blah. So it gives you a kind of a picture. <laughs> okay, so let's say okay, that, that should be doable. I hope we have yeah, there we go. Awesome. Then I think that we do four all of them, right? Well, yeah, then just four and just one and then maybe. So just to show you, I, I have a quick view one of the XP questions. Yeah. And you can see that overall for the pure flux. Okay. Slope of the flux is doing a good job. All the yeah, others yeah, yeah. kind of make sense. As for the detail, if I could zoom in, I cannot just see this to get yet. But if I could zoom in uh, and you want to do a refined adjustment of the orders, you may want to uh, make sure that all the orders are completely straight before you come down that they really go on top of each other. But I didn't mm -hmm. do it okay. very accurately. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's why either you take it from the like that, and then yeah. you can do that little adjustment, or you take it from the fifth file, and then that's a little more involving because of the full normalization. Okay, the dot the dot file is just uh, we're going to back, right? Okay. Yes, it is. Okay, there's no other file. Yeah, it goes down from the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, I can, I can try that. So, um, if you have any weird uh, things happening, yeah, thank you. Of course, no, really, my pleasure. Uh, I have another question. So, um, we need to submit a proposal and uh, it's about on the entry. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, I need to submit a page two. And now, one of the PI is done a sort of kind of selection using the IDF3. Uh, so he he got uh, the new selection after the test. Sure. So what they did, I submitted the previous selection, which is good. Uh, but then she wants to change a few or maybe for the uh, targets. So here I'm showing right to the red are all the the, the first selection, the one is this blue. The blue are and the other color are the new selection. So the wait, the second is quite the last yeah. Uh, yeah. It's the that you can yeah. yeah. The word right ascension is only known to half of the astronomical community. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> That's 
Yeah. That's the true distinction. You can explain name, explain what is the right distinction. <laughs> well, we should make the survey. <laughs> Sometimes it happens on time when it feels like behind the moon. Oh, <laughs> oh, I like to do it too big. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so you can change packets. Okay. Like that. Um, so we can go to send an email to practical um, okay. kind of place uh, operation. Mm -hmm. And he's the one who has the authority to actually change it. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. And is there any, like, I mean, would be mounted on the system yeah. I mean, I always do like in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so, so there's no, I mean, no problem. <laughs> the targets are more like, yeah, so what they say check similar is, like, uh, magnitude, you know. Yeah, so what we have, those are good points. Uh, what you have to say is basically are you going to be competing with other target themselves as in different psychotic programs and different involved. It's very unlike. Yeah. It's almost a guarantee that we will. Yeah. But it, but you kind of just add in your target without yet. What I know is that at that rate of tension, there is a huge pressure. That was the feedback that I got from the panel. <laughs> so a lot of both our were starting to Yeah, that is that is already <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, this one, uh, like the recession and the power. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, don't um, know why. I used to know them better. It's, it's not in there. Oh, where is it? Oh, no. uh, well, uh, okay, so demand with a loss of the share. So, but the, but the main point is already classified as and comparable are yeah. closure time and yeah, it's time like same magnitude, same same similar parameters. Yeah. Oh, I think I found it. Oh. This was the new screen, this is not going to stop. Over a cluster. Oh, oh, look at that. Okay, that, that will work. Um, so the redder the worse. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Under those conditions, which are red conditions, mm -hmm. 
if you were so punishes your Oh, um, you remember the punishments you are? Uh, right. Yeah, similar to the other one. Because that's hard to get in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's a lot of Yeah. 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 Well, okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Of I will look into the, the, the data just to combine all this. Yeah. Because there's some problems. I will tell us later. Uh, the link will not expire, right? The link. They should, it should not expire. Okay. Expire. But I mean, not in one hour. Right? No. <laughs> not, not, in, <laughs> not in a month. <laughs> Maybe not even ever. <laughs> we have infinite Google space. It's basically like we we'll also do a fast turn around, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I want other targets. Sure. So, so uh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, there's another year of graces, so it's your chance. Really? Yes. I thought we're going to be uh, amounted like on this last semester. Like this is this will be like the very last semester. Oh uh, maybe yeah, the last or the one before last. So okay. Yeah. Oh. It's not, it's not long before it goes away. Yeah. But then, then there will be also this. And then there will be a photo. So that's going kind to of be easy. Yeah. Yeah. This is fair. Yeah. <laughs> Global sanction is always a hot topic. We are super ignore it. Yeah, and we have to explain. We have to explain. Something was fishy. I'm <laughs> <laughs> 
ね。ちょっと見たかった。で、ちょっと。で、ちょっと。で、ちょっと。で、ちょっと。で、ちょっと。で、ちょっと。で、ちょっと。で、ちょっと。で、ちょっと。で、ちょっと。で、ちょっと
I think I'm just going to go to the next slide. 
No, 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 no. I, I, I might be able to actually call it later. Hi. Oh, stop there. Okay. Hi. Yeah, so is Haley there? I, I can't remember. I only, I only have a quick thing. Hi. Oh, you're gonna make a dinner? Oh, wow. wow, look at you. You are epic. You are epically awesome. And Okay. Ah. What is what is that stand that thing all the castle? Yeah. Wow. I feel like I'm inside the house. I feel like a princess in a castle. Ooh, beautiful. 
before. Wow. Look at all the stuff he had in the book of Testament. Whoa, that was brave. I'm trying to put it back my harder. I'm trying to put them back. Okay, Kaylee, Kaylee. You appear to be busy. I will try to call you. It's going to be way later, though. It's going to be like 9 30 at night or something. Like that. Okay, I'll, I'll call you later. Bye. Yeah, do we have a program yeah. somewhere? Yeah. Well, I can get it online. Program. Yeah, that is one. So I need to log into, into the Zoom as well, I guess. Oh, really? Okay, I didn't notice that. <laughs> I was hiding on the stage. <laughs> Never thought about that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Are we also um I think so. Are we also um small dinners? Are we moderating the last discussion? Part? Also for the virtual one or I'm not sure. Maybe they want somebody to keep the virtual moderation. I don't know. I'll check it. Oh, check. Um, get out of full screen. Okay. Ah.
I think you don't. Uh, I if I check it, uh, no, that was a uh, Thank you so much for inviting me. So, yeah, should I virtually yeah, share the discussion? Yeah, for uh, so I should just stay here and then just keep an eye on the Slack yeah. again. Yeah. 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 Do we have a, do we have a, a, a Slack? I don't think so, yeah. For the last day? Maybe you can make one channel for final. So, how do we make a channel? I am making like X. Yeah. And then, maybe yeah. Name. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Yeah. And learning uh, the challenging things from the uh, like hey, on that. For the last
But I understand it's just a technical device. Well, I mean, it's more stuff. 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 It's more Yeah, don't kill yourself. <laughs> Okay. You or what? Um, you want to? Hello, everyone who are already here. I know we had a very short lunch break, so we've decided to extend the start time to one forty-five. So you have a little bit more time to mingle and do whatever you have to. Conference reflections and panel discussion. <laughs> Did I create it so that people can see? I wasn't sure. Okay, otherwise, just maybe you can delete it and override it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Just a quick reminder, we're starting at 1.45, so five minutes from now.
creo que es que se puede hacer 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 que se puede
that was planned to celebrate, celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Gemini Observatory. Of course, the universe had other plans, but I'm delighted to be here today, this week, in person, and it's nice to be out, uh, at least some of us getting to in-person um, conferences again. So the, the survey was a huge, G-Class was a huge team effort, but I'd like in particular to acknowledge the contributions of Adam Muzzin, who is now a faculty member at York University. And the silver lining of the two-year delay is that I'll also be able to tell you some hot off the press results from um, G-Class's daughter survey, Go Green, um, today. So we've known for a long time that at redshift zero, uh, cluster galaxies are much more likely to be quenched than field galaxies. So the, the, the um, green squares you see there are observations, cluster, um, cluster galaxies, the quenched fraction, and the orange triangles are the quenched fraction in the field. However, it is very difficult for models, models of all kinds, they struggle. I'm showing sure one of the models in a, by a green line. Models struggle to match the quench fraction of cluster galaxies, of, of satellite galaxies. As you can see by the, it's indicated there by the um, black arrow. Let's we'll get that on the screen anyway. Indicated there by the black arrow, um, the models overproduce the number of, of quenched galaxies, and this is a particularly a problem at lower stellar mass. So one of the things we can try to do is go to higher redshift, try to measure quenching over a, a longer period of time to get some insight into what might be going on. There's clearly something lacking in our fundamental understanding of the physics of how galaxies quench in um, dense environments like clusters. And that's where G-Class comes in. G-Class was a spectroscopic survey of 10 rich clusters at about redshift one with um, the GMOS instruments. And um, what's really fantastic about Gemini is that there are two telescopes, one in the north, one in the south, um, but also the GMOS instrument on, on both of those telescopes is pretty much a clone. And so we're able to make quite homogeneous measurements, um, both in the North and in the Southern hemispheres. Here is the sample of 10 clusters that were selected from the Spitzer Sparks infrared survey. And GMOS allowed us to get very high spectroscopic completeness. We got uh, in total about 500 members across those 10 clusters. Um, and, and for its time when we started this survey, I mean, people at Redshift 1, they were studying single clusters at a time. So but to be able to get observations of so many galaxies in 10 clusters was really quite a step forward and allowed us to, to study some, some more subtle effects that you just can't do with a single cluster. Now, GMOS offers um, Northern sh Shuffle, which is a rather clever way of doing sky subtraction. And this means um, you can make observations with much shorter slits than you can with a, a regular multi-object spectrograph. And that means you can pack in many more high priority targets, potential cluster members onto one mask than, than you can with other uh, multi-object spectrographs. I'm showing you the an example on the right from GMOS, these are real masks. There are 52 slits on that mask, and on, in the middle, a real mask from Keck Elwes. And so you can see that with GMOS, you can get an efficiency of more, more, more than four times um, what you can with a regular spectrograph. And that makes uh, GMOS a really efficient redshift machine. So GMOS was quite a large project. It was uh, about 222 hours. Um, and we had eight allocations of time. And we did this before Gemini offered large and long programs. So we're actually very fortunate 
um, that G-Class was supported consistently by the US and the Canadian tax, and we're very appreciative for that, um, that they supported us all through those years. As I said, it's a, a survey of 10, uh, 10 clusters, and they range in redshift from about 0.86 to about 1.34, about 50 members uh, per cluster. And in addition to the GMOS spectroscopy, we also went and got uh, a lot of multi passband photometry. We have 12 passbands uh, to pretty homogeneous depth for each of those 10 clusters. Um, when we were designing Go Greenwell, which I'll talk about in a minute, the, the highest um, five redshift clusters became part of the Go Green. Um, and so we were able to go back and get even deeper observations later of those highest redshift five. So what did, what did we learn? Well, we learned um, that even at redshift one, the environment strongly alters the quenched fraction of galaxies. What you're seeing here is a cluster stellar mass function on the left and the field stellar mass function on the right. Black is all galaxies, red is, is quenched galaxies and blue is star forming galaxies. And you can see that there's a, a significant population of quenched galaxies in those redshift one clusters. Now, at the time we started this survey, there were quite a few papers that had been published um, uh, claiming a reversal of the star formation rate density in clusters. In other words, those papers were claiming um, that there was a, a higher fraction of, of star forming galaxies in clusters relative to the field. And with this wonderful uh, Gemini spectroscopy, we were able to show that that was just not the case, at least not for this sample of clusters. We we're also able to measure the amount of star formation that's going on in the clusters. Um, and we were able to uh, measure that about 45% of the star forming galaxies, which would normally be forming stars in the field, have actually been quenched uh, by the cluster environment at this redshift. I'll come back to what we think is doing the quenching at the end of my talk. So while we measured a high quenched fraction of galaxies in these clusters, um, we found that the galaxy scaling relations don't actually depend very much on environment at redshift one. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So what you're he seeing here is um, specific star formation rate plotted as a function of radius um, with distance from the cluster center increasing to the right all the way out to the, the field there on the extreme right. And the, di the different colored lines, each of those colors is uh, for, different, for different stellar mass. So you can see that the specific star formation rate does indeed depend on stellar mass. The lines are of different values, um, but they're pretty much flat. They're pretty much independent of environment. So specific star formation rate is a function of stellar mass, but lower stellar mass galaxies have higher specific star formation rates but it really doesn't appear to depend very much on environment at all. Another thing that people commonly plot is D4000, the 4000 angstrom break. Uh, here you see it plotted on the top for quiescent galaxies and below for star forming galaxies. And again, as a function of, of stellar mass. Again, we see that the 4000 angstrom break, it does depend on stellar mass. It's a um, stronger break for higher stellar mass galaxies, those galaxies are older, um, but the lines are pretty flat. There's very little dependence on environment. So here I've plotted the mass size relation, clusters on the left, the field on the right. Um, again, red is quiescent, blue is star forming, and um, the, the um, black lines are um, best for scaling relations from 3D HST in the field. And we've taken the same lines and just overlaid them on um, the cluster galaxies. And you can see that actually um, they're pretty much, they're, they're pretty well fit by the field scaling relations. Now there's a little bit 
of difference, we actually found that um, cluster galaxies are about 20% 20, 20 smaller um, than field galaxies at the same redshift. Um, but it's not a big difference. The mass size relation is, is almost identical between the cluster and the field. So again, not a big environmental effect. Um, another key finding that is that we found post-starburst galaxies to be very common in clusters at redshift one, and, and they likely represent some, a, a key rapid, rapidly quenching transition population. And I'll, again, I'll show you what I mean. Here you see the fraction of post-starburst galaxies, again, as a function of um, cluster center distance and with the lines, each different color representing a different stellar mass. Out in the field, there's only a few percent of post-starburst galaxies, a small fraction. Um, but in clusters, there, there can be 10% of more post-starburst galaxies. And certainly as you go to lower stellar mass, um, there seem to be more starburst, uh, post-starburst galaxies. When we plotted the post-starburst galaxies, they're, they're here in green, on uh, the size-mass relation, we almost couldn't believe our eyes. They fell almost perfectly in this intermediate location between where the quiescent and the star-forming galaxies lie. Um, and not only were they intermediate in size, they were on also intermediate um, in their morphology properties. If you look in the, the inset there, that's showing Sursix parameter. And um, the, the uh, green point is the is the mean the mean value for those starburst galaxies, and it falls again intermediate between um, the value for star forming galaxies and the value value for quiescent galaxies. So it seems, um, based on this evidence, that the post starbursts are just gradually fading; they're, they're quenching from the outside in, and the and the disks are fading. I don't have time to go through all of the findings today, but I have summarized the papers we've got, uh, including the three um, survey description papers. We've got a total of 20 publications so far from G class, and I've summarized them there so you can, by topic, so you can go and take a look if you're more interested in learning more of the details. So I'd like to spend the last few minutes um, of my talk describing Go Green. Go Green, as I said already, is the um, daughter survey of G class. And this is a 530 hour large and long program, which took observations between 2014 and 2019, a total of 10 semesters. Because um, of the deployment of the red sensitive. Hamamatsu detectors, we were able to push out a little bit in redshift to 1.5. And this was a spectroscopic survey of 26 clusters and groups between redshift 1 and 1.5. And again, going back and targeting those five highest redshift G class clusters, but being able to observe their members to um, lower stellar mass. Again, a large team involved. You can see the names. There are many um, graduate students and postdocs have contributed to the success of Go Green. Um, so I have plotted the um, 26 systems that are in green, and the tracks are the predicted evolution from redshift one uh, to the local to redshift zero. And you can you can see that what we've got is a quite a large range in halo mass. We've got things that are going to evolve into groups at low redshift. We've got some systems that are going to evolve into Virgo mass clusters. We've got some that are going to evol evolve into coma mass clusters. And then we've got some that um, would be expected to evolve into uh, clusters of, of higher mass than coma by redshift zero. So we had a, a we, um, had a fairly large range in redshift of systems. We had a fairly large range in halo mass. And we also tried to get as large a range of stellar mass as possible, because remember at the beginning I said, um, the quenching effects become particularly noticeable as you push down in stellar mass. The um, 
figure on the right shows all the spectroscopically confirmed galaxies that we have. The red ones are quiescent uh, galaxies, and we've managed to push down uh, their spectroscopically complete to about a stellar mass of 10 to the 10 at this redshift. We also went and got uh, a lot of multi-pass band imaging. We have, again, pretty homogeneous multi-pass band imaging for the sample for most clusters uh, in about 14 bands. So this is the fundamental result. This one slide uh, summarizes the um, largest surprise that we got from Go Green so far. Um, and we find, I'll give you cut to the punchline, that um, environmental quenching, satellite quenching at redshift one is mass dependent, and that's fundamentally different than at low redshift. I'll explain again what I mean by that. So when folks are trying to um, quantify the difference between quenched fractions in two different environments, they also all, they often use this um, measure called the quenched fraction excess. And as it sounds like, it just means the excess amount of quenching in one environment relative to another. In this case, um, the excess amount of quenching that occurs in clusters relative to the field. The black points are the green points, and the purple line is the measurement made at redshift zero from Sloan. And it's really a tail of two stellar masses. On the left, you see um, the measurement at, at, for stellar masses less than 10 to the 10.5. Um, the quench fraction we measure at redshift one is almost identical to the quench fraction we measure at redshift zero. Um, the relationship is pretty much flat. There's no dependence of the quenching on stellar mass. However, above stellar mass of 10 to the five, it's a very different story. There's a tilt to the relationship. It's no longer flat, there's a tilt, and that's very different from a redshift zero. A redshift zero, the purple line is still flat. But here we, me we measure a dramatic um, tilt to that relation. What we're measuring is a dependence of the quenching that is mass dependent. It's dependent on the stellar mass. And again, as I show, I'm showing there, at high stellar mass, that relationship is fundamentally different. Um, than is measured at, at low redshift. And that's the primary result we have so far from Go Green. Now, I'd like to know what's doing the quenching, wouldn't you? Um, this is a piece of work led by Devontae Baxter. He's a graduate student at UC Irvine. And um, what he did in this paper is he modeled the uh, quenching time scales of the cluster galaxies. So you have quench fraction, the y-axis, stellar mass along the x-axis of the left panel, and cluster-centric distance along the right, on the, along the x-axis of the right panel. And you found that you could not match the green, -green observations, the green observations here are in green. You couldn't match the green observations with any quenching timescale model that assumed a constant um, constant quenching time scale as a function of, of stellar mass. So we've got, we've got time scales assumed from zero to three giga years. Those are where the color points are. And the data just doesn't fit any of those models. However, when you assume the model, uh, or when you, when you adopted a model assuming a mass dependent quenching time scale, you found that that matched the observations quite well. So the model that he's assuming, the best fit model, is, is, is those um, black points you see, and they match the green observations much better than any of the colored lines. So here we have quenching time scale plotted against stellar mass. And the black line is the quenching model that I just showed you in the last slide. And then we make a little correction for pre-processing, pre you have to make a little correction. So the first thing to note is it's not 
A flat relationship, as I just said, the quenching time scale is a function of stellar mass with um, high, high stellar mass galaxies having shorter quenching time scales and low stellar mass galaxies quenching more slowly. We make a little correction because of, of pre-processing just to allow for the fact that some of those galaxies that ended up in the clusters fell into groups first. So we have to um, make an adjustment for the fact that those galaxies got quenched in groups before they fell into clusters. And the process that fits best is this um, gray line. That gray line is a cold gas depletion timescale prediction. And so what it's saying is the best fit to the observations, the red line, is starvation. This analysis is pointing to starvation as the dominant mechanism causing um, satellite quenching. So galaxy falls into a halo, it gets cut off from cosmological accretion, it keeps forming stars, it just burns through the fuel it brought with it, and when it's burned through that fuel, it starves and it quenches. That's the conclusion of this paper. Again, I've run out of time, but I've summarized um, that we've got, so I think it's 12 papers now from, from Go Green. We're still working on the data, we're still analyzing it, um, but I've summarized them there by topic if you're interested in, in, in reading more. And this is my last slide. We have um, public released all of our observations, fully reduced images, the fully reduced spectroscopy, and um, a number of advanced data um, analysis catalogs with things like stellar masses and colors and emission lines and all that good stuff. That's all available from the link you see there and um, all of the details are in the 2021 uh, Bala Riddell paper. And thank you very much. Stop there. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Uh, we have some time for questions. So you show the cluster galaxies are 20% smaller than the field galaxies. Can you quote the significance of that? And if that's a significant, can you attribute to that kind of tighter truncation due to the cluster potential? So it's a good question, what causes it? Um, it, it, it it could well be. Um, it, it could well be. It's possible it's a combination of effects. Um, there's a, a later paper, and I forgot to say that work was led by Jasmine Mathieu, who's now a postdoc at Texas A&M. Um, there's a later work that, that suggests it may be due to RAM pressure stripping. Indeed, um, she has a 2021 paper that I didn't have time to, to discuss today, but thank you for the question. Have you had a chance to measure the significance of 20% is significant or is it within the spectral error? Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. So is that 20% reduction in size, is that significant? How many sigmas? I can't remember. I mean, not greatly. It's, it's, it's significant, but, but not a huge result. Um, I can't remember offhand how many sigma. Sorry, it was a couple of years since that paper came out. Hi, uh, great talk and great data. So uh, uh, I was wondering if you could put up the, the, the time scale of, of the satellite quenching as a function of, yes. So I, I'm probably missing something here. I'm, I'm imagining that if, if starvation is the cause of quenching, then the specific star formation rate for the low mass galaxies is higher. Wouldn't they burn faster through their gas and quench faster? Or is that uh, maybe it's the pre processing? On so uh, the, the low mass galaxies are on the left here. So the, their quenching time scale is longer than the high mass galaxies. Should, should, I'm, I'm, naively, I would think that they would, if, if, they're, if they have higher specific star formation rates, then they would burn through their remainder remaining gas. that's assuming they all bring the same amount of gas with them so they have low they have lower gas fractions as well so there's an assumption here about how much gas a galaxy of a particular stellar mass brings with it when it falls into the halo i think that's the missing link and they're they're okay 
Okay, cool. Yeah, a bigger potential well can bring more gas, right? I see. We have a question on Slack. Joel Rudiger is asking, what role do the go green results leave for REM pressure stripping in quenching galaxy in, in quenching cluster galaxies? Can those results put an upper limit on the fraction of galaxies quenched by that mechanism? Um, so first of all, RAM pressure stripping is, is likely to become increasingly important as a quenching mechanism as we move to lower stellar mass. As the clusters you know, build, build, build up their, um, the density of the gas in their, in their potential wells as they go larger halos and the, and the potential wells become deeper, RAM pressure stripping at low redshift is likely to be an increasingly important effect in the quenching. So there, there's room, this is the, all I'm saying is this is the dominant mechanism that this analysis is finding at redshift one. Well, thank you very much for that. Let's thank Julian again. So uh, next we'll have another invited talk from James G uh, from Yonsei University. And he's gonna be talking about probing dark matter of galaxy clusters at also red, uh, redshifts greater than one uh, using GMOS spectroscopic and HSTIR imaging data. All right. I'd like to begin also thanking the organizers of the workshop, GSM 2022, for putting this wonderful workshop together in this particularly difficult time. Also, I thank the audience for still sticking around. So before I go to introduction, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution from my grad students in my group called the Young, standing for Yonsei Observable Universe Group, in particular, the work that I'm presenting today is part of the PhD thesis by Jin Hyuk Kim, who graduated this year and is now a postdoc at Oxford University. Because the audience has such a broad spectrum of interest, probably it's not too bad why we need to study hydrogen gallus clusters in terms of cosmology. So gallus clusters are the largest gravitationally bound objects in the universe as such. They have been used to quantify the matter content of the universe. So if you examine the abundance in the local universe, you can obtain this elongated banana. The reason why we have this elongated banana is the abundance is function of two parameters. One is matter density, and the second is the power spectrum normalization. However, if you add sample from the high G, you can break the degeneracy, and you can uh, tremendously shrink the size of the banana and you can enable the precision cosmology. Also, sometimes when you find very unusual galaxy cluster, very mass cluster, that can rule out certain cosmologies. So this is a little bit old, but very important result by Bakul and Fan in the year 1998. So y-axis is the abundance of galaxy cluster as a function of redshift. At the time, there was a cluster called MS1054 at redshift 0.8. Given the mass, that existence cannot be reconciled with the matter-dominated universe. So this is pretty backward because 1998 is a few years before people talk about dark energy from the supernovae observation. And sometimes, Extremely massive clusters at extremely high redshift can be a good ascended check whether or not lambda CDM is the most feasible model. So here we can see what we call the exclusion curve. That means uh, if you uh, have a cluster mass that lies above this line, then there should be uh, some trouble with our lambda CDM. So fortunately in this case, there's no serious tension even by these high risk clusters. But when you have more high risk samples, it's certainly something you can test to check 
our lambda CDN model. Oops. Okay, so to enjoy such a gain with the high dash clusters, the most important thing is, of course, the mass, exact accurate mass of the cluster. As you know, well, there are several pathways to the mass. One can use the richness, loss dispersion, Sunyai Jeldovich effect, luminosity, also temperature from the X rays. But as you know, that clusters at high Z, they are like the teenagers, they are never relaxed. You cannot assume hydrostatic equilibrium. So that means they are uh, not useless, but they need to be calibrated with a proper tool. And here I'm claiming that gravitational lensing is the most useful tool to calibrate those massive boxes. So here's a one example of a fantastic job by uh, Kim Sherrick at all. 2021, x axis ratio, y axis is the Zunyavi Jeldovich detection significance. So you can tell the uh, relation changes as a function of the ratio. So next, I'm going to talk about our class sample and the data we used. We used 42 galaxy clusters from uh, ratio. Uh, between 0.8 and 1.8. And that distribution is shown by this solid histogram. They come from many different surveys, article, near infrared, X-ray, and Sinyavich surveys. And 32 is a pretty large photoprocessor sample. And the sample size is comparable to the largest one-based programs such as uh, CCCP, a Ranger Giant program, and the Locus, etc. Okay, just for the record, this is the list of our 42 clusters. And let me know the list include your favorite target. Lensing can be measured by imaging data, but interpretation is enabled by high quality spectroscopic survey data. That's where Gemini which data contribute. So we utilize the published spectroscopic catalogs as well as our own uh, Gemini data obtained by KGMT program. They allow us to map the galaxy distribution in the clusters, and they allow us to also select the source galaxies. And we can do contamination analysis for the source selection. And finally, they provide for us dispersion, which is one of the useful mass proxies. Then I will just quickly summarize some of the important systematics. So as you, you all probably heard of, heard of, with great statistical power comes with great systematics control responsibilities. So I'm going to quote a few systematics they may matter to you. First, I like to say cluster lensing at high Z is very difficult. So in this image, I want to challenge you to find galaxy clusters. Of course, there's a very obvious one. That's a lynx nose, but the ratio of the cluster is a point about 0.6. The mass is two times 10 to 14 solar mass. It's not particularly a massive cluster, but its presence is undeniable. But here, there are two more clusters, at least, at g equal 1.2. If I ask you to find that, probably you have to scratch your head. Here is it, this is at g equal 1.22. Another one, which is the other one, is the links west at g equal 1.23. So they are really tiny, and just by looking at how thin they are, how small they are, you can sort of imagine how difficult it is to do lensing for those high G galaxy clusters. So they are distant, that means by geometry, the lensing efficiency drops by a factor of four in this particular case. And they are small, that means the source density per physical area drops. Here, it's a roughly a factor of 10 difference. And you have to rely on galaxies behind these faint galaxies. That means measurement noise increases by another factor of two. 
On top of that, clusters is growing with time. So you're looking at smaller child galaxy clusters. That means their masses are on average smaller. So ranging signal, the noise ratio drops by the same factor. So this is a link series that I showed in the previous image. And here comes HST. And without saying too much, you can tell the advantage of using high resolution images for lensing. So here, let's look at this galaxy here. The same galaxy appears very round. Here it's stretched because of lensing, but it looks round because of the PSF. However, if you do a lensing for high galaxies, you can ask the same question to the galaxy here that looks very round, but HST PSF is also finite, and that galaxy can be smeared by HST PSF that looks rounder. That means you still have to care for the PSF modeling. PSF modeling is a pretty challenging because HST orbits around Earth every 98 minutes. Depending on each location, the temperature changes. That means focus value changes. Depending on the focus, your PSF pattern changes. So if you do not correct for the PSF, every galaxy you detect will be stretched along that line. They can masquerade as a first gravitational lensing signal. The good news is that it orbits around the Earth every 98 minutes. That means if you know when and where the observation is taken, you can pretty uh, predict the knowledge of the PSF as a function of the location. Knowing PSF is one thing, but measuring shape is quite another because galaxies do not have a simple morphology, especially at high Z. They have a, a very different radio profile. They have come with their own intrinsic electricities. So you cannot drive the relation between measurable electricity and the shear. The only thing you can do is run a bunch of numerical image simulations and calibrate it. So, for example, here is input shear and here is output shear. And the departure of the sphere from the unity is a measure of your bias. So, the equilibrium community realized the importance of this test and they held the so called shear testing challenging program on a regular basis. And last such challenge happened the year, in the year 2015, and our team participated in the challenge and actually won the challenge. So here I can tell you that at least shear systematics is concerned, we are good uh, up to uh, less than 0.1%. The next systematic comes from the spherical cow, galaxy clusters are never spherical, especially at G greater than one, but we assume that they are spherical, meaning that we fit an inevitable profile, whatever uh, it looks like. So this is a model bias. Fortunately, there's a way to address this model bias because we can also measure the projected mass without assuming any projected uh, parametric form of the cluster density profile. Y axis is the parametric approach. And again, the slope indicates how much model bias matters. Given the spectacle scatter currently, we believe that model bias is consistent with one. Okay, so with these tools, we went ahead and measured the masses of all 42 high G galaxy clusters. And every cluster is a precious baby, and they, each one deserves one hour talk. But for the sake of time, I'm going to just highlight two of the most interesting clusters, also present a summary statistics. The first cluster that I want to talk about is this cluster, which has a 2106 minus 5844. The cluster was actually detected by initial SPT survey and looks pretty much round. At the time, the cluster mass was inferred to be two times 10 to 14, 15 solar mass. So that's an enormous mass. It's like a 100 kilogram baby, you know, at three year old. But given the ratio, probably the hydroscopic equilibrium assumption could have caused the bias. So you must do the analysis with the lensing and show the error between the uh, recognition analysis from the HSD data. 
It looks pretty round, consistent with the round shapes seen by SZ. But our lens analysis is based on the initial HST and our uh, in near infrared imaging data allow us to resolve three substructures. And you may say, well, how come do you believe those substructures are real? Well, here comes again the role of Gemini spectroscopic data because we can map out the cross galaxy distribution and they support the three substructures we found from the lensing. Later, we did a follow up study with the ALMA. Actually, this is a Sunyavi Jaldovich observation from the ALMA, and the ALMA found two significant peaks corresponding to the north and the southern peak. Uh, for this galaxy cluster. So the mass that we obtained is consistent with the previous SG result, but still lower than the initial X-ray based measurement. The expected abundance of this cluster is about 1.3 from the 25,000 square degree. That means the probability is about 70%. So it actually does not challenge our lambda CDM. The other interesting cluster is cluster at T1.8. So this is the highest redshift ever measured with the lensing. And you can tell this is the diffuse emission from the Chandra. Our lensing analysis show that actually this might be a merging cluster consists of two mass clumps. The lower clumps mass is about five times 10 to 14 and the south Southern cluster is uh, similarly four times 10 to the 14 solar mass. So if you confirm that it can be very interesting merging cluster at G for 1.8. The curious thing is if you add uh, two masses together, it's almost 10 to the 15 solar mass. 10 to the 15 at G for almost two. That's pretty you know big mass. However, the caveat is that the mass uncertainty is large, about 30%. So now is not the best time to claim that we have, you know, Lambda CDM is in trouble, but it's worth pursuing, uh, keep refining the, the precision of the mass measurement based on deeper observations. Okay, so here is again the exclusion curve. Here we plot every cluster we measured with the lensing, and you can tell some extreme mass clusters, they may have some boundary issues with the lambda CDM. But again, given the size of the airbus, we cannot claim that anything really seriously challenges the lambda CDM. We still have to wait and see when we shrink the airbus considerably. Another important uh, statistic that we can come up out of the 32 galaxy cluster is so called the scaling relation. So here, E is Hubble parameter, and this is mass, normalization, X ray temperature, and alpha is the slope. So if galaxy clusters are self similar, the expected slope should be three halves, 1.5. And this is our result. So the solid black line is our linear regression from the sample that we analyzed. And the, the green line here is the same kind of weak ranging study done by Hank Hoekstra, but for much low ratio to sample. And here, we find that actually the relation is very similar between the low Z and high Z. And normally consistency is good, but here I'm not too comfortable with the consistency because at G greater than one, probably the hydrosphere, the degree of hydrosphere equilibrium or departure from the hydrosphere should be different from the one in low Z. So that's a, something uh, interesting. And the last summary statistic I want to show is the mass concentration relation. Concentration parameter is defined by the billion radius of the cluster divided by the scale radius. Numerical simulations show that as you increase the mass of the cluster, concentration value drops. 
However, recent theoretical studies predict that if you go high ratio, actually the correlation disappears and at the extreme end, massive end, actually it shows uptime. That has been considered remarkable and well accepted in the lensing also cluster community. But our observation shows that actually the mass concentration relation still shows a negative slope consistent with the, the prediction at the low G ratio. Mass concentration relation is very sensitive to cosmological parameters or the, also the shape of the power spectrum. So the difference between the observation and the theory is pretty significant and also interesting. But again, this is not the best time to question the lambda CDM because the simulation, and body simulation, we know that they are not complete. The baryon physics, Asian feedback, fellow feedback, they are all implemented through so-called the question of a subgrid physics. So unless we are at the stage to implement the baryon physics, it's too early to call this frequency as a problem for the lambda CDM. So here is my summary. While you are reading it, I will take a question. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk again. Uh, questions? And while people are thinking, I have one to ask. So you were mentioning reducing the error bars and the mass measurements. So you know, going forward, what are the, what are the methods you could use to reduce the error bar and get tighter mass constraint with weak lensing. So the currency in lensing is the source density. Usually we are talking about 100 galaxies per square arc minute, but that will increase if you increase the depth of the observation. So the normal typical uh, orbit that we use is uh, about five orbits per filter. So if you increase that, probably we can have uh, you know, 150, even 200 galaxies per square per minute, they will shrink the statistical error significantly. Also, general observation will help. Here, we still rely on the foreground photometry to select the background galaxies, but inevitably, they will include the foreground, also the cluster members, but the generalized spectroscopic data will give us better knowledge of the optimal color range, also the magnitude, the range to increase the purity of the background galaxies. Well, my last good question. This is on if you can hear me. Uh, great talk, James. It was Thank a you. Very, very good talk. Um, how do you account for the lensing signal along the line of sight? These are galaxy clusters above redshift one. Um, and of course, there's lensing all the way along that line of sight. How do you take, how do you allow for that in your estimates of the masses? Yeah, that's very really good point. Every actually for the every landing point, you can ask that question and challenge the speaker. That's a concern if you have low G galaxy clusters because high G galaxy clusters are harder to find, right? So that's a concern if you do landing on it for the low G clusters. But for high G galaxy clusters, if there's a low G foreground, it should be very really obvious, right? Your spectroscopy survey or the optical image will tell the presence of those low G interlopers. Of course, the question I and mean, the situation will change if there's even higher ratio, like, like a G equal two or higher, then there's nothing we can do very much. Okay, thank you. I had one last question. Um, obviously, you know, collecting area and angular resolution is really important. Do you think there's hope of using adaptive optics too? Definitely, yeah. So, viewers. Like this, I learned how to pronounce that instrument in this workshop. So Guillermo's will be a fantastic job. The field of view is not the optimal, but that works for high clusters because the angular extent is a little bit larger than one arc minute by one arc minute. So if you have a two arc minute by two arc minute field of view and have a fully to half amount of like a one plane one arc second, I think it would you know do a fantastic job. Right. I guess the the other piece that's going to be challenging is the point spread function. And 
that stability across the field? Of course, yeah. Position dependent point function, how nasty that position may be, you know, that's the, actually the key question. Okay, let's thank uh, James again. So the next talk will be a remote talk, a contributed talk from Scott Chapman. Hi, Scott, can you see me? Hello, yeah, I can, thanks. Uh, from Dalhousie University. And he's gonna be talking about the Gemini follow-up of massive protoclusters at rich of greater than four from the South Pole Telescope Survey. Please take it away. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I'm uh, very sorry I couldn't be there in person, uh, but I'm happy to be able to attend the meeting and uh, present some of our work and uh, elucidate a bit how Gemini has helped us uncover the properties of uh, some of these very uh, early uh, cluster, proto-cluster systems discovered by the South Pole Telescope. And what you're looking at on this title page is uh, our, our firstborn our, and something of a crown jewel in the sample. SPT 2349, which I'll go into uh, later with the Gemini observations. Uh, but ALMA observations on the right confirmed the South Pole Telescope uh, point source uh, consisted of about 35 ultra-luminous galaxies. And uh, our attempts to simulate the core region showed that a, a good number, 20 of those all uh, very quickly merged together in a gigantic mega merger building a brightest cluster galaxy. Um, so the challenge then is to figure out uh, the, the properties of these galaxies and what the evolutionary history is. Oops, how do I advance slides? I, um, I just need to figure out how do I advance my slide? Was that me doing it? Great. Okay, so uh, by way of a brief introduction, uh, uh, for rich galaxy clusters at redshifts say less than around 1.5, there are, we have uh, wonderful robust methods to detect and characterize these systems. Um, a classic observational approach that uh, Gemini is, uh, has done a lot of work on is just identifying the red and dead galaxies at the cluster red sequence. Um, but ultimately, you want to measure that uh, hot X-ray uh, gas in the from the intercluster medium, either directly in X-rays or uh, through the scattering of CMB photons in the seniev zeldovich effect. Now, if you go to higher redshifts, then uh, both the detectability uh, and uh, also just the establishment of the ICM itself mean that it's not uh, so trivial anymore to just define what the progenitors of these massive clusters are. Um, in simulations, you can certainly trace uh, the evolution of clusters and find what the protoclusters look like. Uh, observationally, you can sort of search for protoclusters. We can search for overdensities of galaxies in any case, but figuring out uh, what their mass scale is and what they evolved to is a very difficult enterprise. Um, so there are various ways you can search for the, the overdensities on the, at, at say, redshifts greater than two, where uh, finding the classical signatures of the cluster are more difficult. Um, blind spectroscopic or even uh, photometric surveys for, for galaxies like Lyman Brake galaxies have identified uh, large numbers of overdensities on the sky. And um, people have also targeted uh, specific uh, rare objects like quasars and radio galaxies. And then uh, more recently, people have started to target uh, their fields around very bright submillimeter galaxies as, as beacons of rare massive halos that might uh, signpost protoclusters. Uh, another theme that's uh, uh, recently come together is uh, whether these protoclusters might be traced by ultra luminous dusty galaxies, whether they can be a useful tool in identifying and studying these systems. I show a nice cartoon here by uh, uh, Caitlin Casey from a few years ago, um, showing different phases of cluster evolution from the very earliest protocluster phase, uh, where there's essentially just a, a inside out collapse of the core, uh, BC, forming BCG still very active. And then as you go to 
uh, pro more moderate protocluster epochs, uh, you get more activity along the filaments uh, and the, the central BCG is already forming. And then we know what happens in clusters later on. Um, it's worth noting that protoclusters uh, are uh, huge on the sky, and we do have tools to characterize that uh, now. Uh, simulations have shown that they, the amount of material collapsing into a coma class cluster spans about a degree on the sky, or it shifts two or three. Uh, with hyper supreme cam, you're seeing a Lyman alpha density map uh, here of a, one, a protocluster discovered by Lyman break galaxies by Chuck Steidel. And you can see that the, the Lyman alpha. Uh, emitters trace uh, a very a filamentary structure in projected 2D over this degree scale. Uh, but our uh, submillimeter surveys of over this region have shown that indeed this, uh, this structure is actually traced by uh, ultra-luminous galaxies at this redshift 3 epoch. Um, so the South Pole Telescope uh, survey is 2,500 square degree millimeter survey aimed at uh, Sunny of Zeldovich and cosmology, but discovered uh, some bright emissive sources along the way here, or about a hundred bright thermal dusty sources that it found. Um, so it was fantastic at finding clusters from the Sunny of Zeldovich uh, effect, which it was designed to do. These are shadows on the CMB, negative point sources in some sense. And those uh, spanned redshifts up to about 1.5, these, uh, the SPT survey that's been completed is the, the black squares. And it also found these dusty emissive sources, the majority of which are, are very clearly, uh, when followed up with ALMA, uh, strong galaxy galaxy lenses uh, of, of submillimeter galaxies being lensed by factors of, uh, of five to 20. Um, but about 10% of them don't uh, show this kind of a signature at all when you follow it up with ALMA. And in fact, show uh, that that sources uh, many what appear to be unlensed galaxies contributing to that one SPT source. Um, and when you look at the total flux density in the infrared, that amounts to star formation rates of over 10,000 solar masses per year. So there are the immense amount of star formation in these, in these uh, candidate uh, protocluster cores. Uh, so I showed you my uh, the first of this that we found, uh, 2349, it's a ridge of 4.3. Um, it was the most obvious one in some sense that popped up uh, and was uh, uh, ELMA observations very quickly gave us a sense that this was really a big massive system in the core region itself. There are about 20 ELMA sources. Um, you can see their emission lines in C plus here. Uh, that give uh, something that looks semi-virialized in the core. And then as you get further out into the outer sources, you get outlying halos uh, following in presumably. And there are, as I said, about 10% uh, of these things uh, are protocluster candidates. And these are the, the nine best candidates we have uh, that are in varying degrees of, of follow-up ranging from redshifts four to seven. Um, so the key result is basically that, that there's a huge amount of concentrated star formation uh, in this system, uh, about 17,000 solar masses per year in all those 35 odd uh, ultra luminous galaxies and uh, a very high density uh, of star formation rate in the core. Um, and then when we use their properties to characterize the halo, it's uh, essentially the most massive halo we've kinematically observed at this high redshift. And uh, it looks nominally like a progenitor of the coma cluster. Here's coma and the tracks with redshift of its evolving progenitor. And here's our, our source measured kinematically. Or, um, so the key uh, with Gemini I wanted to uh, focus on here is uh, characterizing the galaxies in the in the in this system and other SPT systems. So uh, a student of mine, Kaya Rotterman, uh, uh, published a nice thesis, a PhD thesis paper, uh, characterizing the properties of of all the central core galaxies using Gemini. Uh, and uh, IRAC uh, multiband imaging, GRI, K, and the IRAC bands, and we're able to detect the majority of the core sources and put them on a, a plot of star formation rate versus stellar mass with SED fitting giving us the stellar mass. And uh, surprisingly, they, uh, they don't look like starbursty galaxies at this epoch. They look like typical field galaxies, so their star formation rates are about what you expect for the, the huge 
relatively large stellar masses that uh, she characterized. And even there seemed to be a few quenched uh, galaxy examples here. Uh, so that was a very uh, powerful use of the, the deep, very deep Gemini imaging together with IRAC that we need to actually detect and characterize these galaxies. And then uh, the key is then bringing that stellar mass together with the gas mass and dynamical masses from rotation curves uh, for, from ALMA. So we have all the different components here we can compare uh, to the total of uh, halo mass of the system and see how they contribute. Um, so the stellar mass appears to be uh, within errors. Uh, it does appear to be more substantial than the gas mass that's built up from this characterization. And then the two together, of course, are constituents of the of the of the total halo mass. Um, so that's another uh, a key way that the Gemini uh, data has really complemented the ALMA analysis, and uh, has shown that about sixty six percent of the of the halos are dark. Uh, another key breakthrough with uh, from the Gemini data again is uh, searching in the uh, wider field of these SPT systems for overdensities of Lyman break galaxies. And in this 2349 system, uh, you can see the composite RGV from GMOS, which are basically the Lyman break galaxy dropout, and the two redder filters that, uh, at redshift four is GRI. And uh, a clear overdensity was seen in the core region and a moderate overdensity in the larger field. Uh, but uh, a good population of redshift four candidate uh, galaxies to uh, explore spectroscopically in the wider field. And five, and five in the wider field have already been confirmed by GMOS spectroscopy. Um, but uh, the overdensity doesn't knock your socks off, uh, except maybe in the very core region. And it, uh, well, it would classify as an overdensity on the sky by some metric. Uh, it seems to be much easier to identify these things from the emissive uh, dusty thermal sources in uh, in the millimeter wave survey. A, uh, a more prominent example is then another one of the systems also at redshift 4, 0457. Uh, again, the Gemini imaging allowing us to do the Lyman break galaxy analysis and finding it's about three times more overdense in the core and then moderately overdense over the wider field again. Um, the interesting thing about this, the, the large number of sources in the core, uh, in these are comparing these two systems. So these are the orange is in 2349 are all ELMA sources and the green are ELMA sources at the time in this new system. And these are the expected uh, uh, gas masses you would measure from all the Lyman break galaxies. It normally seems to be a bit of a gap in the luminosity function of the system between the bright ELMA sources and the fainter uh, Gemini identified sources. So it's quite interesting. And then finally, one more highlight system I wanted to show is 0303, which we're just, just getting to now, uh, just starting the ELMA data is coming in to characterize this system. Um, but we have the Gemini data already, and together with IRAC, it's uh, been very powerful for identifying all the counterparts for the ELMA sources found in this protocluster and uh, characterizing their stellar masses as before. So, um, and this one show the overdensity in the system in all all wavelengths looks like it might be more overdense than any other system. So I, I wanted to throw that out as an early prelude that this may be our new crown jewel once we fully characterize it. Uh, just a few more details then on what uh, we've learned from the Gemini data characterizing the stellar masses in, uh, in 2349. Well, if we uh, look at all of the mass of all those central galaxies that are uh, destined to collapse into one brightest cluster galaxy, um, they're already uh, above 10 to the 12 solar masses in the in stellar mass. And if you compare that to redshift one uh, mass of the BCG versus the mass of the cluster, you can see that we're just off scale already. So it's formed all its stars very quickly in the BCG. And then they, when they merge together, we expect to sort of double the stellar mass. So this is pre-mega merger. This is after the mega merger hypothesized. And then even if it uh, didn't grow at all from the epoch of a redshift of about three to a redshift one, where we're making this comparison, it would still be essentially the most massive BCG of any uh, seen at redshift one. Uh, so it's, that's good evidence that we are in fact dealing likely with a redshift, or sorry, a coma class uh, progenitor here and shows an interesting formation path as well, that the, the BCG stellar mass is basically there in place, very quickly merging into one big galaxy. 
Um, another thing we've been able to use with the uh, very high quality K-band Gemini data from, uh, from Flamingos 2 along with Hubble at shorter uh, infrared wavelengths is characterize the proto BCG galaxy, uh, a very compact galaxy that was evident in the K-band already and, uh, and further evidenced in, in the HST data. So the, uh, there's a huge stellar mass present in the core, but it's very, very, very compact, like a, one of these uh, um, red nugget galaxies, but at redshift four. And the simulation shows, though, that the envelope of the dark matter halo is already uh, uh, immense uh, compared to this very compact stellar uh, core. So it somehow must evolve to fill that, uh, that big BCG uh, envelope so that you see it in stars the way you find them at redshift one. And then finally, a little cartoon-ish uh, uh, picture here of what happens. So here's the uh, the stellar mass measured from Gemini and HST and Iraq uh, uh, for all the constituent galaxies compared to a wretch of one cluster, kind of a, a mass function. And then uh, in the sort of 500 mega years, when all those central galaxies merge, you have one BCG sitting down here dominating the core and then an awful lot of continued cluster mass growth at the uh, at the larger radius. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the extent of the, the Gemini uh, uh, studies of these protocluster galaxies, but it's been tremendously useful and it's a big ongoing program that we hope hope to continue and uh, and really learn about these systems. Um, so yeah, the take home is that the Gemini has been very useful for understanding the individual cluster members and also identifying the wider field uh, over density in Lyman break galaxies. So uh, uh, that's that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, we have some time for questions. while people are thinking up their questions. I, I had one uh, related to the halo mass. I presume, I mean, obviously getting the halo mass right is important to place these systems in context. How well do you think these masses have been estimated? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. There's uh, all, all kinds of devils in the details of that, as you, as you well know, but we don't. Um... We don't really know how virilized the core region is or how far we can safely extend out our analysis and radius or anything like that for the for the kind of kinematical uh, dynamical mass estimates of the of the halo of the system um, interestingly we just found out that we were uh, approved an alma program to search for the sunny of zeldovich effect in this particular system with a, an incredibly deep uh, 90 gigahertz uh, observation searching for the SC decrement. So that would be the, uh, uh, again, wouldn't, <laughs> because of the poor understanding of the ICM at this redshift, it wouldn't be a, a, a silver bullet for nailing the cluster mass either. Um, but yeah, you pointed to the, the big difficulty in general in proto-cluster studies is what the, what the heck is the mass scale of any overdensity you're looking at. Uh, yeah, I wasn't trying to, poke holes in it and I was just curious. Oh, no, no, exactly. <laughs> no, it's, it's the most interesting question. <laughs> you like to dance around the, the fact that it's very hard, very hard to figure out what the mass scale is and therefore do anything statistical with, with a, a sample of these things. Well, my question was related, but first, thanks Scott for a great talk. But today we've seen a whole range of interesting talks that look at clusters from the nearest, today's most massive clusters, to intermediate redshifts, to the talk we heard earlier about the most massive clusters around redshift two, and now your proto clusters. And so my question is, uh, relates a bit to what the previous question, a lot of these studies appear to be sort of pushing the bounds of what classic Lambda CDM can do. What do we learn from these proto clusters at redshift four that presumably become the most massive clusters at redshift 1.8 and then coma today? Um, can you tell us a bit about your comfort level and what degree these are pushing on, um, you know, the ability of this, the standard model in essence to predict these. Well, I mean, there's no problem finding halos uh, in the standard model that, uh, that are massive enough to agree with the things we've found. Um, the issue in simulations in general is, is getting, is, 
is finding the amount of uh, bursty star formation going on simultaneously in these kind of systems. It's just a completely off scale from what the predictions were. Uh, it doesn't really break lambda CDM in any sense, uh, which is basically just the dark halos in some sense and all this baryonic stuff going on. Um, neither here nor there at some level. So I, I think it's more of the, the evolutionary understanding of clusters and brightest cluster galaxies that I think is, is getting reworked and thought, thought through from finding these kind of systems. Thanks. Let's uh, thank Scott again. Now we move to the final talk of the conference. Uh, Matthew Bayliss from the University of Cincinnati will be telling us about a decade of strong lensing cluster science with Gemini. Yeah, thanks. And so I'm allowed to go as late as I want since, uh, you know. Yeah, there's no, there's no, no time. But... So I'm just going to go until people start filing out and then we'll. Well, no, there is a panel discussion. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. It's not, it's not All right. right. That's the boundary. Fine. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Um, as uh, uh, Suresh mentioned, this is, you know, uh, some of a summary of a summary talk of a lot of different work that's been done with Gemini over the course of effectively my entire astrophysics research career. And so I realized that entitled was a decade, and I forgot how old I was, and it's actually a lot more than that now. Uh, that'll become clear. And so all this stuff uh, that I'm talking about is um, done with, as a part of the Sloan Giant Arts collaboration. Uh, so this is kind of a current census of the people involved, the folks uh, held up in kind of orangish brown here. That's my group at Cincinnati, who uh, were all presenting work at the meeting. So hopefully you enjoyed uh, what they had to present. Uh, but we're a pretty small group, um, pretty tight knit. And we've been doing a lot of work over the years. Uh, it's all built around this idea of finding bright, strong lensing clusters in the available uh, shallow ground-based imaging. So it started with things like SDSS and RCS2, and nowadays it's evolving into things like decals and DELs. Um, and an interesting thing to note here is that we're looking for really bright giant arcs. And so we're actually pretty close to the point where we found them all, because uh, a really substantial fraction of the sky has now been imaged uh, in the optical uh, and multi-band surveys um, to depths comparable to Sloan or, or, or typically deeper. Uh, and well, yeah, the, the, regions, the, the regions that are uh, outstanding are often very sort of uh, galactic focused and it's really hard to send, find uh, extra galactic stuff out there anyway. So, so we're coming close to a census of what we'd really call all of the brightest giant arcs that are in the observable universe. And it's a pretty good sample to work with for a couple of reasons. Um, I want to first emphasize what I'm talking about when I mentioned bright. So I've picked out two things here. Uh, these are two of the brightest uh, optical giant arcs that are known. Um, one, uh, an arc of 1.7 that we found in 2010 or so, and this uh, sunburst arc, uh, which you may or may not have heard about. It's a more recent discovery, but it's actually the brightest um, optical giant arc uh, known. So both of these sources were found relatively recently. Uh, but if you ever, say, had access to a time machine and wanted to reinvent the order in which we uh, address certain astrophysical topics, you can actually go back to things like the Palomar uh, plate surveys, photographic plate surveys, and find these sources uh, in photographic imaging. So these, you don't actually need a modern multi-band wide field imaging survey to find uh, some of these amazing sources. Um, jumps out there pretty obviously. The same thing is true uh, of the sunburst darkness in the south. Um, so I think you'd have to wait until the 70s because there wasn't an all sky photometric survey or a uh, photographic plate survey of the southern sky for a little while later, but those days were before I was born. Um, and so I think it's pretty fun to think that uh, you know, we're finding things that, you know, when I say bright, are really, really exceptionally bright um, and that you can do pretty unique things with. So the backbone, uh, well, I should say, uh, why this is uh, being presented at the Gemini conference is because the backbone of a lot of the follow-up data um, was taken with Gemini. And so uh, a couple of people have already mentioned so the powers of Nod and Shuffle. Uh, Jillian in particular talked about how it's a really powerful technique. We've used uh, a lot of Gemini time over the decade plus to perform a lot of follow-up Nod and Shuffle spectroscopy of these sources because it's a really, really powerful tool and a really efficient tool. Uh, these are not super high redshift clusters, kind of typically redshift of a half, uh, but they are very dense in the sky, and they all show multiple of these, you know, extended strong lensing features, and those galaxies can be at any redshift, right? We're dealing with potential redshift desert effects here. But it turns out non shuttle spectra are really, really effective at uh, targeting tons of these things at once. Uh, we can even use modified strategies uh, where some sources get targeted for 100% of the exposure, some for half the exposure, 
that's what's kind of shown here. If you follow this really faint giant arc, you'll note that there are slits catching it at two different positions. Uh, whereas if you were to look at other stable light cluster galaxies here, you notice that only gets a slip half the time. Uh, it's a really customizable technique uh, that we've been able to use uh, to really really get effect. And uh, yeah, so I think that's really all I need to summarize there. Uh, a lot of the results have come out in a number of papers, but but just to give you a sense of what we're kind of finding, I picked out these figures from, I think this is my 2011 paper, so this is not even old news. Uh, but it's cluster cores, uh, all obvious strong lenses. And if you can see the sort of uh, horizontal red hash marks, these are all the things that we measure redshifts for. So it's typically two to three lens galaxies per field, and typically on the order of 10 cluster members, uh, which is pretty impressive considering that each one of these gets observed for something like an hour and a half. Uh, so this was an incredibly powerful follow up tool um, that, that Joe and I delivered. And then, um, where is the next slide? There it is. Uh, when I kind of uh, preparing for this talk was actually fun. I've never given a talk where I just got to look through like all the old observing programs we had and tally things up. Uh, so I was a little surprised at how many programs this was, <laughs> more than I thought. Uh, but this this is our Gemini usage to do work with these lensing clusters over the uh, the decade and a half. Uh, the very first observing program I was a part of as a graduate student is right there in 2007, uh, and then we recently were recruited for 20, uh, 2022 B. Uh, so this is, as I said, spanning pretty much my whole career. Uh, but the really cool thing is, uh, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a fair chunk of time, but you know, really, you know, we didn't mean to do like a survey level program, and this isn't really even quite at that level. Uh, but I'm really proud to say that we've been quite effective. That you know, even for especially for a small team, um, I was a little surprised, in fact, at, at uh, particularly how much uh, science this this data has produced. Um, so it's been a really great uh, data set to work with. So. Uh, there's a lot to do with strong lensing clusters, um, and I try to do as much of it as I can. Uh, broadly, it can be broken down into two things, right? You can use it to study lens background sources. We're using the lensing as a magnifying glass. And then also, it's interesting to study the lenses themselves. Um, again, I do both of these things. And so the rest of the talk is really just going to be a buffet of some of the exciting stuff that we've done and or would like to do uh, with these sources that were all fed by Gemini data. So. Um, Focusing first on the lens sources, uh, I'll pick out a really fantastic result. Uh, this is you know, a, a spectacular lens source. Uh, we're looking here at Hubble imaging, uh, but the source was characterized using data from a number of programs. Uh, just I'll you know, give a shout out here to the fast turnaround program that was actually really essential uh, to characterizing the system on a short time scale. Lots of different ways to get great Gemini data. Uh, it's a system that when you uh, correct for the strong lensing, you build a strong lens model, de-lens everything, uh, construct what that lens galaxy looks like in the source plane. Uh, this is what you see. Uh, the scale bar here, color parsec. Uh, if you're kind of squinting and holding your fingers up and guessing what sort of structures you're resolving here, the answer is that you're resolving little uh, star forming clumps of some sort that are down to about 30 parsec scales. And this is the redshift 2.5. So this is right smack in the middle of cosmic noon and probing physical scales of star formation um, that are pretty exciting. And in fact, uh, if you start, if, if you're a person that wanted to understand uh, the diversity of, of clumpy star formation in galaxies across cosmic history, you can make a plot like this. Uh, all the gray points here are tracing out basically measurements of star forming structures uh, in the local universe. So obviously we have no trouble resolving things that are nearby. Uh, but up at higher redshift, you see all these colored points. Uh, there have been a lot of measurements made over the years trying to measure the scale of star formation, how big are clumps. And you'd see these measurements of giant star forming clouds um, what you're really seeing all up here, even up here with a lot of lens systems. Uh, but what this source uh, revealed is, in fact, that there is a high, a high redshift population uh, of star forming clumps that are on the scale of something more like a 30 Doradus or smaller, the kind of stuff that we, you know, we also see locally. And you know, this is the kind of thing you'd be completely blind to, right, without, you know, one, looking through uh, a large survey to find all the exciting lens systems, and then going through the work of doing the follow-up to characterize them. Uh, just to emphasize that, you know, how much lensing helps you here. Um, this was a series of three papers, and this, this plot is from the third that uh, so uh, Heather Jane Rigby led. And uh, this paper started out as kind of a joke amongst ourselves, and we were like, yeah, sure, let's write a paper. And it's really just kind of showing um, what you would see here uh, if you, what we call, you know, uh, candleified uh, this lens galaxy. So what would it look like if it showed up in the candles heat fields with Hubble? You can imagine doing the same thing if it were in a similar deep field uh, with James Webb. Um, uh, with near cam, and in both cases, you're not resolving right clumpy star formation in any way that's 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 re re reflective of what's actually there. And so, just to drive the point home again, this is really what the lensing gives you. 
Um, this is actually an extraordinary system. I mean, it's purely coincidental, right? But if you wanted to say, start doing spatially resolved spectroscopic studies of these things, it's extraordinarily well matched to the capabilities of uh, what, I, what I used to say was an upcoming instrument, but now of course exists. Um, so really, really spectacular systems uh, that let you do really spectacular things. And again, this, this all started with, with a number of Gemini programs over the years. Uh, so this is another great system, uh, one of the highest redshift arcs that you'll find from the ground. So this is, you know, uh, basically a G-band dropout, redshift 3.6. Uh, it's exceptionally bright. Um, the data, all the data shown here uh, are, again, that hour and a half discovery Gemini data where we're saying, wow, we'd really like to just measure redshifts, redshifts of things. This galaxy was so exceptionally bright and also really in GMOS's sweet spot wavelength wise, uh, that the discovery spectrum, which is shown here, uh, was actually uh, enough to characterize most of the physical conditions of this galaxy at Regia 3.65. This is a pretty high signal to noise. Pretty much every feature you see is real. Some things not marked or intervening absorbers. Uh, you know, that's not really science I do or have time to talk about now, but you could do it with these sources as well. And what we were able to do with this thing was identify families of lines, some associated with nebular emission, those are pretty obvious, uh, others associated with winds from massive stars, uh, others still associated uh, with multi-phase ISM outflows. And um, I, I, you know, cards on the table, I didn't actually double check that this, uh, this claim uh, is, is true as of this year, but it definitely was a few years ago. But this is the best diagnosed starburst galaxy above redshift 3.5, uh, which is to say that we can measure its global properties, we can characterize the properties of hot stars, you can measure really any metallicity diagnostic and the rest of optical you like, uh, and then you can even start doing relative abundances of things like neon, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, which is pretty incredible. Uh, the other cool stuff uh, that we'd like to do with these galaxies, uh, is, or there's plenty of cool stuff I should say that's still coming. Uh, so we've seen a little bit of James Webb, a little bit of James Webb data at the, the meeting. I figure I might as well show a little bit more. That's because uh, two of these uh, sources that we initially followed up and characterized with Gemini had actually made it into an ERS program we had approved. Um, the idea here was to study two uh, unobscured UV bright star forming galaxies and then two uh, dusty similar star forming galaxies, uh, all four of which are gravitationally lensed uh, to basically perform spatially resolved diagnostics of star formation, metallicity, uh, ionization parameters, stuff like that. Uh, and so, um, yeah, this, this, uh, you know, this program uh, has already taken data uh, and really it started with Gemini. And a really cool fun fact is that the Source, uh, one of the Gemini observed sources from this program was actually the first science target observed by James Webb, which um, probably was unrelated to the fact that, that our PI is the project scientist, but I mean, didn't hurt. Uh, it was actually purely a schedulability issue. This is an ERS program. It's supposed to be observed early. Um, and if it didn't get observed in June, whenever it was, I think we had to wait like 10 months. And so anyway, yeah, so uh, the EROs happened first, but uh, in terms of targets that technically had the word science attached to them, this was the first, which is pretty cool. Um, and that data looks pretty nice. So this is our, our uh, near cam and uh, mirror imaging data of that lens source. Uh, as I said, it's a UV bright, um, unobscured star from a galaxy. And sure enough, when you go into James Webb and the infrared, you don't see a whole lot. Uh, maybe not the most uh, amazing James Webb photo to start with. But, um, but it's pretty cool that that was first. And again, Gemini is where that started. And so uh, for the last part of the talk here, I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit more about the galaxy clusters. Uh, and this is work. Um, that you know, again, uh, it's, it's a lot of us are involved with, uh, with an SGAS and it's, it's really near and dear to my heart. I wanna motivate this by saying that a star lensing sample of galaxy clusters is highly biased. Um, and that's kind of the point. Uh, the way that I like to introduce this is to say that, uh, you know, in the cluster cosmology game, often what we're trying to do is connect observations to simulations. And it's always really, really challenging. And so when you typically think of a galaxy cluster sample, you know, SPT, ACT, et cetera, uh, you think of a, a sample that's selected via some sort of mass observable. You have something that is, you know, scales with mass that you can actually observe, and that's what you count up. And so a, a mass selection, you know, is, is emulated here in this, the simulation results uh, by the sort of purple arrow and shaded region. Now, the simulation result I'm showing here is a plot of mass. So these are simulated clusters in mass plotted against the uh, strong lensing cross-section of those clusters. So basically, how good of a strong lens is that cluster? This is literally the area at a high redshift uh, source plane within which a galaxy can fall such that it is strong lens, right? It's, it's literally just uh, uh, an aerial cross section. Uh, and a strong lensing selection uh, is very different from your typical mass selection, right? Um, uh, SPT sample, you just pick all the clusters above some mass, you have some intrinsic scatter, so you don't have a hard line, but that's your sample. 
strong lensing is actually much more like this orthogonal selection on this in this sort of parameter space, right? You're basically saying, well, is there a galaxy cluster lined up with a background galaxy? That's the sort of randomness of strong lensing. Uh, and so at some level, it's a, it's a random draw, but it's actually a weighted random draw where this is, this is the exact weight, right? Um, and so uh, the, the reason this is interesting is because if you look at the values here, uh, within constant bins of, say, cluster mass, you see galaxy clusters have uh, cross sections that span orders of magnitude. So this isn't like a, a marginal weighting. This is actually quite a strong um, uh, selection on its own. And it's one that's trivial to reproduce in simulations. You can ray trace simulations. We know how gravity works. And you can produce you know, a simulated giant arc sample in the same way that we can go into a survey and find the real giant arcs. And so in some ways, this is an easier selection uh, to connect to simulations. But it, uh, you know, my purpose is going forward. I think it's just a, a new and, and innovative way to try and connect data at simulations. And that's what we, we have been doing a little of and want to do more of going forward. But just to sort of emphasize the point here, what you could do, or sort of what tests can you make and what questions can you answer. Uh, in simulations, again, this is a simulation result. Uh, you could say, uh, ask questions like, how are the strong losing clusters biased? And one really easy one to understand is that they're biased in terms of orientation, which is to say that if clusters are triaxial and we are observing them, uh, then the sort of typical cluster population will be randomly oriented on the sky because the universe is pretty random. Strong losing clusters, on the other hand, will be highly biased in terms of orientation. And that's because if you take a triaxial mass distribution, look at it along this direction, uh, you get a surface mass density that's inflated, right? And that's what produces strong lensing. And so uh, this is the kind of thing we can look for in our observed sample and uh, try to test in simulations. You can also look at uh, things like baryonic cooling physics. You know, uh, can you condense things down into the core uh, with cooling physics? So this is a simulation with a lot of runaway cooling. This is a simulation with no cooling. Uh, and you get very clear signatures uh, of uh, uh, in the simulations in terms of uh, what happens when you do one or the other. So the shaded regions here are basically telling you where you'll find giant arcs in these two scenarios. And uh, what this maps to basically is azimuthal coverage, right? If you have no cooling, you get very uh, elliptical things. You get arcs that sort of line up along some major axis. If you have lots of cooling, you get arcs that cover kind of full azimuthal ranges. These are, again, very relatively simple observables um, that we can reproduce. And because of Gemini, we have the data to do this. I'm not going to, this is more of a show-off slide. I'm not going to explain all these in detail, don't worry. Uh, but these are strong lens models uh, for here, I think it's 37 clusters uh, that Karen Schroen published uh, for us in 2020. Uh, every red curve here is a critical curve. That's a measurement of the surface mass density uh, in the clusters. And all these lens models were characterized by, um, you know, uh, due entirely uh, to the redshift knowledge uh, that we had from an extensive series of Gemini follow-up programs. Um, that same data allows us to go in and uh, do, uh, say, uh, weak lensing, strong lensing follow-up in these clusters. These are a bunch of uh, weak lensing plus strong lensing mass profile measurements for, again, uh, a cluster sample. This is from a 2012 paper with Massimonio Aguri. You can actually measure masses for these things, uh, you know, uh, out to, from the virial radius down into the core. Um, just to show that these things do fit quite nicely. The individual measurements are pretty noisy, but if you stack all the clusters together, you get a really, really beautiful measurement. And again, you can perform tests of uh, against simulations. Uh, so James G talked about mass concentration. You can measure the mass concentration relation for all clusters, but you can also measure it for strong lensing clusters and simulations because it's easy to find which clusters are strong lenses. So the shaded regions in these plots are the predicted mass concentration relations for strong lensing clusters. And all the red points are the cluster sample I just uh, showed uh, where you again can directly test these kinds of predictions. And you get results that are reasonably consistent with you know, arguably uh, slope issues. You can also measure, uh, test the predictions for what shapes galaxy clusters are. Uh, so you can take your weak lensing measurements for your strong lensing sample. You can stack them, uh, which has been done here in both uh, just randomly stacking them, taking all the weak lensing maps, putting them on top of each other. Uh, or you can uh, take the strong lensing plus weak lensing measurements uh, from the information you actually have, measure ellipticities of individual clusters, align the weak lensing maps along those ellipticities, and stack them there. That's what's shown here. And if you look kind of closely, you can see there is a very highly elliptical signal here that comes out. This lets you actually measure uh, the ellipticity of your cluster sample, which is something you can directly compare to simulations. Actually, sorry, I think this is the simulation result and this is the actual measurement. Uh, but, but really, really cool stuff uh, in terms of direct comparisons. And so um, that's all I have for kind of past results. The, the last couple of slides are just advertisements of where we're going with this. So we had a recent uh, Chandra large program approved to observe the same cluster sample 
which if you've been keeping track, uh, is now a cluster sample where we have strong lensing information, weak lensing information, and now X-ray information. And so this is going to be a great tool for building, uh, you know, sort of extending basically our ability to form tests of clusters against uh, you know, real data, real clusters, real strong lensing clusters against simulations. The X-ray data are all in. They look great. You can do great stuff with it. Hasn't happened yet, but that's what I'm working on. And then the last thing I have is somewhat of a shameless pitch uh, for what we'd like to do moving forward, uh, which is to fill out uh, our dynamical coverage of these clusters. So we have the Hubble data, we have Strong Lens models, we have Chandra data, that stuff's been um, obtained. Uh, there's actually a really nice place for us to go back to Gemini and fill in dynamical measurements, both uh, the stellar velocity dispersions of BCGs, so measuring the mass uh, or the gravitational potential on, on sort of parsec to maybe 10 parsec scales, and then doing cluster uh, velocity dispersion measurements, uh, you know, building up our cluster member numbers. Uh, and that's what we're hoping to be doing in the next few years with Gemini. Um, so we've done a lot in the past already, but there's tons more to do. Um, sorry, I'm a little bit over, but uh, that's all I had. The last slide here was just, uh, once again, advertising all the work that people uh, from my group have been showing off at the meeting. So we have like a half hour left. If you haven't talked to them, but thought you might want to, this is your last chance, please do. And thanks. Thank you very much for that nice summary talk. Uh, we have some time for maybe one or two questions. No. Uh, I actually had a question related to this spatially resolved measurements of, of your uh, lens galaxies. I mean, I guess the work that's been done is doing mass and getting uh, specific regions is what's what's the benefit of actually spatially resolving it? Can you actually see velocity structure, et cetera? You mean something like this? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So there's, I mean, a lot of different angles here. Um, from a so this is more this is no longer cosmology. This is the you know star formation, massive stars and star formation and cosmic noon kind of hat that I would have to put on to talk about it. Uh, there's a couple of big questions here. One, um, well, one simple question you could ask, which again, I'm not at all a globular cluster person. Uh, but you might say, what are these things? Are they globular clusters forming? Um, and so you could imagine going in with near spec uh, and you can actually um, can constrain and or measure individual stellar velocity dispersions of these individual clumps, you know, clump by clump within this galaxy. Um, and there's about 35 of them, I think, uh, across the entire structure. So you could actually, with one lens galaxy here, do a census of, you know, 30 parsec scale star forming clumps um, within a galaxy at redshift 2.5. Um, one of the things that we're really interested in, both here and also with uh, templates, which is the James Webb program, uh, is to really uh, address star formation um, on the physical scales in which it happens. Like this is a, a fundamental problem of galaxy surveys. They, they teach us a lot, right? But in a galaxy survey, the unit is the galaxy, but stars don't form galaxy by galaxy. Stars form giant molecular cloud by giant molecular cloud. And so one of the points of the templates program is to build, you know, literally, you know, maps, effectively data cubes of typical star forming galaxies um, on, you know, resolved down to the scales that are well below what a field survey can resolve. And so, yeah, it's understanding not just, you know, how stars form on those scales, but the diversity of star formation, the diversity of, say, ionizing photon production, uh, things like that within uh, galaxies of cosmic noon. Um, and, and so uh, there's a whole thing here that I, it's, there's no Gemini data involved. Uh, but the sunburst arc, um, this thing that I introduced at the start, is really amazing uh, because it, it's a, it, it is a Lyman continuum leaking galaxy, but it's not leaking ionizing photons. It's like spewing ionizing photons out. Um, and what we've learned from it is, you know, the galaxy itself is, is huge on the sky. It's extremely bright in the optical, but the ionizing photons are coming from what is from Hubble, essentially an unresolved point source. Which is to say that you know ionizing photon escape is is definitely not an isotropic process. It's about punching holes and spewing things out on short time scales, um, and that's the kind of thing that you simply can't get at um, in a, like field surveys, right? You can identify the average Lyman continuum escape from galaxies down to whatever your resolution and limit is um, in a field survey, uh, but the first lens galaxy lens galaxy we found that's really producing these things uh, like gangbusters uh, is showing us that you know if you want to know the physical scales in which ionizing photons escape. Uh, you're going to be looking at tens of parsecs. Uh, so understanding that process is, is one of the big motivations here with the lens galaxy. So. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Let's uh, thank Matthew again.
And of course, uh, let's thank all the speakers uh, today and I guess the past four days. And now I'm gonna pass the mic on to Janice. Okay, what a fabulous last section uh, session. So we are going to get set up for our final discussion panel. And we'll have the panelists come up while the stage is rearranged. And Jerry will put up one of the slides. Could someone also rate, um, increase the lights? Okay, so while all this uh, commotion is going on, I thought I'd say a few words, which would then serve as a segue into our final panel discussion. While all of us have been at this meeting, simultaneously, our users committee has been meeting. They started the day before the GSM started, and they actually met in the mornings before we started on two of the days. And so, um, one of the discussion items at the users committee was that we wanted to start increasing the cross section between the community and the members of the users committee again. Janelle Walsh, unfortunately, she needed to leave before the end of the conference is the chair and we'll be sending out information about how you can connect with them in the near future. Uh, next slide. If you want to figure out who is in, on the committee, in particular those from your partner country, you can go to the website and go into about and under governance, you will find the current members of the users committee. So with that, I'll invite the people on the panel up to the stage. Next slide. We actually have a few of the members of the users committee on this panel. Oops. Oh. Yeah, there's a slide with the uh, names of the people on the committee. Okay, uh, on the... Oh, okay. Well, we had a, a list of the names of the people on the panel. Um, but the idea behind this panel discussion is just to give us all a chance to step back. We've seen an enormous range of science, instrumentation, throughout the four days of the meeting. A lot of time has passed since we've been able to see each other and connect like this. Um, virtually, it's just not the same when we're together in person. <laughs> and so the idea behind the panel discussion is that um, we're going to reflect collectively on the results that have we've been seeing over the past four days and think about together what lies ahead for us in the future. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, have the panelists introduce themselves first. Jennifer Latz, Gemini Director. Victoria Reinaldi, representative of Argentina in the users community. Uh, Nareha from Korea Australian Science and Space Science Institute. Uh, representing Kasi and Korea and also the Gemini Bureau. I'm Chao Gonçalves from the Valongo Observatory at the Federal University in Rio. And I'm the Brazilian representative on the users committee. And actually this is my last year in the committee. Uh, that's convenient. That's my This is my first year on the uh, user committee. Uh, I'm Matt Taylor, uh, assistant professor at University of Calgary and former Gemini fellow. And uh, yeah, I represent Canada on the UCG. I think I only need one of these. I'm Pat McCarthy, the uh, Noir Lab director. Okay, I'll kick it off here. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of our presenters and all of our speakers I'm just blown away by the quality of the science, the quality of the talks, especially from our young people and the breadth. We've gone from, you know, near-Earth asteroids to 
our solar system to exoplanets to you know distant galaxies and kind of everything in between so it just really highlights that you all have been busy while we've been trying to hold this meeting so thank you for continuing your work um my sort of high level thoughts from kind of reflecting on this meeting and what it's what it's taken to get here is really i see that the themes that i've been seeing are about connections and partnerships so it's been fantastic to have this meeting uh in person it's been fantastic to be able to have people call in virtually last year we were really wanted to have this meeting here but at the end we decided it would be great to have a virtual meeting and that brought in a really broad cross-section of our partnership so you know looking at the observatory of course we've got gemini north and south working together we're now part of noir lab connecting with other facilities including the upcoming rubin observatory we've got the strong international partnership and i think playing to those strengths and building on our partnerships is going to be really crucial for deciding what's next for the observatory. And I'm hoping this panel will say a little bit about what they need and what they are looking forward to going forward. And then the other thing that really struck me was just how um, Gemini is staying vital, staying very you know, exciting scientifically by connecting with other facilities. And we saw this over and over again. You know, Gemini complementing Gaia data, Gemini working together with Hubble and now James Webb, Gemini following up LIGO sources, Gemini collaborating with folks from ESO VLT. Um, and I think I think that really speaks to a broad view of the science that is capable, that Gemini is capable and how vital it is in the in the broader landscape. So we uh, as I said at the beginning, we have a lot coming in the next couple of years, but I think it's time to start looking a little bit further ahead in terms of what do we want for Gemini Observatory in terms of, you know, what should be the observational capabilities 10 years from now? And how do we do that together as a partnership where we have such a diverse range of science, such a strong and diverse partnership with many different thoughts about what we should be doing and how we should be doing that science. So with that, I would really like to hear from everyone on the panel about their thoughts and reflections on the conference. Do you mind if, if I quit my mask? I don't know how to use it to speak in Spanish, imagine in English. <laughs> well, first uh, I, I want to thank uh, the organizers for making this, this great meeting and to the observatory too, because uh, they have invited me and I'm very glad to be here. Um, well, I have to say that the participation of, of Gemini in Argentina has changed the way of thinking and doing science. And uh, well, the, the access to, a, to an eight meter telescope um, changed the entire mind of an entire generation of Argentinian astronomers. So our participation here is really important. Um, I'm coming, thinking about that, I'm coming back uh, with, with few ideas, but the, the one that rules them all is that it is mandatory to enlarge the users community. And I feel that it's rather easy or straightforward to do that. First, we need to maintain and improve the, the exchange with the observatory and between partners too, of course, uh, while well, making joint proposals or, or the visitor programs are, are excellent examples to do that. Second, we need to offer courses so people can manage the data in a safely and efficient and fast process. So. We need dragons. Uh, I will make it a tool. In dragons, we trust. <laughs> I will say. And, and third, uh, we need to to promote the participation of young researchers, young students, or grad students, because they are. These are very very nice meeting to to they can participate. Um, it is a very warm and, and friendly meeting for the students and young researchers. 
So, um, well, these points apply to every country, I, I think, but they are especially important for Argentina right now because we have unfortunately lost our well, almost 30% we lost of, the, of, of our time in, in Gemini. And we really want to recover it and even enlarge it. So um, the point here is uh, we need to continue making contact with you, with Gemini, with all the partners, because we, we need to, uh, I insist, in recover our time and enlarge our participation in Gemini because we have everything to do that. I'm convinced of that. We have a very promising uh, generation of astronomers, of observational astronomers, I mean. We have a strong national office. I'm very proud of my national office. They are very efficient, and I will repeat it once and again and again. And the most important for, for us and for every, every partner, I, I think, we have 20 years. I take my notes. <laughs> we have 20 years of making Argentinian science growing up with Gemini. And we have, um, do, during these 20 years, we have put our country in the first level with Gemini. So I will insist in making contact and continue going together. OK. Uh, thanks for the good comment. And personally, first, so I'm very happy and relieved to see this meeting uh, come to a very successful closure because this meeting has been actually in a sort of pipeline for four years almost. And uh, actually the contract to use this room with the hotel has been signed almost three years ago. So I'm very happy. Uh, and then also thank you all to make this meeting a very big success. And uh, uh, as you have seen, for the last two, four days, uh, I'm very happy to see the many young uh, Korean participants to make a, a, give you a very nice science result. Well, unlike Argentina, we don't have a past 20 years of Gemini experience growing up science uh, for the past 20 years, but we are more than happy to look forward for the future more than 20 years of doing science with, your, uh, with you all. Uh, making uh, uh, this great partnership uh, even more great. And, and being in a partnership, uh, being in a partnership as a partner, uh, each, it's important to make, uh, do a great science as a, each partner, but uh, the partnership itself should mean uh, a little bit more than that, much more than that. And then uh, making a, a scientific synergy uh, as a partnership uh, I think we should walk toward uh, and pay, pay much more attention than we used to be. And so we had a brief discussion before we coming to this uh, panel discussion. Uh, and then we are more than happy to uh, have uh, uh, any uh, useful input uh, from the audience and the users to make uh, how to make uh, interpartner collaborations more uh, how we can promote, encourage uh, between partnership, partners, uh, joint proposal, for example, research collaboration, and then so uh, Gemini partnership-wide, how we can make the, our science collaborations more productive and uh, do more great science. So we are happy to take any uh, good uh, suggestions from you. Okay, thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. And again, thank you for allowing me to be a part of the UCG for the last few years. was was a great experience. was a great learning experience to to see how uh, how the how the inner workings of the of an observatory happens, especially with with Gemini. So it it was great. And thank you for allowing me to 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 make some closing comments here on the conference itself. Which I think was was very interesting, and it was again illuminating to see how how the community has been using the telescope uh, in recent years, and to see the amazing science that's coming out of it, 
uh, of course, I'm more than a little biased towards extragalactic astronomy, just because that's that's my field and galaxies in general. But it was it was great to see how everything worked from the beginning of the of the conference, from exoplanets and and stars all the way to galaxies and and cosmology, and to see how people were using the instruments in in very different ways in their own science. So uh, we saw today some of the some of the work with with Sorro, for example, to look at individual stars from at the at the LMC, which was very exciting. It was very very cool data. Uh, we saw people working on metal poor stars and making use of the of braces, and now there's ghosts coming up. So so all of the work on high resolution spectroscopy it was it was, it was very interesting. Um, and to highlight, of course, some some of the work being done by by my Brazilian colleague colleagues, we had we had an invited talk from Delisa Gonçalves. She was she was discussing her work on symbiotic stars. Also, Bruno Dias was was talking about his his work um, on on stellar populations in the in nearby galaxies. Bruno is currently researching in Chile, but uh, he also collaborates a lot and that, that's a big project in collaboration with um with some with many people in Brazil, Leandro Kerbe, Beatriz Bambui, and Francisco Maia and others. So um it 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 was on one hand it was very interesting to see the very creative use that people are making of of instruments like Zorro and and um Maroon X, some instruments I'm definitely not familiar with because they're they're very much outside my field. But at the same time, we did saw a lot of GMOS science coming out of here. And, and GMOS is, I think it's still a great instrument, although it has been going on for quite a few years now, both GMOS North and GMOS South, uh, they remain very relevant. And I think this, this is one of the big, big um, conclusions that we can take out of this conference is how GMOS is still very much a, a big chunk of, uh, of Gemini science in general, and I would like to emphasize that in in our in our case, being from Brazil, Brazil of course doesn't have as much access to to eight meter and ten meter class telescopes as as the U.S. Maybe so Gemini for us is is a huge part of our observational capabilities in general, and having something like like GMOS and of course also the the infrared instruments as well, which are in heavy use by our community. All of that, I think it emphasizes that since this is the, the main big telescope that we, have, that we have access to, having something that's so flexible, um, it's, it's really conducive to, to a lot of the different scientific goals that we have in Brazil. So it's, it's great to see it moving forward. And I think this conference has proven that that this is this is still very much the case, not only for Brazil, but we saw a lot of incredible science coming out of clusters. We saw Go Green, we saw Mabelius's talk, we saw a lot of people using GMOS for for very different cases and and very highly relevant and high impact science as well. And moving forward, I think the, there's there's a lot that that has been discussed on the ECG as well on on this the strategy to engage the community so so i think one of the one of the main strong points that we that we can have trying to bring in more people is that there are, there are a lot of very exciting new instruments coming online uh there's ghost there's uh scorpio of course which is which is very interesting pretty soon we'll, we'll have germos as well which is which is an incredible instrument that that i'm very excited about so I think that's that's a great way to bring in new researchers and so that we have new opportunities to to use Gemini to in <clears throat> exciting and innovative ways while at the same time not not losing track of GMOs and something that's versatile as it is. And I think just to just to close off on my comments on the <clears throat> I'm sorry, on the aspect of collaborations, I think. There's a lot that can be done. I, I really like the the joint proposal uh, strategy that that Germany has because it, on one hand, it allows of of course to to do more science because we have a let's say a limited amount of time that we can apply for in Brazil, 
but I think the, the joint proposal allows us not only to do a little more ambitious science and have more ambitious projects, but at the same time, it serves as, it serves as, a, as this tool and opportunity that we have to connect with researchers from the US, from Argentina. I have a lot of collaborations with Argentinian uh, astronomers now and hopefully more interaction with Korea in the in the near future. So that actually, it it, it encourages people in Brazil, and especially the, the smaller communities to, to interact with people from, from other countries and other partners so that we can do very interesting science together. And I think that's that's very that's a very positive aspect for of for of Gemini. So that's it. I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing what the what the upcoming instruments are are gonna do. It was very exciting to see all of them being presented here, and I certainly look forward to using a lot of Gemini in the in the future as well. So thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, that sounds good. Um, yeah. So first of all, uh, I want to obviously repeat the uh, gratitude for putting on the uh, this great meeting, um, <clears throat> inviting me and allowing me to serve on the, the ECG. This is uh, this is a great opportunity to get a, a new perspective on Gemini, uh, uh, different from the one that I had before. Um, I was asked to be on this panel uh, nominally to give perspective from from the Canadian community, and and to be honest, um, I'm not sure how how comfortable I feel speaking for the country as a whole, um, at least not quite yet. So instead I'm gonna speak from my own personal perspective. And um, that perspective is, is of a, a former, former Gemini fellow um, who, who failed in the job market the year uh, before coming to Gemini. And so coming there was, it was a really special experience and Gemini gave me absolutely every opportunity to achieve success um into my next postdoc and then into the, the the position i have now and they they showed a keen interest in my success um and i'm i'm not the sort of person to ever forget a favor and so i showed a keen interest in gemini's success and one thing i'm taking out of this meeting is is that um that interest is is very uh is is very satisfied um gemini is in a good place and i think at least in the near and medium term it is absolutely heading in the right direction um i'm blown away by the diversity not of just the science um but of the community um from the partner countries from from students to postdocs to 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 senior faculty the diversity of people the diversity of science is really something that uh, that is unique to gemini um and it it really warms my heart to see to see that happening and to see that the 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 strategy in general is really to play to gemini's strengths as a, a uniquely nimble and flexible observatory and i think if if that focus is maintained um then then the future is bright um one other I guess reflection that I've I've had personally is um, this would be my first opportunity to really speak in detail with members from from the other partner countries and and start to understand their perspectives. Um, you know, I'm I'm coming from Canada and and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna lump the United States in there as well as one of the the nominally larger partners. And you know, we have our own challenges, we have our own concerns, but um, the, the, the small partners have their own unique set of challenges and concerns that are fundamentally different than those from the larger partners. And um, I think it behooves us from North America in particular to, to maybe take our North American hats off and try to put on the hats from, from the other partners to, to understand um, their perspective and to to better understand their challenges and their concerns um because i think if 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 that cross communication happens and we we have a better understanding of those perspectives then that cross pollination and the joint proposals and everything will just naturally float float from that so i think just to to close up that's that's something I'm going to be thinking very carefully about on my way home about uh, how how to promote that um, and how to address that. And I I, uh, I suggest the rest of you from from particular North America do as well. Thank you, Matthew. That was really well said. That's a great message. Um, just just a few thoughts here before we open things up. Um, just to echo what Jen said, I'm really impressed with the depth and the breadth of the science we saw this week. I was impressed at how many people. Are doing very broad science programs 
but Gemini provided the key data they need to get their science done. That was really quite impressive. I learned that instruments that I thought were niche, like um, Igrins and, um, and the Speckle cameras are actually very broad in their science scope. That was really impressive over and over. Instruments we might think of as old, like GMOS and GNIRS are still vital. Uh, that doesn't mean they'll last forever, but they're still providing a lot of great science for people. Um, one of the things, though, that I thought was um, most telling was the remark by um, Stefan uh, from Max Planck, who said, coming to Gemini, he encountered that the group was warm, friendly, and welcoming. That was his experience in, in observing with Gemini. Um, I think that that speaks to the excellence and the dedication of our staff. Um, we often think about the instruments and the software, but it's the staff who really make the experience work. And we've seen that this week, um, all that they've given us and all that they give the, the user community. And as you just described, the science that they do as well and how important that is to them. So I think as we go forward, it's really important to make sure that we hold on to that Gemini culture. It's special. If we lose it, it's very hard to get it back. And it's important that we hold on to the identity of Gemini as an international partnership because it's vital to all of us, as Matthew said, that we recognize and we sit in each other's uh, seats or stand in each other's shoes periodically and think about what Gemini means to them. We have um, a new wave of instruments coming thanks to the hard work of our partners here in Korea, Canada, and elsewhere. It's going to be a really exciting decade as those new capabilities come online. But we've learned it takes about 10 years from concept to delivery for an instrument. So we should start thinking, what do we want in the 2030s in the era when web will be mature, where the ELTs will start to come online? And we should think, What's the right set of adaptive optics capabilities that we want that will be long lasting because we don't want to continually rebuild and what's the right set of instruments. And that information has to come from you, the user community and the representatives from the various partners because ultimately Gemini is and must be responsive to the community on all scales, whether that means you've got to have something observed tomorrow night because it's a transient or you need an instrument or a capability in 10 years. Ultimately, our job is to respond to the aspirations and the need of the user community. With that, I'm happy to turn it back to Jen uh, and then open the floor to discussion or discussion within the panel and, uh, and input and comments from the floor. Thanks, Pat. Um, I think I would just like to open up to anybody who wants to comment on anything said here, but in particular, I'd like maybe a, a bit of a forward look, you know, what, what do you want to see happen next? What should we, we be aiming towards either in terms of science, instrumentation, partnership in the next decade? Don't be shy. <laughs> Comment. Please come up to the mics. Don't be shy. Zach is never shy. Come on up. <laughs> hey, great, great discussion. Um, so I actually just want to turn the question around on Pat and pose the question directly to the six of you up here about what instruments we want to see because we have unique opportunity right now with JWST uh, showing off its first light images and the first science images and those public, especially in the US, you know, saying, okay, astronomy is really cool, and we don't think $10 billion on a telescope is a big investment. We need more. Um, so thinking ahead to, you know, the next generation, maybe even if it's just, you know, upgrading GMOS uh, as it is an aging instrument and, you know, upgrading either Altair significantly beyond like even GNIO. Um, so I was just wondering, like, what instruments you all would like uh, to see? Because, like, for me, I really want speckled cameras and we already have those. So um, just wondering what you all think. Maybe I'll take a stab at that. I, for me, we've just completed our, our five-year plan and have been trying to map out what the, you know, what we should be looking at in terms of the next generation. And there are two, two ideas on the table really at this point that would be great to get community input and feedback on. The first is uh, the idea of bringing an adaptive secondary 
to one or maybe both telescopes. And we started doing the feasibility study. You saw Paul's great talk there. The next step would be to do conceptual design, but also to you know broadly understand what the science gains of that would be, uh, particularly with the near-term updates in, in adaptive optics of Gemini North and South. The other, as, as Thiago alluded to, is start thinking about our optical workhorse capabilities. GMOS North and South still dominate the demand, the proposals, both telescopes, but they're aging. And so uh, we need to understand if, if that is a capability we still want going forward, whether that should be simply updating GMOS or if we want something that's, you know, next generation has something that's a little bit different, maybe complementary to Scorpio. Um, and again, the science cases and thinking forward to what the landscape looks like in 2030 with ELTs coming online, what is the niche there for Gemini? How do we, you know, are we going to continue to be the rapid response agile uh, observatory? And so that might aim for a somewhat different kind of science case or, or science requirements for that next instrument, or do we want something a little bit different? So I would I would love to hear from GMOS users in particular. What what do you want? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I'll I'll second that and give a proposal, which is adaptive secondary with GMOS behind it, so you can do rapid TOOs with MOS and EMCCDs to lower the noise. Basically, just squeeze everything out of the the hardware that you can. <laughs> We can't change the mirror, but we can change about everything else. I'll I'll take a step of that, and I'll 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 really support the second one, the the whatever type of upgrade you could you could do to GMOS, just because, as I said, um, speaking on behalf of the Brazilian community, this is something that it, it's it's one big telescope that we have access to, and and GMOS acts as something that that really works for a lot of people in Brazil. So an upgraded GMOS would, would be great. Um, I think, especially with, uh, if we think about the, the upcoming instruments, um, there's a lot of, in, in the next decade or so, there are gonna be a lot of uh, very, wi uh, very wide field surveys, of course, Rubin, we heard a lot about it, and then there's gonna be Euclid and, and Roman. So follow up of those of those fields uh, with the high multiplex, just optical multi object spectrograph, and would would be incredible for, and it would be useful to to a lot of people in the community. And as we said in the UCG, I think Scorpio is a great instrument. I'm I'm really looking forward to applying for time with it, but it doesn't have the the multiplex capabilities that that MOS the the, the GMOS has. So an upgraded GMOS I think would serve a big chunk of the user community of Gemini. So I would I would really put my money on that if I could. You're here, and if I could build on what Brian said, we can't make the primary mirror any bigger, but we can make the images smaller. And that's actually <laughs> worth a lot too. And if we can have a, a standing uh, adaptive secondary mirror that you just don't even think about it anymore, it's always making the images a factor too sharper. You'll just come to appreciate that and it's just part of the landscape and that and coupled to the next generation optical spectrograph uh, would be a really powerful combination. Um, I, I just wanna push on the adaptive secondary some more. I, I totally agree with the plan. And one of the benefit that it has is it really makes Gemini an IR optimized telescope because uh, you know, if you especially if you use adaptive optics, it's just uh, has much more sensitivity without having the, the additional thermal background. And just baselining an adaptive secondary that can provide some good correction in the optical as well as the infrared, I think will definitely replenish the capability of the observatory. And uh, the other thing to consider is in the era of the ELTs, um, if we look at how things have progressed 
when eight to 10 meter class telescopes showed up and how they impacted sort of the four to six meter class telescopes as they moved more towards survey type science, whereas the, the larger telescopes focused on individual objects because that's that was kind of the low hanging fruit. So that that's something else to consider and perhaps, you know, the upgrade to GMOS to make it much more highly multiplex, better image quality, maybe uh, additional spectroscopic modes that allow for higher spectral resolution because you're, you're basically optimizing the observatory to get more flux into a slit uh, might, might be a beneficial direction to go. Here, here. Hi, uh, Bruno Dias. I'm uh, Tavo was mentioning that I'm broadly using GMOS here for three national projects, including Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. Uh, so my two cents here, I would say, uh, on the top of everyone else's points here, is that uh, this is the workhorse, right, of any telescope. So any telescope should have this. So for example, uh, Force 2 at VLT is also aging. So they are planning an upgrade now. But they have two, right? So they have the force one and force two, so they keep going to observations there. So I think that if you want to do an upgrade of GMOS, we have to stop operations with GMOS. So that we have to think about that and how this will impact the, the science. Uh, but thinking about is it worth it to to do it, even if you have like force two for like international community or not? I think that's a matter of access, right? So because GM we have a guaranteed time for this community. So is this community using really GMOS? I think that the answer is the right answer. Uh, we have this, this thing. Uh, so I think it's worth it to, to go for an upgrade, but uh, maybe thinking about uh, like really upgrade, like everything, like thinking about new capabilities and rethink about the needs from the, from the, from the community. If I may add another point on the top of this, since I'm here, is from the the tax because I mentioned that I'm managing like three tax there. So when you apply for time, you have to apply actually for three communities and three evaluations. And sometimes you have actually completely different answers from this tax. <laughs> so I don't know, sometimes you get first place in one community and then like very precise in another community. So this is something like difficult to manage. I do not have a proposal how to change it, but I mean, this is a point that I want to raise here for discussion maybe, because I don't know how the international tech manages that when it comes to, to handle, but maybe when you have this type of joint proposals, try to have an international tech, I don't know, something like glue together and something more smooth procedure, because I think that the idea is collaboration, right? So if you have like different countries here, it's not that each community has its own science, but can collaborate as well. So as like Matt said, okay, so think about the necessities of other communities as well. I think that scientifically, you gain a lot if you if collaborate, but it's okay. Thanks, those were really great points. Anybody wanna comment on those or have other, other topics? Yes, please come. So. I'm completely external, of course, but I wonder uh, if a key ingredient couldn't be in the future also really to implement a 15% of uh, guaranteed time observations, because there will be a lot of uh, instrument builders who probably run out of telescopes where to put their things. Uh, everything will concentrate on the ELTs, so you might actually want to draw groups uh, in that Gemini becomes an attractive place to think about. And a similar thought, um, maybe if you think about the ELTs, they come online, everybody gets three hours of telescope time for the next 10 years. Maybe one should think about that uh, the smaller telescopes can be the place where you can implement long, big projects, 100 hours, 200 hours, which you'll never get on an ELT in the first 10 years, so to say. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Yeah, we didn't talk a whole lot about our visiting instrument program, but that's been wildly successful um, for bringing external teams, external instruments uh, in exchange for telescope time. And, you know, just looking ahead at, at the budget and what some, you know, if we want to have ambitious projects, uh, you know, I think 
I think collaborations that bring in a partnership, uh, much in the way that the Giramos and GNEO uh, project is being funded, is, is going to be the path forward for for the next generation of instruments. But, yeah. Here, here. Yeah. Go ahead. Let's Bob. also to make sure that is anyone online with questions? Are you watching, Julia? Okay, great. So I'm going to just bypass <laughs> because, yeah, so I think everyone in this room noticed a lot of talks are based on the visiting instrument, uh, you data from the visiting instrument, Allo Pekejo, Maroon X, and iGreens. The problem is we don't have science port to host the, like extra visiting instrument anymore. And now like we're going to have like Maroon X becoming a facility instrument. And, in the south and north, we are all expecting like the big facilities, but right? like Gemini South, we're gonna have Scorpio and Ghost will be used a lot. So I don't know how much time those visiting instruments will be, yeah, the, uh, allocated. So as a development group person, I wish we can have like more science for like extreme change for the those front end design, but. I don't know if it's possible, but so something to think about or more creative way to like feed the like maybe fiber, uh, the extra port to use the fiber. Like Maroon X can be installed more often, not just the block schedule, because Maroon X will be like su successful for like next 15, 20 years. So, but if it has to compete with other facilities, right? Then, I don't know, we'll lose a lot of users as well. So that's, yeah, my two cents. Thanks, we all very good points. We have to think about the sustainability and long-term viability of, of the instrument program. Now for something completely different, I have a crazy question about partnership. So 22 years ago, the family was established, the partnership included the UK and Australia, who later preferred to leave the partnership. And uh, we were very fortunate to have Korea, not only to um, replace them, but to bring something completely new. And I would agree with Nara when uh, he says that Korea made even Gemini even better. So looking at the portraits that we have today, is there anyone missing? Is there anyone else you would like to see uh, joining us? Is there a country you're having in mind that you think has a lot to contribute and could grow a lot joining Gemini that you would like to see next, sitting next to you? India. I think India is doing fantastic things these days. I think um, uh, with Astrostat, the, the, the great science that's coming from UVIT, um, I think uh, adding, adding the UV profile and having the, the, the UVAR kind of in, in the full partnership would be, would be just outstanding. And it's a TMT partner. <laughs> Who's you. going to make the phone call? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's an interesting suggestion. Should we conclude? I know it's pretty late and we've got other things to do here. Does anybody want to have a final word? Janice. <laughs> Let's just give our uh, fantastic panelists a round of applause. So please don't disappear just yet. We have a few thank yous, but we'll keep it really brief. Um, yeah, festivities. Can we have the lights turned on completely so we uh, gradually wake up for our last round of refreshments as well? And just because we're disbanding the panel doesn't mean that these discussions shouldn't continue. They, of course, this is just the seeds um, for more discussion during the final break and hopefully in the coming months. So we have a lot of thank yous because this meeting was a tremendous amount of work. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and we had multiple tries at getting it done. So again, I'm just so pleased that we were able to be here in person. I really wanna thank everyone for attending. But of course, behind the scenes for four years, <laughs> we've been working on this conference. Um, I really wanna thank Nare for um, suggesting this conference and for continuing to persevere to have the conference going forward. Um, it's been fabulous and I'm so glad that we were able to do this. Okay. Uh, well, I'm gonna check that out. Ah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to everybody who braved the trip. Um, it was quite a challenge to get here. Uh, and people, there was a lot of anxiety, but most of us are here. Encourage you to be safe, right? As we go back home, we still have plenty of tests outside. So please give yourselves a round of applause. And also our youngest attendee. We are indeed seeding the future astronomers for Gemini. That's Gian's uh, son, yes? Is he here? <laughs> okay, and then Beth. Uh, thank you to everybody who participated online. There's still a few people online, even though it's very late where they are. And they deserve a special shout out. Thank you. If you want to unmute your video, we can clap for you. It really takes the village, as Jen was saying, to organize this kind of conference. And we will certainly forget um, people who have contributed um, through the full scale of whatever distribution function you want to think of this as. If you have contributed to this meeting, as an organizer um, for preparation, please stand up. And this is not just the LOC. I know many of you, including chairs, virtual chairs, in-person chairs, people who have taken pictures, please stand up so we can recognize you. Come on, don't be shy. LOC, SOC. LOC. So I'd like to start with the LOC. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Hui Kim, uh, who is the co-chair of the LOC, and Ann Jordan, who also was co-chair and served as our administrative support. Uh, please come up. Please come up. We have presents. <laughs> I also want to thank, uh, oh yes, so we have special presents <laughs> flown all the way from Hilo, from Big Island Candies. <laughs> if Ji Yong So could also come up, she's a key member of the local organizing committee, of course, our support from Cassie and, and the Korea Gemini office. She did a lot of heavy lifting on Kashi side. <laughs> and we also have a gift for Nare Huang, who is the brains behind the whole thing. <laughs> well, my job was actually to make sure everybody in the LLC do their job, but every, every member of the LLC was perfect and excellent. So I there was very little for me to left to take care of anything. So I'm not sure I'm deserved for this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, other members of the committee? So Chung Yang, are you here? Yes, please come. Jocelyn Ferrara, who gave a fantastic uh, talk on diversity and equity and inclusion. Yi Jin Kim, Yujin is sitting outside. Yeah. Okay. Songchar uh, took this photo. Venu Kalarai, who I believe is online, but gave a fantastic talk. And we'll have to ship his, uh, yeah. send, it, send it back to Chile with someone. 
Jong Eun Hyo, are you here? Please come up. Ki Young Oh, she she she, 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 she left. Okay, yeah, ready. Okay. Yeah. Jerry Brower, our fearless tech support. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> I think I think I got all the names. Did I, if, did I forget anyone, Janice? No. Okay. Nara, would you like to say some final words? Yeah. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I think you guys, of course, the LLC members did a uh, hell of a job. And of course, we have we don't we have to remember that there are many excellent SLC members, including our uh, SLC chair Elliot Elliot, who magically uh, didn't forget to uh, make him a make me an invited speaker after even after three years so uh, let's thank our SLS members and all of you and uh, to to make a travel here and also attending this meeting in virtually so you guys made this meeting a big success thank you and um, Let's also thank our uh, excellent uh, hotel staff uh, who made our coffee break time a great joy. I, I never had this, uh, this kind of excellent tea and coffee service uh, uh, wandering around the world attending meeting. Thank you. Hotel staff and dedication, I can't remember, but thank you very much. You guys have been very happy to be 어, 미팅하고 갑니다. 감사합니다. Okay, with that, we are done. Please enjoy the, the rest of the coffee and hopefully many of you will get to spend the weekend seeing the sights. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> we did it. We did it.